Center is on administrative leave. And Brooklyn Center's mayor has fired the city manager, the city council, giving the mayor control of the police department. Our hearts are aching right now. We are in pain right now. And we recognize that this couldn't have happened at a worse time. The tension in the city heightened because just 10 miles away is the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, charged in the death of George Floyd. Say his name! Say his name! This morning, Dante Wright's family is demanding justice while calling for peace. Everyone is going to remember his name, and that's what he wanted. So I'm happy he wanted to be known. Not this way. At least 40 people were arrested in the chaos overnight. Police say the looting was limited. Coming up later this half hour, we'll talk to a former chief of the NYPD about this case and whether that officer should be fired. Prosecutors are expected to rest their case today at the Derek Chauvin trial. We should learn more about whether a passenger who was in George Floyd's car will testify. Yesterday in court, a cardiologist denied that a heart condition killed Floyd, and a use of force expert said no reasonable officer would have done what Chauvin did, keeping his knee on Floyd's neck. There was also emotional testimony from Floyd's brother. He was a big mama's boy. He would lay, just lay up onto her in the fetus position like he was still in a womb. He showed us like uh, how to treat our mom and how to respect our mom. He, he just, he loved her so dearly. In Minnesota? The defense's case is only expected to last a few days. Closing arguments are expected next Monday. New details about a deadly shooting at a high school in Knoxville, Tennessee, when police responded to reports of a person with a gun. They say a male student in the bathroom refused to come out. And when officers entered, the student opened fire, wounding one officer. The student was then shot and killed. Knoxville's mayor visited the wounded officer in the hospital. The officer was hurt. I thanked him for taking a bullet on in the middle of this incident and he said he would rather that he be hurt than anybody else one person was detained for questioning this is the fourth time this year that a teenager from knoxville has been killed by gunfire turning to the pandemic there's growing debate over whether more shutdowns are needed to address the covid crisis in the upper midwest even though more than 20 percent of americans are now fully vaccinated infections are surging in some areas especially in Michigan. ABC's Faith Abube has the latest on that this morning. Good morning, Faith. Hey, good morning to you, Mona. Michigan's governor is now contradicting the CDC as both sides discuss the state's dramatic spike in COVID cases and how to respond. This morning, a blunt message from the CDC director to state leaders in Michigan, pleading with them to shut the state down amid skyrocketing COVID cases. Really what we need to do in those situations is shut things down. Michigan's governor is requesting more vaccines. She says doubling down on vaccine distribution to achieve 70% herd immunity is the answer. We've got to grit our teeth and keep moving forward. We're making great progress. We are getting close. But the White House says a so-called whack-a-mole approach with vaccine shipments won't work because it would take up to six weeks to send the state more doses. Instead, the CDC is sending Michigan a surge team to help FEMA with vaccinations. And the agency's director is calling for stronger restrictions in the state. Go back to our basics, to go back to where we were last spring, um, last summer, and to, to shut things down, to flatten the curve. Across the country, the daily case average is now at peak summer surge levels, about 66,000 cases per day. Experts say looser restrictions and more contagious variants of the virus are driving the spike. A new study says the UK variant, the now dominant strain in the U.S., is more transmissible but likely does not cause more severe disease. We love you feel better, you are missed, okay? And now another famous face is added to the list of people infected with the virus. Country music star Luke Bryan, sidelined from his role as judge on American Idol after testing positive. Makes Paula Abdul smile. taking Your his Christmas. place last night. Meanwhile, FEMA is now accepting applications for COVID funeral reimbursement. Officials say within the first 90 minutes of applications being open, they received nearly a million calls. Mona? Faith, thank you. Losses from the pandemic are forcing a beloved chain of movie theaters to close. Pacific Theaters, which also operates Arc Light Cinemas in California, will not reopen. Hollywood's iconic Cinerama Dome is among the theaters closing.
A former assistant coach in the NFL is now charged with felony drunk driving after a crash that left a girl critically injured. Police say former Chiefs coach Britt Reed hit a car on the side of the highway after driving 82 miles per hour. The five-year-old victim was left in a coma for weeks before returning home to begin a long recovery. All right, time now for a look at your Tuesday weather. The most unsettled conditions today will be in the middle of the country. Heavy rain will extend from Texas to Mississippi. Some areas could see three inches of rain with possible flash flooding. Snow is expected from the highest parts of the Rockies to the northern plains with rain around the western Great Lakes. Looking at today's high temperatures, only 36 in Minneapolis, but warming into the 50s and 60s in the northeast. The west coast will be dry with temps in the 60s. 80s along the Gulf Coast today, you have 86 in Miami. Coming up, the new food products from Amazon, how they could change grocery shopping. But first, the volcano disaster in the Caribbean, the new images, and how the U.S. is helping. And a frantic scene at the mall, a boy gets stuck in the escalator. He will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Rich. We tell all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Back now with the erupting volcano on the Caribbean island of St. Vincent. Cruise ships are waiting to evacuate thousands of people if necessary. The heavy ash falling to the ground is collapsing roofs. But the prime minister says no deaths have been reported. An aerial view shows the ash spewing 40,000 feet into the air. The U.S. is sending $100 million in relief aid. We turn now to Amazon making a new push in the grocery business, launching its own food brand. Fans and critics alike say Amazon is set to take over another industry. Here's ABC's Megan Teferzian. This morning, the world's largest online retailer now disrupting the snack food industry. Amazon is launching its own food brand, Aplenty. It will include hundreds of snack foods like pita chips, crackers, frozen foods, and other pantry staples. Amazon is the Goliath, and so unfortunately they can come in and they can dominate, especially on, on the online uh, grocery space. It comes at a time when online grocery sales and snack food sales are soaring, thanks to people staying home more because of the pandemic. And it comes four years after Amazon bought Whole Foods. Once they, they you know, bought Whole Foods, then you know they decided that, hey, this is a good compliment because they were already in the grocery business, and I think they've learned a lot. 
uh, working with Whole Foods. Retailers launching their own private labels is nothing new. Costco has its own Kirkland brand. Walmart and Target have their own house brands too. Experts say moving to a private label can be good for business and the customer. Stores can make more money and customers can get the same quality food for a cheaper price, saving 10 to 20 percent. But if Amazon wipes out the competition, prices may go up. When competition goes away, then you're able to raise prices and so unfortunately that's probably what could happen. Last year, Amazon started its own wine brand and a fresh line of bakery items and salsas. The company reportedly plans to open two dozen new Amazon fresh grocery stores around the country. Ken, Mona. Megan, thank you. And now to a scary scene at a mall in New York. A child's foot got stuck inside an escalator on Staten Island. Witnesses say the stairs kept moving as a woman screamed for someone to stop the emergency stop button. Someone from a store tried to use cream to free the boy's foot. Eventually, a man was able to pry back the escalator wall to free him. Mm. Coming up, we return to our top story, a closer look at the state of policing in America. From another police shooting in Minnesota to allegations of excessive force against a U.S. Army officer in Virginia. We talked to an expert about these cases and the challenges next. Advanced non-small cell. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Rich. We taught all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. A Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, <laughs> then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Back now with this scene from Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Police firing tear gas at protesters defying a curfew, angry over the police shooting of 20-year-old Dante Wright. And we want to take a closer look at this case as well as a case in Virginia. Earlier, I spoke with Robert Boyce, a former chief with the NYPD. I want to begin discussing the shooting of Dante Wright. The officer, now identified as Kim Potter, a 26-year veteran of the force, is seen here threatening to use her taser on Wright as he is getting back into his car during a traffic stop. And then she shoots him, apparently mistaking her gun for a taser, at one point stating as if in shock that she shot him. In the video, we see that she is holding a gun. Talk to us about the training involved here and how this could happen, especially given that she's a veteran police officer. Unfortunately, in this, it appears that, that the, um, the uh, taser was on the uh, uh, duty belt as well, in a cross-draw fashion. 
I'm a big fan of, uh, of a spy holster with a straight draw on the weak side hand of it, so you can't confuse the two. The firearm is about 34 uh, ounces, fully loaded. The taser is about eight ounces. So you can tell exactly the difference in the heft of it almost immediately. And the color is brightly colored as well, so you can t tell the difference. But it should be tactically the direct opposite of what your firearm is. And I, I don't know if that's true, what I saw in, in Brooklyn Central. And Officer Potter is on leave right now, but the mayor of Brooklyn Center is calling for her to be fired. Do you think that she should be fired? Justice has to be served. Um, we had this elsewhere in 2009 in the Bay Area. Uh, where an officer did something similar to what this officer did. It's an egregious act. Um, it's something that you cannot walk away from. And Chief Voice, I also want to talk about the other case that is getting so much attention. U.S. Army officer Karen Nazario pulled over in Virginia for a missing license plate. Turns out it was a new SUV and he had a temporary registration taped to the back window. One officer involved has been fired after pepper spraying Nazario and knocking him to the ground. Let's take a listen to some of that interaction. I'm honestly afraid to get out. Can I? Yeah, you should be. Going? Get out. What's get going out. on? Start. Hold on. We're told that Nazario took one minute and 40 seconds to pull over because it was dark and he wanted to pull into a well-lit area, but the police claimed that he was resisting. What do you make of this? And is taking less than two minutes to pull over unreasonable? I saw it, I timed it myself. Um, it was about two minutes that he pulled over and then he was compliant initially with all the, all the um, verbal commands by the officer, by the first officer. He saw his hands, he wasn't a threat at that point. The time now is to teach de-escalation to our officers to get him out of the car as quickly as possible, but also be firm, but not to be overly, because you know, you're just escalating a situation when you're screaming like that. So I saw that, I saw improper tactics by the one officer, the other, the secondary officer who apparently was not terminated. And Chief, while I have you, let's talk about a separate situation in Oakland, California. The police chief addressing murders are up 300% so far this year compared to the same time last year. Carjackings up 160%, shootings up 100%. The police chief is blaming pandemic-related budget cuts, but what do you think is going on here and what can be done about these numbers? Well, I think defunding the police is not working. It's a complete failure. Uh, so I see a well-trained a well trained police department is what you really want in the city, sensitive to and, and uh, transparent to the community needs. So I see this, we're up in a violent crime surge, and it's a perfect storm, really. So it takes a, a very strong police department to understand that you can still get this job done correctly, as we did in just a few years ago, and still be successful and treat the community with respect. Our thanks to Robert Boyce, former chief of detectives with the NYPD. Coming up, the woman set to make history in the Army. Also, two remarkable athletes. One is a perfect pitcher, the other a pregnant martial arts champion. You're clearly someone who takes... Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Rich. We tell all our people 
patients, how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Time to check the polls. We begin with the ultimate perfect game. University of North Texas softball pitcher Hope Trotwine struck out all 21 batters she faced from Arkansas Pine Bluff. She's the first college player to strike out every batter in a seven-inning game. That feat may pale in comparison to this athlete in Nigeria. She took home the gold medal at this Taekwondo competition while eight months pregnant. Her doctor gave her the okay to compete there. All right. Next, President Biden's choice for Secretary of the Army is making history. The president nominated Christine Wormuth. She would be the first woman to hold the position she served in the Pentagon during the Obama years. And next, a striking resemblance between Prince Philip and Prince Harry. A royal photographer realized it. Take a look. Compare a 36-year-old Philip on the left and Harry on the right, both in military uniforms. Harry paid tribute to Philip yesterday, calling him cheeky until the end. Staying in London, the star of the Netflix series Bridgerton shocked the world by announcing his departure from the show. Sources tell Page Six that reggae John Page is leaving because of creative differences with the producers. He allegedly wasn't happy that his character wasn't going to be the focus anymore. And finally, if you like mac and cheese, you'll love this. Kraft has created the first ever grilled cheese incense to make your home smell cheesy all the time. All right, top headlines next. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Rich. We tell all our patients how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Checking the top stories, U.S. Capitol Police Officer Billy Evans will lie in honor at the U.S. Capitol today. He was killed during the April 2nd attack when a car rammed into him. President Biden will pay his respects at the Capitol today. Demonstrators were tear gassed and arrested near Minneapolis overnight as they defied a curfew to rally against the police shooting of an unarmed black man. The officer who killed Dante Wright is identified as Kim Potter, a 26-year veteran who claims she accidentally fired her gun instead of her taser. In Seattle, people outraged over Wright's death, vandalized businesses, smashing windows and tagging walls with graffiti, and trash cans were torched in Portland overnight. Police called it a riot. Overseas, Japan now says it will dump radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean. The treated water was used to cool the plant's reactor cores after the disaster there 10 years ago. Today's weather, sunny on the West Coast, snow in the Rockies and Northern Plains, heavy rain from Texas to Mississippi, and dry along the East Coast today. And finally, a real-life Bambi has found a new home in Delaware. Will Gans fawns all over this story.
Messiah Eel can't stop fawning over his new pet. She'll go over, sleep on the couch, wake up, go tap on the door, and she's ready to leave. Go back to the woods. <laughs> It'd be that simple. Seriously, though. It all started a few months ago when Messiah left a trail of bread for the baby deer, and she followed him into his house and made herself at home. Messiah started calling the deer Bambi after one of his favorite cartoons. Hi, Bambi. The deer now answering to her name, and Messiah says she's quickly become part of the family. They bathe and groom her, and yes, they check for ticks. Bambi is a big fan of car rides, and she gets along with the family dog and the kids like a million bucks. The cat, on the other hand, not so much. Messiah is saying he doesn't own the deer, but she comes by every few days to hang out. It'd be random times, like I'll just come out the house and there she is waiting for me. I'm like, oh, hey, baby, I wasn't expecting this. I, you know, I'll make some time for you, go in the house and get her, her like, she loves, like, fruits. And, like, I try to feed her fruits and, like, little nuts and stuff. She even gets a little jealous when the dog gets too much attention. Bambi is hardly the first exotic pet that the Internet has fallen in love with. But they're not fugitives from the law. Yep. This fawn is a con, a deer on the lamb. Messiah has been contacted by the Delaware Department of Natural Resources, which let him know that allowing a deer into the house is illegal possession of wildlife. Messiah is now looking into obtaining a deer license. No word on if Bambi is looking to obtain a driver's license, though. She is a fan of riding in the car, after all. Kenneth and Mona. When Bambi grows up, Oh, we have no idea what would happen. <laughs> and that's what's making news in America this morning. It's Tuesday, April 13th. Protesters didn't want a new name to chant, but they've got one. We start here. With police reform advocates already descending on Minneapolis, another black man unjustly dies at the hands of police. It is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. The officer who pulled the trigger claimed she didn't know it was the trigger of a gun. Meanwhile, just minutes away, the prosecution gets ready to wrap its case against Derek Chauvin. There's no way that the jurors are going to say, oh, absolutely, it was fentanyl. We'll ask which witness his jurors are paying attention to, and did Israel just take a shot at Iran? It essentially created a kind of explosion. Iran is scaling up its nuclear production, but the U.S. might be upset with Israel. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. surprising things about the death of George Floyd last year was just how quickly the outcry grew. Look at him. Within moments of Derek Chauvin planting his knee on George Floyd's neck, there was a small crowd. Within hours of his death, there was a much bigger crowd. Within days, buildings were on fire. Of course, there were many who might say this was not surprising at all. If you knew how Americans felt about excessive police force, particularly Americans of color, if you knew about race relations in Minneapolis. Once the trial started, a lot of trauma came back up to the surface. The city's on edge, but, you know. There's been a growing sense of unease of what might happen as the Derek Chauvin trial wraps up. What a guilty verdict would mean. What a non-guilty verdict would mean. But either way, you might think, surely this entire episode has an effect on the way police officers, particularly police officers in Minnesota, see their job. So we're going to begin with the protests erupting once again on the streets of Minnesota, this time in, many, in a Minneapolis suburb. Well, on Sunday afternoon, a year after the death of George Floyd, less than a 30-minute drive from the spot where where he died, another black man was killed by police. If the Minneapolis area was tense going into this weekend, right now it is clearly the epicenter of America's tension over police force. Let's go straight to ABC Stephanie Ramos, who's in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota right now, just north of Minneapolis. Stephanie, can we take a step back? Can you just walk us through what happened and how this turned into such a flashpoint? Absolutely. So the shooting happened just before 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon when authorities say 20-year-old 
year-old Dante Wright was pulled over for an expired vehicle registration just outside Minneapolis, as you mentioned. So there was a contact that the officer went up there initially for, obtained, obtained his, his ID or his driver, his name, and he walked back to his car, and at that time he ran his name, and he found out that he was a warrant. Now, according to the Brooklyn warned. Center Police Department, the officers ran Wright's name through their system, discovering there was a warrant. Now, court records show that warrant was issued after Wright failed to appear in court earlier this month, following charges of possessing a firearm without a permit and running away from law enforcement. He called me at about 1.40, that he was getting pulled over by the police. And Dante's mom actually got a call from him as he was being pulled over. Then I heard the police officer come to the window and say, put the phone down and get out of the car. And Dante said, why? And he said, we'll explain to you when you get out of the car. Police say that on Sunday, right when he was pulled over, when he stepped out of the car, he tried to get back into the vehicle as officers attempted to apprehend him. And I heard scuffling and I heard the police officer say, Dante, don't run. And then... The other officer said, put the phone down and hung it up. So at this point, there's a scuffle. You, you see in the body camera video that was just released. You see Wright trying to get into his car. You see police officers trying to grab him. moment is when he is shot by one of the officers there on the scene and then two like a minute later i called and his girlfriend answered which was the passenger in the car and said that he'd been shot and he, she put it on the driver's side and my son was laying there lifeless as you can hear the officer, while struggling with Mr. Wright, shouts, taser, taser, several times. Now, police that say that officer, who is a veteran on the force, electric. accidentally discharged a gun instead of a taser. As I watch the video and listen to the officer's commands, it is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. This appears to me from what I viewed and the officer's reaction and distress immediately after, that this was an accidental discharge that resulted in the tragic death of Mr. Wright. The police chief saying that that is just absolutely unacceptable. That police officer right now is on administrative leave pending an investigation. But wait, 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 wait. You're saying she thought she was pulling out her taser and said it was a gun and then she pulled the trick? Like, is that a thing? How does that, how does that happen? Exactly. And and those are questions that a lot of people here on the ground in Brooklyn Center and around the country are really asking, how are you a veteran on the force? And can't tell the difference in that brief moment, the difference between a taser and a weapon. And it is what many people here on the ground are saying is that police officers or anyone who is authorized to carry a weapon, they can't afford to make that mistake. Muscle memory is key. They need to know in that moment of panic, of fear, of control, whatever it is that they're feeling, they need to know what they're firing, whether it be a taser or a gun. Okay, so I guess what is it like there where you are in Brooklyn Center? What is it like in the Minneapolis region at this point? Will you stand with us? Yes. Will there you have been a lot of protests in this area. Soon after the shooting of, of Wright, people came out on the streets. Ah! That's tear gas. Good morning. We begin with breaking news in Brooklyn Center. The city is under curfew until 6 o'clock this morning, and the National Guard has been mobilized. This follows civil unrest. Officials say at least 20 businesses in Brooklyn Center alone have some sort of damage. It, it feels like we're in a war zone. This shooting scene isn't far from where the Chauvin trial is taking place. So there are already people in the area. It is already tense. So for this to happen so close to where those folks are gathered protesting police, it's just made matters worse. They always put it off on something. I was afraid or it was an accident. We want accountability. We want this officer fired. A curfew was put into effect, including Minneapolis and Brooklyn Center where we are, and police are nervous. The escalation that we are seeing from the National Guard and all of this militarization is here to protect killer cops, not to protect people. 
yeah. from the killer cops that are killing us. Yeah. And a lot of people are upset here, Brad. It's a good point that there was so many activists already crammed into Minneapolis right now. You can almost see how urgently the city is responding to this. Uh, Brooklyn Center says they've stripped the person in charge of the police force, the city manager, of their duties. But even if this was an accident, just so many questions still about the circumstances leading up to it. Stephanie Ramos in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Brad. recognize that this couldn't have happened at a worse time. We recognize that this is happening at a time when our community, when all of America, indeed all of the, the world is watching our community. And you could sense how this is all echoed around Minnesota, how on edge the entire state is. Well, just down the road from Brooklyn Park, the trial of a different police officer was continuing with some really dramatic testimony. Let's go to ABC's chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams. Dan, for the first time, we actually heard from a family member of George Floyd yesterday. I think they call it the spark of life testimony. What is that and how important was it here? It's very unusual to have this kind of testimony where you're really just testifying to humanize uh, the the victim. Um, it's interesting because defense attorneys would tell you it's prejudicial, right? That it's unfair to the defendant uh, to simply try and get sympathy as opposed to focusing on the facts and the evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Felonis Floyd. But in the state of Minnesota, it is um, uh, completely permissible. And that was the purpose of calling George Floyd's brother. Me and George, we grew up together playing video games a lot. Uh, his favorite game was on Nintendo. We played Double Dribble and we played Tick Mobile. Was just and to remind the jurors that he isn't a anonymous thing. He isn't just that guy you saw on the video. He's not just a symbol. Yeah, he was a person. He used to make the best banana mayonnaise sandwiches, and he used to make syrup sandwiches because George couldn't cook, he couldn't boil water. I don't think in the end it's going to be a make-or-break issue. I think it is very emotional, I think, from a sort of you know, a human perspective. Sir, would you please describe uh, this photo and what you know about it? That's, that's my mother. She's no longer with us right now, but that's, that's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. It's very powerful, but I think when the jurors get back there and start deliberating the case, it's not going to be uh, one of the critical points in the trial. Hey, and so I imagine the, some of the most critical stuff will be what we continue to hear from doctors, right, about whether... George Floyd would still be alive if not for Derek Chauvin's actions. Who is winning that argument right now? Well, remember, we haven't heard the defense's case yet, right? right. So this is just the defense attorney cross-examining the prosecution's witness. So, you know, we need to be careful. Uh, but with that said, there are two fundamental questions in this case, reasonableness of the use of force and cause of death. On the question of reasonableness of the use of force, that's when you're hearing police experts and use of force experts, et cetera. Boy, Chauvin has a tough, tough, tough uh, road to hoe uh, as part of the defense here. I don't see how they're going to overcome the, the evidence, the video evidence, the experts, et cetera. The trickier question is cause of death. Now, in uh, Mr. Floyd's case, you listed the immediate cause of death as cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual restraint, and neck compression. Correct. What does cardiopulmonary arrest mean? That's really just fancy medical lingo for the heart and the lungs stopped. The heart, no pulse, no breathing. Because the medical examiner did cite these other potential issues. We, we did find from the toxicology uh, amounts of fentanyl and methamphetamine in the results from the lab. That is correct. Uh, but I think so far, the evidence has actually been even stronger for the prosecution than some had expected. Meaning, yes, they've got their experts, but even the medical examiner himself, who was kind of nuanced in his report, was pretty definitive um, about this being the primary cause of death. For example, you know, Mr. Floyd's use of fentanyl did not cause the subdual or neck restraint. His heart disease did not cause the, um, the subdual or the neck restraint. I mean, I think they know there's no way 
that the jurors are going to say, oh, absolutely, it was fentanyl, no doubt about it. There's, there's no hope for that. The only hope is that the jurors will have reasonable doubt. Yes, the prosecution gets ready to hand this over to the defense as soon as today. Dan Abrams, thanks so much for the perspective. My pleasure. Next up on Start Here, the U.S. doesn't want Iran to get nuclear weapons, so why would the Biden administration be angry with Israel for taking them out? We're back in a bit. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. The devil never. The man's still in your house. Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. There's one more huge twist. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Tonight. Thank you, David, for showing us the love. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. It's easy to think that with a new president, lots of things just go back to the way they were before the old one, especially foreign policy, which is almost exclusively determined by the White House. And yet, when you look up, the U.S. is still on the defensive when it comes to immigration. We're still anxiously eyeing China. And because we still don't have a nuclear deal with Iran, Iran is still enriching uranium at levels the U.S. is not okay with. Iran is, is seeping out of the nuclear box that the agreement put it into, which is why I think we have an interest uh, in um, getting Iran back into that box. Uh, but as I said, right now, the ball is in their court. Well, this weekend, as Iran got ready to up its production even further, there was an explosion at a nuclear site, leaving the world wondering, was this an accident or an attack? Let's go to ABC senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel. Ian, what do we know about this explosion? There was a uh, power blackout as well as a result. Yes, that's right. Well, interestingly, actually, the head of uh, the Iranian Parliament's Energy Commission uh, late on Monday gave some more detail. In fact, the most detail we've actually seen so far. He said that it was sabotage at the electricity and cable distribution points related to emergency power batteries. All sounds very, very technical, um, but it essentially created a kind of explosion. It created a blackout. The attack hit Iran's underground Natanz nuclear facility and damaged the centrifuges it uses to enrich uranium. He said, I quote, the design of the enemy was very beautiful. I look at it scientifically. I don't know that those comments calling it beautiful attack uh, will go down well, but they're very clear. It's sabotage. Well, and that seems like the key word in all this attack, right? So, so 
Iran is saying this was clearly an attack from a foreign adversary. Are they right about that? I think to give the Iranians a credit, they're, they're not stupid. And yes, I think it's entirely likely. Multiple Israeli media outlets have quoted unnamed sources claiming that its Mossad spy service carried out a successful sabotage operation at Natanz, potentially setting back enrichment work there by months. I think the finger of blame is quite clearly being pointed at Israel. Israel has said nothing. It never does. Uh, but qui bono, who benefits? Uh, the obvious answer is Israel. Mr. Secretary, we both know the horrors of war. We both understand the importance of preventing war. And we both agree that Iran must never possess nuclear weapons. In his meetings on Monday uh, with the new U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, made it clear that Israel will not accept the development of what they think is uh, nuclear weapons capability. That's not something the Iranians say they're doing. They're just enriching uranium. But we know that that's what it could be used for. I will never allow Iran to obtain the nuclear capability to carry out its genocidal goal of eliminating Israel. The question is, the Iranians have said it's sabotage. They said it's nuclear terrorism. Those are the words of the Iranian foreign minister. Um, what does Iran do in response? And, and crucially, at a time when the US and Iran are involved in indirect talks to try and kickstart the JCPOA, the right. uh, nuclear agreement that President Trump withdrew from, what impact does it have? Well, th that's what I'm trying to figure out, Ian. Is the US... Like, I get we're allies with Israel, but is the U.S. cool with this? Like, is this kind of a necessary thing if you are trying to rein in Iran's nuclear ambitions, or does this hinder what the U.S. is trying to do? Okay, so there is a report out of Israel from a, a, a reporter um, who has some of the best contacts inside Israel. Anyone who follows the Middle East follows this, uh, this reporter, um, uh, Barak Ravid, and he has got three government sources who are telling him that there is going to be a... a uh, a, a conference call um, between the U.S. National Security Advisor and his Israeli counterpart to discuss this. Uh, now, we understand this is going to be the second of these kinds of meetings and that the U.S. has sought assurances from the Israelis that it won't do anything that essentially potentially jeopardizes those talks. Uh, we are focused on the discussions that we expect to proceed this Wednesday uh, in Vienna. Uh, Will the U.S. be happy? at this? I think the answer's got to be no. Uh, they don't want to jeopardize those talks. They want to get back around the table with the Iranians uh, and get back into this agreement. We expect them to be difficult and long. We have not been given any indication about a change in participation for these discussions. Was this attack, I think crucially, was this attack the minimum that is acceptable to uh, the Iranians, the Israelis, and the Americans? In other words, the Iranians are going to wring their hands and say, this was terrible, we're going to seek revenge, but actually not do very much about it, or certainly not in the short term. The Israelis will feel happy because they've effectively set back the production of uranium, which they worry will produce a nuclear weapon, and the Americans will accept it because they'll say, OK, there's a lot of saber rattling, but actually this will not derail the talks. But we won't know until we see what happens around the table. Right, like on the scale of zero to sending missiles into a, an Iranian army base or something. This is somewhere in the middle of that, the gray area when it comes to sort of Middle Eastern conflict. Uh, Ian Panel, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Hey, quick break coming your way now, but when we come back, how much would you pay for used sneakers? It's got to be the shoes. One last thing heading your way. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. 
Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historical election versus the competition the number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news abc news is america's number one news tonight another black man fatally shot minutes from where Derek chauvin stands trial for the killing of george floyd the outrage over what police suggest was a deadly mistake world news tonight with david muir is america's number one most watched newscast And one last thing. There was this phrase I heard recently that I liked. Greenwashing. As in companies greenwashing their practices to make themselves seem more environmentally sustainable than they actually are. Example, clothing companies. A single pair of jeans requires, for example, around 8,000 liters of water. It's quite a bit. <laughs> Think about it. Right, you can make a big announcement ahead of Earth Day next week saying, yay, we don't use plastic water bottles in our stores anymore. But you still have an industry that blows through enormous amounts of resources for fast fashion where clothes go into landfills shortly after being purchased. We know that, for example, in Germany, people purchase on average 60 pieces of clothing per year and often wear them for only half as long as they did 15 years ago. Well, yesterday, Nike announced a new category of shoes that it's selling, used ones. Nike's a big company, and we have a big responsibility to be uh, combating climate change at every chance that we have. Later this month, the company says it will launch a refurbished shoe program in which they'll sell shoes that have been gently used or perhaps came out of the factory less than perfect. This is not going to be a thrift store atmosphere that only buy back shoes from customers within 60 days of purchase. But this will be a test for one of the world's most iconic brands to see if they can emulate another. There's a little label that says Apple certified refurbished. But everything else in the box is exactly the same. It feels like you get a new product. Apple has refurbished products for years, creating what economists call a circular supply chain. You sell brand new stuff to wealthier customers at high prices and then buy it back from them cheap before selling it to someone else. You're producing something once, but selling it twice. You can also get cheap materials for your next line of products. Nike says if you send in shoes that aren't good enough to resell, not to worry, they'll either donate them or grind them up to be used in the soles of their next shoes. But lots of folks do not send in their pairs to Nike when they're done with them. They just chuck them. This is a company that has gotten rich as people collect dozens or even hundreds more pairs of shoes than they actually need. So the motto from sustainability activists to every company this month will be, don't just talk about saving the earth, just do it. A celebrity someday where designers are just begging me to borrow clothes for award shows because then you get to act like you're saving the earth just by borrowing clothes like you're welcome everyone the struggle is real real we'll be sure to keep you updated today on what is happening in minnesota in the meantime check out abcnews.com or the abc news app i'm brad bilkey see you tomorrow
Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. In today's update, a second night of protests broke out in Minnesota after body camera footage was released in the deadly police shooting of Dante Wright. Officials are calling it an accidental discharge. The officer involved is a 26-year veteran in charge of training other officers. Hear what Wright's family is saying this morning. And breaking news, the CDC is recommending a pause in the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine here in the U.S. The agency says the recommendation comes out of an abundance of caution after a few cases of blood clots in people who received the vaccine. We have more on that and the new treatment raising hope for those already infected with COVID. And the prosecution is expected to rest their case in the trial of Derek Chauvin today. Yesterday, George Floyd's brother took the stand with an emotional testimony about the type of brother George was. A cardiologist also testified that Floyd's heart stopped due to lack of oxygen, not because of heart disease or drugs. We have the latest on what to expect as the defense starts calling witnesses. Well, we begin with that breaking news about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The CDC and FDA have released a statement calling for a pause on Johnson & Johnson vaccinations after six reported U.S. cases of blood clots in vaccine recipients. Eva Pilgrim has the latest from Brooklyn. Good morning, Eva. The U.S. government calling for a pause on the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This after six people developed a rare disorder involving blood clots about two weeks after receiving the vaccine. Here's what we know about those six people. They were all women between the ages of 18 and 48. One woman died. A second woman is in the hospital in Nebraska in critical condition. About 7 million people have gotten the J&J vaccine at this point. And although the number of these cases with this rare disorder are very very small. Out of an abundance of caution, the U.S. government hitting pause on the use of the J&J &J vaccine. Diane. All right, Eva in Brooklyn, thanks for that. And earlier on GMA, George Stephanopoulos talked to Dr. Ashish Jha about the calls to pause the J&J &J vaccine. Let's listen. Dr. Jha, uh, let me play devil's advocate here for a second. Safety first, of course, but six cases out of seven million, that's an infinitesimal percentage. Is the FDA overreacting here? Yeah, good morning, George. Thanks for having me on. I think the FDA is getting it right, and let me walk through it. Again, you're absolutely right. I believe the J&J &J vaccine is exceedingly safe. Uh, these are very rare events, uh, but we don't know if they're linked to the vaccine, and we don't know if there are other cases out there that we've missed. Um, so it's the right thing to take a pause, a brief pause, get gather some more data, make a plan, uh, and then come back to the market. I know there are people who are going to be upset about this. Uh, this is how our system work, works. We always err on the side of safety. I think this is the right way to go. So what's going to happen next? 
Yeah, what's going to happen next is there's going to be a meeting of the advisory committee for the, CD, uh, for the CDC. They're going to review all the data. The FDA is going through data probably of, of all the folks who've gotten vaccinated, what we know, what we're tracking. And then based on that, they're going to make a new set of recommendations. And my sense is they're going to unpause, uh, but they, they may not, or they may uh, make it, you know, more for certain types of, of people over others. We'll have to see. But this is, uh, a, you know, we want to make a data-driven decision, and this is how you do it. We all we know already that there are some people, many people, who are hesitant to take the vaccines. This is like to increase their hesitancy. What's your message to them? Yeah, you know, it might, and there are people who are worried that this is going to increase hesitancy. My strategy on this has always been we should level with the American people. We should share with them that we have a system that is very vigorous at uh, making sure that drugs and vaccines are safe. And that's what is happening today. We have a system that's working. And so I personally hope that this will build more confidence in the vaccines. Uh, that's, I think, what people should be focused on is a system that really works to protect safety. And your overall message on the vaccines? I think the J&J &J vaccine is both terrific in its efficacy and it is exceedingly safe. Uh, based on everything I know, I'd feel comfortable having my family get it. And we'll see what the FDA and CDC says. Our thanks to George and Dr. Ja for that interview. Meanwhile, about 40 people have been arrested for rioting or violating curfew after new video was released in the fatal police shooting of Dante Wright. Crowds clashed with police in suburban Minneapolis, and police say some officers were injured by objects thrown by the crowd. The demonstrations come after the Brooklyn Center police chief released body cam video of the shooting, saying he believes the officer meant to use her taser instead of her gun. ABC Stephanie Ramos is in Minnesota with the latest. Overnight, new protests erupting nationwide from Portland to Seattle to New York City as police in Minnesota clash with demonstrators for the second night in a row. Some businesses were reportedly looted with their front windows smashed in. Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, seeing roughly 40 arrests overnight over the death of 20-year-old Dante Wright, an unarmed black man killed during a traffic stop in a Minneapolis suburb. In the body camera footage released 24 hours after the shooting, police say the officer involved accidentally discharged a gun instead of a taser, killing the young father. As I watch the video and listen to the officer's commands, it is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. A mix-up the police chief says they train to avoid. We train with our handguns on our dominant side and our taser on our weak side. The fatal encounter happening just before 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon when the police chief says Wright was pulled over for an expired vehicle registration. But when officers ran Wright's name through their system, they discovered a warrant out for his arrest. Court records show that warrant was issued after Wright failed to appear in court earlier this month following misdemeanor charges for allegedly carrying a firearm without a permit and running away from law enforcement. Police say Wright was trying to get back into the vehicle when the fatal shot was fired. Wright driving the car for several blocks before crashing into another vehicle. Wright died at the scene. The medical examiner ruling it a homicide saying he died from a gunshot wound to the chest. Wright's sister Diamond telling us how she hopes her brother is remembered. He wanted to be known. This we are now learning the name of the officer who fired that shot, Officer Kim Potter, who has been with the force for 26 years. During that fatal traffic stop, she was training another officer. She remains on administrative leave. My position is that uh, we cannot afford to make mistakes that lead to uh, the loss of life uh, of, of other people in, in our profession. And so I do fully support uh, releasing the officer of her duties. And Stephanie Ramos joins me live from Brooklyn Center for more on this. Stephanie, what are you seeing there uh, in the aftermath of these protests and what are you hearing from people on the ground? 
Well, Diane, we can see the remnants from the clashes between protesters and police last night here on the ground, right in front of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. We can see trash, bottles of water, glass littered everywhere. You can probably hear the street sweepers making their way through, trying to clean up this mess. Also, last night across the city, law enforcement and the Minnesota National Guard were spread out across this area, trying to protect businesses, some of them looted. And you can still see a National Guardsman post right outside the, uh, the police department behind me now. Uh, obviously, a very tense uh, situation here overnight. People are upset. In a briefing overnight, the sheriff's department said their main goal last night was to maintain peace, and they tried to maintain as much order as they could. Some officers, as you mentioned, Diane, were injured, and police tell us that a, a small amount of businesses were burglarized, but we are hearing from Dante's family. They say they would like these protests and demonstrations to remain peaceful. Diane. All right, Stephanie Ramos in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Thanks, Stephanie. And earlier on GMA, Robin Roberts spoke to Dante Wright's parents, and his mother shared details about her last phone call with her son. Can you please share with us what you all said to each other? He called me and he said, um, Mom, I've just been pulled over. I said, for what? He said, they said they pulled me over because I had air fresheners hanging in the rearview mirror. I said, okay, we'll take them down. And then he said, um, he said, well, they're also asking for insurance. And I said, well, when the police officer comes back up to the window, um, give him the phone and I can explain and give him all the insurance information. He said, okay. And then um, the police officers came back up to the window and asked Dante to step out of the car. And Dante said, for what? Am I in trouble? And the officer said, we're going to explain that when you step out of the car. So, and they asked him to put the phone down. And I heard the phone getting put down pretty hard. And I heard an officer ask for them to hang up the phone. And then I didn't hear anything else. Oh. I tried to call back mm -hmm. three three, four times, and then um, the girl that was with him answered the phone, and she said that he, they shot him, and he was laying in the driver's seat, unresponsive. This is the last time I've seen my son. I haven't seen him since. The police chief, he said that he believes that the shooting, that the officer meant to shoot the taser, not her gun, and that it was an accidental shooting. Do you accept that explanation, Mr. Wright? I cannot accept that. I lost my son. He's never coming back. I can't accept that. A, a, a mistake, that's not, that doesn't even sound right. You know, this officer that's been on the force for 26 plus, 26 years. I can't accept that. I would like to see justice served and her held accountable for everything that she's taken from us. Many people are upset that, again, another black man has lost his life at the hands of police, but you all have been consistent in calling for peace and calm. So, Mrs. Wright, what do you want to say to those who, who want to take to the streets on behalf of your son? I want to say thank you so much for the support and standing by us and making sure that my son's name has been heard and asking for justice and asking for that we that we get everything that we need out of this and making sure that my son's name doesn't get swept under the rug and forgot about. Mr. and Mrs. Wright, tell people about your son. My son was an amazing, loving kid. He had a big heart. He loved basketball. He had a two-year-old son that's not going to be able to play basketball with him. He had sisters and brothers that he loved so much. He was an uncle, a grandson. He had a smile that would light up the room. It was so big and bright. And he was just, he was amazing. And he's my son, and he's never going to, he just had his whole life taken away from him. We had our hearts pulled out of our chest. He was my baby. Our thanks to Robin Robert and the Wright family for that interview.
And I want to bring in former NYPD detective Mark Claxton of the Black Law Enforcement Alliance for more on this case and, and the general topic of race and policing that this once again ignites. Uh, Mark, the police chief, Tim Gannon, released this body cam video yesterday saying the shooting appeared to be accidental and that the officer likely meant to draw her taser instead of her gun. We heard the Wright family there, or at least uh, Dante's dad, say that he doesn't accept that. You've been in the line of duty. What was your reaction when you saw the video? Um, well, my, my initial reaction uh, is that it seems as if we're stuck in this tragic time loop. It's, it's sort of like being um, the character, uh, Bill Murray's character in Groundhog's Day, where you repeat these uh, this episode and these incidents time and time again. This isn't the first time that a police officer has discharged their firearm and fatally uh, injured someone. Uh, Oscar Grant, 2009, uh, there was a Mr. Bates in Oklahoma uh, where a volunteer sheriff's deputy used the same, quote, unquote, excuse about uh, an accident being confused between the taser and the firearm. So we ha there's a history of this. And we can have these discussions about, uh, you know, principles such as proportionality or use of force, a critical decision-making process. But until we uh, acknowledge and, and address the, 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 the pink elephant in the room, that the guidelines, the rules, the regulations, and even too often the law are no match for toxic police culture, which is propped up by both implicit and explicit bias, intolerance, and racism, and too often leads to these totally avoidable situations that uh, uh, turn fatal uh, more often than not. We'll be back here again. Now, uh, you're talking about history repeating itself. Well, we're seeing that in the, in the protests and demonstrations that are happening as well. As usual, we're seeing peaceful protests during the day, but that's changing at night. There's already a curfew in place. Uh, the police chief is saying that some officers were injured last night and some 40 people were arrested. So what's the best way for police to deal with this and try to bring the temperature down? Well, first, let me say that, you know, I, I, I'm supportive of peaceful demonstrations and protests, but I'm not uh, confused about why the level of anxiety and anger is high. Uh, but like I said, if we continue to have these types of incidents, people begin to react in ways that are uncomfortable and dangerous, not only for themselves, but for the professional police officers out there charged with securing the street. The police have to get to the point or have to be forced into the point where they realize that there are consequences for behavior. And until you enforce some consequences against police who operate outside of their responsibilities or who operate under the color of law, until you really enforce some discipline against them, these incidents will continue to occur. And they will continue to occur in the black and brown communities primarily, because that's what history has told us. So until we get to the point where we can even acknowledge that the policing has become overly aggressive, overly militarized, and race-based, we'll be back at this point again, perhaps in another town, with a similar storyline. Now, Maryland passed police reform measures this week that would repeal job protections in the police disciplinary process and increase the civil liability limit on lawsuits against police. What effect do you think that could have? Could we see other states follow suit there? And what are some other reforms that you'd like to see? I think the, the Maryland reforms are significant. And the reason is because police operate uh, with two realities. It's either the carrot or the stick. So for policing, if you want change, either you incentivize or you penalize. And I think a removal of some of the, the artificial protections that were set up uh, to protect police from full accountability is very helpful in reform. I think what's been done in New York is significant when you eliminate qualified immunity, and it's done in other jurisdictions as well. I think what uh, is occurring in other jurisdictions that have decided to limit the input of uh, police unions into areas other than health benefits salary, because around this, this nation, there are police organizations and unions 
who have significant input into the rules and regulations of the very agencies that they have members that they have to represent. And that's wrong. So if we increase police exposure and accountability, you'll see significant uh, behavior modification. And Mark, specific to this case, you know, as you said, this isn't the first time that we're hearing about the possibility of an officer confusing their gun for a taser. So could we see more changes to the taser, maybe a different kind of trigger mechanism so it's not possible to confuse it for a gun? Do you think we could see some concrete changes like that? I think it is a mistake to address this issue and these type of incidents as if they are training issues. They aren't training issues. And to establish that quite clearly, uh, the one common factor in all of these quote unquote accidents where you confuse the taser for the firearm is that the victims are black. So let's begin to analyze and take a look at that. And, and keep in mind, in, uh, in Minnesota, after the killing of uh, Fernando Castile, there was significant monies into a fund, a training fund, to help police improve their response and to prevent these type of tragedies. Well, here we are some years later, and we're still facing the same challenges. So if this is not merely a training issue. All professionals need uh, additional training, continued training and education. That's understandable. But this is larger, deeper. The pathology of these issues is outside the realm of training and tactics. All right. Mark Claxton, it's always great to have your analysis. Thank you. Thank you. And the prosecution is expected to rest its case today in the trial of Derek Chauvin after emotional testimony yesterday from George Floyd's brother. When we come back, what to expect in court today as the defense starts calling its own witnesses. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. Devil never. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. There's one more huge twist. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Welcome back. The prosecution is preparing to rest its case in the trial of Derek Chauvin today. The prosecution's last witnesses come after more experts took the stand yesterday and after emotional testimony from George Floyd's brother. Alex Perez is at the courthouse in Minneapolis with more. 
This morning, after 11 days of testimony from 38 witnesses, the prosecution preparing to rest their case in Derek Chauvin's trial. The state will call Dr. Jonathan Rich. Cardiologist Dr. Jonathan Rich testifying that George Floyd's heart stopped due to lack of oxygen caused by being restrained face down on the ground with Chauvin's knee on his neck, not, as the defense argues, because of heart disease or the drugs found in his system. I can state with a high degree of medical certainty that George Floyd did not die from a primary cardiac event and he did not die from a drug overdose. The state's witnesses, including 10 medical experts and a dozen members of law enforcement, reinforcing the prosecution's argument on what caused Floyd's death and whether Chauvin's use of force was appropriate. Both the knee across Mr. Floyd's neck and the prone restraint were unreasonable, excessive, and contrary to generally accepted police practices. On the witness stand of Floyd's younger brother, Felonis Floyd, emotionally recounting the, quote, one-of-a-kind relationship George had with their mother. That's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. The jury shown never-before-seen photos of Floyd as a young child in his mother's arms, as a teenager growing up in Houston, and as a community college athlete. His baby brother remembering him as a mama's boy. He was so much of a, a leader to us in the household. He would always make sure that we had our clothes for school. He made sure that we all were going to be uh, to school on time. He showed us like uh, how to treat our mom and how to respect our mom. He, he just, he loved her so dearly. And Alex Perez joins me live now from Minneapolis. Alex, yesterday the judge denied the defense's request to sequester the jury. Now, could that change of protests in the Minneapolis area grow in response to Dante Wright's shooting? Well, Diane, right now we don't expect that to change for the duration of the trial. Now, Eric Nelson has tried this, the defense attorney has tried this on more than one occasion to have the jury sequestered. He actually brought it up before jury selection. But the judge essentially is saying, you know what, this jury, we went through the process of selecting them. They've agreed to abide by jury instructions. There's no indication right now that they are not doing that. So he doesn't want to sequester them during testimony. Now, the judge did, however, tell jurors that they should pack a bag and be ready because they will be sequestered once deliberations begin and we expect that will be sometime next week diane closing arguments are set for monday diane right. alex perez in minneapolis thanks for that and let's bring in host and legal analyst from the law and crime network terry austin for more on this terry good morning really quickly on the jury sequestration question could eric nelson be gearing up to create a case for appeal already with that I think Nelson is definitely gearing up for appeal. He's been taking notes the whole time for any issue that could possibly grant his clients some relief. And the sequestration, you know, he has already said that he thought the jury should all along be kept separate from the public so they wouldn't be seeing what's going on in the news. And we know for a fact that the jurors have seen some things going on in the news because the judge has spoken to them. So I think that might be an issue that he could take up on appeal. Now, the prosecution is preparing to rest their case today. Overall, do you think they successfully made their case beyond a reasonable doubt? I do, because if you think about it, they have established that this use of force was unreasonable. We saw that the last witness, which was on, was Stoughton, and he was amazing. He was from an academic perspective, but he broke it down to the jury as though looking at use of force was a science, and technically it is. You are supposed to be assessing the circumstance, assessing the threat, making sure that the force you use is in response to the threat, and whether or not that was reasonable and he gave his opinion that this was not reasonable force and that's going to go to the manslaughter count and I think the prosecution if they've established nothing else they've definitely established that this was not reasonable and that would be that manslaughter count.
And Terry, yesterday we heard some emotional testimony from George Floyd's brother. And the goal of that spark of life testimony is to humanize the victim. But the judge also warned that if those witnesses venture too far into testifying about George Floyd's character, that could open the door for the defense to be allowed to talk about his criminal history. Do you think there's a risk that Courtney Ross, George Floyd's girlfriend, or Felonis Floyd, that their testimony may have ventured into that territory? I thought they'd kept it very tight. They did a great job of making sure they didn't go into his character in that regard. They just talked about the fact that he was a loving son and a loving father, and they kept it very, very tight so there wouldn't be any chance that it opened the door to getting into his character. So great job. I think they could have done a little bit more in terms of his giving back to the community or other things like that that occurred when George Floyd was an adult versus the childhood, but I think that they were being cautious not to make sure they opened that door. All right. Terry Austin, always great to have your analysis. Thank you, and we will see you a little bit later for our continuing coverage of the trial of Derek Chauvin. Thanks, Terry. And court is set to resume within the hour. We'll have more on who the defense might call and what that could mean for the case as they prepare to present their case when we come back. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? To figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier Podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show. ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. We just heard that opening bell on Wall Street. Stocks are expected to open slightly up this morning after the markets stumbled a bit on Monday with all major indexes closing down. But a lot could change later in the week when the first quarter earnings season kicks off. Right now, the Dow is down about 60. And as the prosecution rests in the Derek Chauvin trial, the defense is expected to start calling its own witnesses and presenting its case to the jury. Alex Perget is in Minneapolis with more on what we can expect today. Hi, Alex. 
Hey, Diane, this Tuesday, the big thing we're expecting is for the prosecution, the state, to finish presenting its case in this Chauvin trial. At that point, the defense will start calling its witnesses. They hope to call Maurice Hall, the man who was inside the car with George Floyd that Memorial Day. But Hall has indicated the intends to plead the Fifth Amendment. But one of the standout moments yesterday, George Floyd's younger brother, Philonis, giving spark of life testimony. He broke into tears, testifying that Floyd was a leader amongst their siblings and often made those banana and mayo sandwiches. Prosecutors then used a use of force expert testifying he didn't view Floyd or the bystanders as a threat, calculating three and a half minutes into the restraint before they started criticizing officers' actions. There was also a critical testimony from a cardiologist, Dr. Jonathan Rich, who says he found no evidence that Floyd died from a heart attack or fentanyl or methamphetamine overdose. Now, looking ahead, there's a press conference scheduled today between the Floyd family and the family of Dante Wright. And finally, we got a new timeline from Judge Cahill in this trial. He expects the defense to finish presenting its evidence by the end of the week, possibly even before Friday to have Friday off. And that means that come Monday, there would be closing arguments. And at that point, the jury would be sequestered. Diane. All right, Alex Perche for us in Minneapolis. Thanks, Alex. And that does it for this ABC News Live update. I'm Diane Macedo. We'll have live coverage of the Derek Chauvin trial when testimony resumes in just a little while. We'll see you then. Stay safe. Tuesday, April 13th, protesters didn't want a new name to chant, but they've got one. We start here. Will you stand with us? Yes! With police reform advocates already descending on Minneapolis, another black man unjustly dies at the hands of police. It is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. The officer who pulled the trigger claims she didn't know it was the trigger of a gun. Meanwhile, just minutes away, the prosecution gets ready to wrap its case against Derek Chauvin. There's no way that the jurors are going to say, oh, absolutely, it was fentanyl. We'll ask which witness his jurors are paying attention to. And did Israel just take a shot at Iran? It essentially created a kind of explosion. Iran is scaling up its nuclear production, but the U.S. might be upset with Israel. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. surprising things about the death of George Floyd last year was just how quickly the outcry grew. Look at him. Within moments of Derek Chauvin planting his knee on George Floyd's neck, there was a small crowd. Within hours of his death, there was a much bigger crowd. Within days, buildings were on fire. Of course, there were many who might say this was not surprising at all. If you knew how Americans felt about excessive police force, particularly Americans of color, if you knew about race relations in Minneapolis. Once the trial started, a lot of trauma came back up to the surface. The city's on edge, but, you know. There's been a growing sense of unease of what might happen as the Derek Chauvin trial wraps up. What a guilty verdict would mean. What a non-guilty verdict would mean. But either way, you might think, surely this entire episode has an effect on the way police officers, particularly police officers in Minnesota, see their job. So we're going to begin with the protests erupting once again on the streets of Minnesota, this time in a Minneapolis suburb. Well, on Sunday afternoon, a year after the death of George Floyd, less than a 30-minute drive from the spot where where he died, another black man was killed by police. If the Minneapolis area was tense going into this weekend, right now it is clearly the epicenter of America's tension over police force. Let's go straight to ABC Stephanie Ramos, who's in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, right now, just north of Minneapolis. Stephanie, can we take a step back? Can you just walk us through what happened and how this turned into such a flashpoint? Absolutely. So the shooting happened just before two o'clock Sunday afternoon when authorities say 20 year old Dante Wright was pulled over for an expired vehicle registration just outside Minneapolis, as you mentioned. So there was a contact that the officer went up there initially for. 
obtained, obtained his, his ID or his driver, his name, and he walked back to his car, and at that time he ran his name, and he found out that he was a warrant. Now, according to the Brooklyn was... Center Police Department, the officers ran Wright's name through their system, discovering there was a warrant. Now, court records show that warrant was issued after Wright failed to appear in court earlier this month, following charges of possessing a firearm without a permit and running away from law enforcement. He called me at about 1.40 Dante's mom actually got a call from him as he was being pulled over. Then I heard the police officer come to the window and say, put the phone down and get out of the car. And Dante said, why? And he said, we'll explain to you when you get out of the car. Police say that on Sunday, right when he was pulled over, when he stepped out of the car, he tried to get back into the vehicle as officers attempted to apprehend him. And I heard scuffling and I heard the police officer say, Dante, don't run. And then... The other officer said, put the phone down and hung it up. So at this point, there's a scuffle. You, you see in the body camera video that was just released. You see Wright trying to get into his car. You see police officers trying to grab him. moment is when he is shot by one of the officers there on the scene and then two like a minute later i called and his girlfriend answered which was the passenger in the car and said that he'd been shot and he, she put it on the driver's side and my son was laying there lifeless as you can hear the officer, while struggling with Mr. Wright, shouts, taser, taser, several times. Now, police that say that officer, who is a veteran on the force, accidentally discharged a gun instead of a taser. As I watch the video and listen to the officer's commands, it is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. This appears to me... From what I viewed and the officer's reaction and distress immediately after, that this was an accidental discharge that resulted in the tragic death of Mr. Wright. The police chief saying that that is just absolutely unacceptable. That police officer right now is on administrative leave pending an investigation. But wait, 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 wait. You're saying she thought she was pulling out her taser instead it was a gun and then she pulled the trick. Like, is that a thing? How does that how does that happen? Exactly. And and those are questions that a lot of people here on the ground in Brooklyn Center and around the country are really asking, how are you a veteran on the force? And can't tell the difference in that brief moment, the difference between a taser and a weapon. And it is what many people here on the ground are saying is that police officers or anyone who is authorized to carry a weapon, they can't afford to make that mistake. Muscle memory is key. They need to know in that moment of panic, of fear, of control, whatever it is that they're feeling, they need to know what they're firing, whether it be a taser or a gun. Okay, so I guess what is it like there where you are in Brooklyn Center? What is it like in the Minneapolis region at this point? Will you stand with us? Yes. Yes. There have been a lot of protests in this area. Soon after the shooting of, of Wright, people came out on the streets. Ah! Good morning. We begin with breaking news in Brooklyn Center. The city is under curfew until 6 o'clock this morning, and the National Guard has been mobilized. This follows civil unrest. Officials say at least 20 businesses in Brooklyn Center alone have some sort of damage. It, it feels like we're in a war zone. This shooting scene isn't far from where the Chauvin trial is taking place. So there are already people in the area. It is already tense. So for this to happen so close to where those folks are gathered protesting police, it's just made matters worse. They always put it off on something. I was afraid or it was an accident. We want accountability. We want this officer fired. A curfew was put into effect, including Minneapolis and Brooklyn Center, where we are, and police are nervous. The escalation that we are seeing from the National Guard and all of this militarization is here to protect killer cops, not to protect people from the killer cops that are killing us. Yeah. And A lot of people are upset here, Brad.
And it's a good point that there was so many activists already crammed into Minneapolis right now. You can almost see how urgently the city is responding to this. Uh, Brooklyn Center says they've stripped the person in charge of the police force, the city manager, of their duties. But even if this was an accident, just so many questions still about the circumstances leading up to it. Stephanie Ramos in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Brad. We recognize that this couldn't have happened at a worse time. We recognize that this is happening at a time when our community, when all of America, indeed all of the, the world, is watching our community. And you could sense how this is all echoed around Minnesota, how on edge the entire state is. Well, just down the road from Brooklyn Park, the trial of a different police officer was continuing with some really dramatic testimony. Let's go to ABC's chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams. Dan, for the first time, we actually heard from a family member of George Floyd yesterday. I think they call it the spark of life testimony. What is that and how important was it here? It's very unusual to have this kind of testimony where you're really just testifying to humanize uh, the the victim. Um, it's interesting because defense attorneys would tell you it's prejudicial, right? That it's unfair to the defendant uh, to simply try and get sympathy as opposed to focusing on the facts and the evidence. Said, Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Felonis Floyd. But in the state of Minnesota, it is um, uh, completely permissible. And that was the purpose of calling George Floyd's brother. Me and George, we grew up together playing video games a lot. Uh, his favorite game was on Nintendo. We played Double Dribble and we played Tick Mobile. Was just and to remind the jurors that he isn't a anonymous thing. He isn't just that guy you saw on the video. He's not just a symbol. Yeah, he was a person. He used to make the best banana mayonnaise sandwiches, and he used to make syrup sandwiches because George couldn't cook, he couldn't boil water. I don't think in the end it's going to be a make-or-break issue. I think it is very emotional, I think from a sort of you know, a human perspective. Sir, would you please describe uh, this photo and what you know about it? That's, that's my mother. She's no longer with us right now, but that's, that's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. It's very powerful, but I think when the jurors get back there and start deliberating the case, it's not going to be uh, one of the critical points in the trial. Hey, and so I imagine the, some of the most critical stuff will be what we continue to hear from doctors, right, about whether... George Floyd would still be alive if not for Derek Chauvin's actions. Who is winning that argument right now? Well, remember, we haven't heard the defense's case yet, right? right. So this is just the defense attorney cross-examining the prosecution's witnesses. So, you know, we need to be careful. Uh, but with that said, there are two fundamental questions in this case, reasonableness of the use of force and cause of death. On the question of reasonableness of the use of force, that's when you're hearing police experts and use of force experts, et cetera. Boy, Chauvin has a tough, tough, tough uh, road to hoe uh, as part of the defense here. I don't see how they're going to overcome the, the evidence, the video evidence, the experts, et cetera. The trickier question is cause of death. Now, in uh, Mr. Floyd's case, you listed the immediate cause of death as cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual restraint, and neck compression. Correct. What does cardiopulmonary arrest mean? That's really just fancy medical lingo for the heart and the lungs stopped. The heart, no pulse, no breathing. Because the medical examiner did cite these other potential issues. We, we did find from the toxicology uh, amounts of fentanyl and methamphetamine in the results from the lab. That is correct. Uh, but I think so far the evidence has actually been even stronger for the prosecution than some had expected. Meaning, yes, they've got their experts, but even the medical examiner himself, who was kind of nuanced in his report, was pretty definitive um, about this being the primary cause of death. For example, you know, Mr. Floyd's use of fentanyl did not cause the subdual or neck restraint. His heart disease did not cause the, um, the subdual or the neck restraint. I mean, I think they know there's no way that the jurors are going to say, oh, absolutely, it was fentanyl, no doubt about it. There's, there's no hope for that. 
The only hope is that the jurors will have reasonable doubt. Yes, the prosecution gets ready to hand this over to the defense as soon as today. Dan Abrams, thanks so much for the perspective. My pleasure. Next up on Start Here, the U.S. doesn't want Iran to get nuclear weapons, so why would the Biden administration be angry with Israel for taking them out? We're back in a bit. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they are loved, to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. It's easy to think that with a new president, lots of things just go back to the way they were before the old one, especially foreign policy, which is almost exclusively determined by the White House. And yet, when you look up, the U.S. is still on the defensive when it comes to immigration. We're still anxiously eyeing China. And because we still don't have a nuclear deal with Iran, Iran is still enriching uranium at levels the U.S. is not okay with. Iran is, is seeping out of the nuclear box that the agreement put it into, which is why I think we have an interest uh, in um, getting Iran back into that box. Uh, but as I said, right now, the ball is in their court. Well, this weekend, as Iran got ready to up its production even further, there was an explosion at a nuclear site, leaving the world wondering, was this an accident or an attack? Let's go to ABC senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel. Ian, what do we know about this explosion? There was a, a power blackout as well as a result. Yes, that's right. Well, interestingly, actually, the head of uh, the Iranian Parliament's Energy Commission uh, late on Monday gave some more detail. In fact, the most detail we've actually seen so far. He said that it was sabotage at the electricity and cable distribution points related to emergency power batteries. All sounds very, very technical, um, but it essentially created a kind of explosion. It created a blackout. The attack hit Iran's underground Natanz nuclear facility and damaged the centrifuges it uses to enrich uranium. He said, I quote, the design of the enemy was very beautiful. I look at it scientifically. I don't know that those comments calling it beautiful attack it will go down well, but they're very clear. It's sabotaged. Well, and that seems like the key word in all this attack, right? So, so Iran is saying this was clearly an attack from a foreign adversary. Are they right about that? I think to give the Iranians a credit, that they're, they're not stupid. And yes, I think it's entirely likely. Multiple Israeli media outlets have quoted unnamed sources claiming that its Mossad spy service carried out a successful sabotage operation at Natanz, potentially setting back enrichment work there by months. 
I think the finger of blame is quite clearly being pointed at Israel. Israel has said nothing. It never does. Uh, but qui bono? Who benefits? Uh, the obvious answer is Israel. Mr. Secretary, we both know the horrors of war. We both understand the importance of preventing war, and we both agree that Iran must never possess nuclear weapons. In his meetings on Monday uh, with the new U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, made it clear that Israel will not accept the development of what they think is uh, nuclear weapons capability. That's not something the Iranians say they're doing. They're just enriching uranium, but we know that that's what it could be used for. I will never allow Iran to obtain the nuclear capability to carry out its genocidal goal of eliminating Israel. The question is, the Iranians have said it's sabotage. They said it's nuclear terrorism. Those are the words of the Iranian foreign minister. Um, what does Iran do in response? And, and crucially, at a time when the US and Iran are involved in indirect talks to try and kickstart the JCPOA, the right. uh, nuclear agreement that President Trump withdrew from, what impact does it have? Well, th that's what I'm trying to figure out, Ian. Is the US... Like, I get we're allies with Israel, but is the U.S. cool with this? Like, is this kind of a necessary thing if you are trying to rein in Iran's nuclear ambitions, or does this hinder what the U.S. is trying to do? Okay, so there is a report out of Israel from a, a, a reporter um, who has some of the best contacts inside Israel. Anyone who follows the Middle East follows this uh, this reporter, um, uh, Barak Ravid, and he has got three government sources who are telling him that there is going to be a... a uh, a conference call um, between the U.S. national security advisor and his Israeli counterpart to discuss this. Uh, now, we understand this is going to be the second of these kinds of meetings, and that the U.S. has sought assurances from the Israelis that it won't do anything that essentially potentially jeopardizes those talks. Uh, we are focused on the discussions that we expect to proceed this Wednesday uh, in Vienna. Uh, Will the U.S. be happy? at this? I think the answer's got to be no. Uh, they don't want to jeopardize those talks. They want to get back around the table with the Iranians uh, and get back into this agreement. We expect them to be difficult and long. We have not been given any indication about a change in participation for these discussions. Was this attack, I think crucially, was this attack the minimum that is acceptable to uh, the Iranians, the Israelis and the Americans? In other words, the Iranians are going to wring their hands and say this was terrible, we're going to seek revenge, but actually not do very much about it, or certainly not in the short term. The Israelis will feel happy because they've effectively set back the production of uranium, which they worry will produce a nuclear weapon, and the Americans will accept it because they'll say, OK, there's a lot of saber rattling, but actually this will not derail the talks. But we won't know until we see what happens around the table. Right, like on the scale of zero to sending missiles into a, an Iranian army base or something. This is somewhere in the middle of that, the gray area when it comes to sort of Middle Eastern conflict. Uh, Ian Panel, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Hey, quick break coming your way now, but when we come back, how much would you pay for used sneakers? It's got to be the shoes. One last thing heading your way. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. 
I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Walking a mile in people's boots and buying a new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. The devil never There's one more huge twist. 2020, Friday night on ABC. And one last thing. There was this phrase I heard recently that I liked. Greenwashing. As in companies greenwashing their practices to make themselves seem more environmentally sustainable than they actually are. Example, clothing companies. A single pair of jeans requires, for example, around 8,000 liters of water. It's quite a bit. <laughs> Think about it. Right, you can make a big announcement ahead of Earth Day next week saying, yay, we don't use plastic water bottles in our stores anymore. But you still have an industry that blows through enormous amounts of resources for fast fashion where clothes go into landfills shortly after being purchased. We know that, for example, in Germany, people purchase on average 60 pieces of clothing per year and often wear them for only half as long as they did 15 years ago. Well, yesterday, Nike announced a new category of shoes that it's selling, used ones. Nike's a big company, and we have a big responsibility to be uh, combating climate change at every chance that we have. Later this month, the company says it will launch a refurbished shoe program in which they'll sell shoes that have been gently used or perhaps came out of the factory less than perfect. This is not going to be a thrift store atmosphere that only buy back shoes from customers within 60 days of purchase. But this will be a test for one of the world's most iconic brands to see if they can emulate another. There's a little label that says Apple certified refurbished. But everything else in the box is exactly the same. It feels like you get a new product. Apple has refurbished products for years, creating what economists call a circular supply chain. You sell brand new stuff to wealthier customers at high prices and then buy it back from them cheap before selling it to someone else. You're producing something once, but selling it twice. You can also get cheap materials for your next line of products. Nike says if you send in shoes that aren't good enough to resell, not to worry, they'll either donate them or grind them up to be used in the soles of their next shoes. But lots of folks do not send in their pairs to Nike when they're done with them. They just chuck them. This is a company that has gotten rich as people collect dozens or even hundreds more pairs of shoes than they actually need. So the motto from sustainability activists to every company this month will be, don't just talk about saving the earth, just do it. I'm a celebrity someday where designers are just begging me to borrow clothes for award shows because then you get to act like you're saving the earth just by borrowing clothes. Like, you're welcome, everyone. The struggle is real, real. We'll be sure to keep you updated today on what is happening in Minnesota. In the meantime, check out abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Bilkey. See you tomorrow. Macedo, thanks for streaming with us. In today's update, a second night of protests broke out in Minnesota after body camera footage was released in the deadly police shooting of Dante Wright. Officials are calling it an accidental discharge. The officer involved is a 26-year veteran in charge of training other officers. Hear what Wright's family is saying this morning. And breaking news, the CDC is recommending a pause in the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine here in the U.S. The agency says the recommendation comes out of an abundance of caution after a few cases of blood clots in people who received the vaccine. We have more on that and the new treatment raising hope for those already infected with COVID. And the prosecution is expected to rest their case in the trial of Derek Chauvin today. Yesterday, George Floyd's brother took the stand with an emotional testimony about the type of brother George was. A cardiologist also testified that Floyd's heart stopped due to lack of oxygen, not because of heart disease or drugs. We have the latest on what to expect as the defense starts calling witnesses. 
Well, we begin with that breaking news about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The CDC and FDA have released a statement calling for a pause on Johnson & Johnson vaccinations after six reported U.S. cases of blood clots in vaccine recipients. Eva Pilgrim has the latest from Brooklyn. Good morning, Eva. The U.S. government calling for a pause on the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This after six people developed a rare disorder involving blood clots about two weeks after receiving the vaccine. Here's what we know about those six people. They were all women between the ages of 18 and 48. One woman died. A second woman is in the hospital in Nebraska in critical condition. About 7 million people have gotten the J&J vaccine at this point. And although the number of these cases with this rare disorder are very very small. Out of an abundance of caution, the U.S. government hitting pause on the use of the J&J &J vaccine. Diane. All right, Eva in Brooklyn, thanks for that. And earlier on GMA, George Stephanopoulos talked to Dr. Ashish Shah about the calls to pause the J&J &J vaccine. Let's listen. Dr. Shah, uh, let me play devil's advocate here for a second. Safety first, of course, but six cases out of seven million, that's an infinitesimal percentage. Is the FDA overreacting here? Yeah, good morning, George. Thanks for having me on. I think the FDA is getting it right, and let me walk through it. Again, you're absolutely right. I believe the J&J &J vaccine is exceedingly safe. Uh, these are very rare events, uh, but we don't know if they're linked to the vaccine, and we don't know if there are other cases out there that we've missed. Um, so it's the right thing to take a pause, a brief pause, get gather some more data, make a plan, uh, and then come back to the market. I know there are people who are going to be upset about this. Uh, this is how our system work, works. We always err on the side of safety. I think this is the right way to go. So what's going to happen next? Yeah, what's going to happen next is there's going to be a meeting of the advisory committee for the, CD, uh, for the CDC. They're going to review all the data. The FDA is going through data probably of, of all the folks who've gotten vaccinated, what we know, what we're tracking. And then based on that, they're going to make a new set of recommendations. And my sense is they're going to unpause, uh, but they, they may not, or they may uh, make it, you know, more for certain types of, of people over others. We'll have to see. But this is, uh, a, you know, we want to make a data-driven decision, and this is how you do it. We all, we know all already that there are some people, many people, who are hesitant to take the vaccines. This is like to increase their hesitancy. What's your message to them? Yeah, you know, it might, and there are people who are worried that this is going to increase hesitancy. My strategy on this has always been we should level with the American people. We should share with them that we have a system that is very vigorous at uh, making sure that drugs and vaccines are safe. And that's what is happening today. We have a system that's working. And so I personally hope that this will build more confidence in the vaccines. Uh, that's, I think, what people should be focused on is a system that really works to protect safety. And your overall message on the vaccines? I think the J&J &J vaccine is both terrific in its efficacy and it is exceedingly safe. Uh, based on everything I know, I'd feel comfortable having my family get it, and we'll see what the FDA and CDC says. Our thanks to George and Dr. Ja for that interview. Meanwhile, about 40 people have been arrested for rioting or violating curfew after new video was released in the fatal police shooting of Dante Wright. Crowds clashed with police in suburban Minneapolis, and police say some officers were injured by objects thrown by the crowd. The demonstrations come after the Brooklyn Center police chief released body cam video of the shooting, saying he believes the officer meant to use her taser instead of her gun. ABC Stephanie Ramos is in Minnesota with the latest. Overnight, new protests erupting nationwide from Portland to Seattle to New York City as police in Minnesota clash with demonstrators for the second night in a row. Some businesses were reportedly looted with their front windows smashed in. Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, seeing roughly 40 arrests overnight over the death of 20-year-old Dante Wright, an unarmed black man killed during a traffic stop in a Minneapolis suburb. In the body camera footage released 24 hours Hours after the shooting, police say the officer involved accidentally discharged a gun instead of a taser, killing the young father. As I watched the video and listened to the officer's commands, it is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. A mix-up the police chief says they train to avoid. We train with our handguns on our dominant side, 
Right. And our taser on our weak side. The fatal encounter happening just before 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon when the police chief says Wright was pulled over for an expired vehicle registration. But when officers ran Wright's name through their system, they discovered a warrant out for his arrest. Court records show that warrant was issued after Wright failed to appear in court earlier this month following misdemeanor charges for allegedly carrying a firearm without a permit and running away from law enforcement. Police say Wright was trying to get back into the vehicle when the fatal shot was fired. Wright driving the car for several blocks before crashing into another vehicle. Wright died at the scene. The medical examiner ruling it a homicide saying he died from a gunshot wound to the chest. Wright's sister, Diamond, telling us how she hopes her brother is remembered. He wanted to be known. We are now learning the name of the officer who fired that shot, Officer Kim Potter, who has been with the force for 26 years. During that fatal traffic stop, she was training another officer. She remains on administrative leave. My position is that uh, we cannot afford to make mistakes that lead to uh, the loss of life uh, of, of other people in, in our profession. And so I do fully support uh, releasing the officer of her duties. And Stephanie Ramos joins me live from Brooklyn Center for more on this. Stephanie, what are you seeing there uh, in the aftermath of these protests, and what are you hearing from people on the ground? Well, Diane, we can see the remnants from the clashes between protesters and police last night here on the ground, right in front of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. We can see trash, bottles of water, glass littered everywhere. You can probably hear the street sweepers making their way through, trying to clean up this mess. Also, last night across the city, law enforcement and the Minnesota National Guard were spread out across this area, trying to protect businesses, some of them looted. And you can still see a National Guardsman post right outside the, uh, the police department behind me now. Uh, obviously, a very tense uh, situation here overnight. People are upset. In a briefing overnight, the sheriff's department said their main goal last night was to maintain peace, and they tried to maintain as much order as they could. Some officers, as you mentioned, Diane, were injured, and police tell us that a, a small amount of businesses were burglarized, but we are hearing from Dante's family. They say they would like these protests and demonstrations to remain peaceful. Diane. All right, Stephanie Ramos in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Thanks, Stephanie. And earlier on GMA, Robin Roberts spoke to Dante Wright's parents, and his mother shared details about her last phone call with her son. Can you please share with us what you all said to each other? He called me and he said, um, Mom, I've just been pulled over. I said, for what? He said, they said they pulled me over because I had air fresheners hanging in the rearview mirror. I said, okay, we'll take them down. And then he said, um, he said, well, they're also asking for insurance. And I said, well, when the police officer comes back up to the window, um, give him the phone and I can explain and give him all the insurance information. He said, okay. And then um, the police officers came back up to the window and asked Dante to step out of the car. And Dante said, for what? Am I in trouble? And the officer said, we're going to explain that when you step out of the car. So, and they asked him to put the phone down. And I heard the phone getting put down pretty hard. And I heard an officer ask for them to hang up the phone. And then I didn't hear anything else. Okay. I tried to call back mm -hmm. three, three, four times. And then um, the girl that was with him answered the phone. And she said that he, they shot him. And he was laying in the driver's seat, unresponsive. This is the last time I've seen my son. I haven't seen him since. The police chief, he said that he believes that the shooting, that the officer meant to shoot the taser, not her gun, and that it was an accidental shooting. Do you accept that explanation, Mr. Wright? I cannot accept that. I lost my son. He's never coming back. I can't accept that a, a, a mistake. That's not. That doesn't even sound right. You know, this officer that's been on the force for 26 plus 26 years. I can't accept that. I would like to see justice served and her held accountable for 
everything that she's taken from us. Many people are upset that, again, another black man has lost his life at the hands of police, but you all have been consistent in calling for peace and calm. So, Mrs. Wright, what do you want to say to those who, who want to take to the streets on behalf of your son? I want to say thank you so much for the support and standing by us and making sure that my son's name has been heard and asking for justice and asking for that we that we get everything that we need out of this and making sure that my son's name doesn't get swept under the rug and forgot about. Mr. and Mrs. Wright, tell people about your son. My son was an amazing, loving kid. He had a big heart. He loved basketball. He had a two-year-old son that's not going to be able to play basketball with him. He had sisters and brothers that he loved so much. He was an uncle, a grandson. He had a smile that would light up the room. It was so big and bright. And he was just, he was amazing. And he's my son, and he's never going to, he just had his whole life taken away from him. We had our hearts pulled out of our chest. He was my baby. <laughs> our thanks to Robin Robert and the Wright family for that interview. And I want to bring in former NYPD detective Mark Claxton of the Black Law Enforcement Alliance for more on this case and, and the general topic of race and policing that this once again ignites. Uh, Mark, the police chief, Tim Gannon, released this body cam video yesterday saying the shooting appeared to be accidental and that the officer likely meant to draw her taser instead of her gun. We heard the Wright family there, or at least uh, Dante's dad, say that he doesn't accept that. You've been in the line of duty. What was your reaction when you saw the video? Um, well, my, my initial reaction uh, is that it seems as if we're stuck in this tragic time loop. It's, it's sort of like being um, the character, uh, Bill Murray's character in Groundhog's Day, where you repeat these uh, this episode and these incidents time and time again. This isn't the first time that a police officer has discharged their firearm and fatally uh, injured someone. Uh, Oscar Grant, 2009, uh, there was a Mr. Bates in Oklahoma, uh, where a volunteer sheriff's deputy used the same quote-unquote excuse about uh, an accident being confused between the taser and the firearm. So we ha there's a history of this. And we can have these discussions about, uh, you know, principles such as proportionality or use of force, a critical decision-making process. But until we uh, acknowledge and, and address the, 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 the pink elephant in the room, that the guidelines, the rules, the regulations, and even too often the law are no match for toxic police culture, which is propped up by both implicit and explicit bias, intolerance, and racism and too often leads to these totally avoidable situations that uh, uh, turn fatal uh, more often than not. We'll be back here again. Now, uh, you're talking about history repeating itself. Well, we're seeing that in the, in the protests and demonstrations that are happening as well. As usual, we're seeing peaceful protests during the day, but that's changing at night. There's already a curfew in place. Uh, the police chief is saying that some officers were injured last night and well, some 40 people were arrested. So what's the best way for police to deal with this and try to bring the temperature down? Well, first, let me say that, you know, I, I, I'm supportive of peaceful demonstrations and protests, but I'm not uh, confused about why the level of anxiety and anger is high. Uh, but like I said, if we continue to have these types of incidents, people begin to react in ways that are uncomfortable and dangerous, not only for themselves, but for the professional police officers out there charged with securing the street. The police have to get to the point or have to be forced into the point where they realize that there are consequences for behavior. And until you enforce some consequences against police who operate outside of their responsibilities or who operate under the color of law, until you really enforce some discipline against them, these incidents will continue to occur. And they will continue to occur in the black and brown communities primarily, because that's what history has told us. So. 
until we get to the point where we can even acknowledge that the policing has become overly aggressive, overly militarized, and race-based, we'll be back at this point again, perhaps in another town with a similar storyline. Now, Maryland passed police reform measures this week that would repeal job protections in the police disciplinary process and increase the civil liability limit on lawsuits against police. What effect do you think that could have? Could we see other states follow suit there? And what are some other reforms that you'd like to see? I think the, the Maryland reforms are significant. And the reason is because police operate uh, with two realities. It's out of the carrot or the stick. So for policing, if you want change, either you incentivize or you penalize. And I think a removal of some of the, the artificial protections that were set up uh, to protect police from full accountability is very helpful in reform. I think what's being done in New York is significant when you eliminate qualified immunity, and it's done in other jurisdictions as well. I think what uh, is occurring in other jurisdictions that have decided to limit the input of uh, police unions into areas other than health benefits salary, because around this, this nation, there are police organizations and unions who have significant input into the rules and regulations of the very agencies that they have members that they have to represent. That's wrong. So if we increase police exposure and accountability, you'll see significant uh, behavior modification. And Mark, specific to this case, you know, as you said, this isn't the first time that we're hearing about the possibility of an officer confusing their gun for a taser. So could we see more changes to the taser, maybe a different kind of trigger mechanism so it's not possible to confuse it for a gun? Do you think we could see some concrete changes like that? I think it is a mistake to address this issue and these type of incidents as if they are training issues. They aren't training issues. And to establish that quite clearly, uh, the one common factor in all of these quote unquote accidents where you confuse the taser for the firearm is that the victims are black. So let's begin to analyze and take a look at that. And, and keep in mind, in, uh, in Minnesota, after the killing of uh, Fernando Castillo, there was significant monies into a fund, a training fund, to help police improve their response and to prevent these type of tragedies. Well, here we are some years later, and we're still facing the same challenges. So if this is not merely a training issue. All professionals need uh, additional training, continued training and education. That's understandable. But this is larger, deeper. The pathology of these issues is outside the realm of training and tactics. All right. Mark Claxton, it's always great to have your analysis. Thank you. Thank you. And the prosecution is expected to rest its case today in the trial of Derek Chauvin after emotional testimony yesterday from George Floyd's brother. When we come back, what to expect in court today as the defense starts calling its own witnesses. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. 
Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. The prosecution is preparing to rest its case in the trial of Derek Chauvin today. The prosecution's last witnesses come after more experts took the stand yesterday and after emotional testimony from George Floyd's brother. Alex Perez is at the courthouse in Minneapolis with more. This morning, after 11 days of testimony from 38 witnesses, the prosecution preparing to rest their case in Derek Chauvin's trial. The state will call Dr. Jonathan Rich. Cardiologist Dr. Jonathan Rich testifying that George Floyd's heart stopped due to lack of oxygen caused by being restrained face down on the ground with Chauvin's knee on his neck, not, as the defense argues, because of heart disease or the drugs found in his system. I can state with a high degree of medical certainty that George Floyd did not die from a primary cardiac event and he did not die from a drug overdose. The state's witnesses, including 10 medical experts and a dozen members of law enforcement, reinforcing the prosecution's argument on what caused Floyd's death and whether Chauvin's use of force was appropriate. Both the knee across Mr. Floyd's neck and the prone restraint were unreasonable, excessive, and contrary to generally accepted police practices. On the witness stand, of Floyd's younger brother, Felonis Floyd, emotionally recounting the, quote, one-of-a-kind relationship George had with their mother. That's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. The jury shown never-before-seen photos of Floyd as a young child in his mother's arms, as a teenager growing up in Houston, and as a community college athlete. His baby brother remembering him as a mama's boy. He was so much of a, a leader to us in the household. He would always make sure that we had our clothes for school. He made sure that we all were going to be uh, to school on time. He showed us like uh, how to treat our mom and how to respect our mom. He, he just, he loved her so dearly. And Alex Perez joins me live now from Minneapolis. Alex, yesterday the judge denied the defense's request to sequester the jury. Now, could that change of protests in the Minneapolis area grow in response to Dante Wright's shooting? Well, Diane, right now we don't expect that to change for the duration of the trial. Now, Eric Nelson has tried this, the defense attorney has tried this on more than one occasion to have the jury sequestered. He actually brought it up before jury selection. But the judge essentially is saying, you know what, this jury, we went through the process of selecting them. They've agreed to abide by jury instructions. There's no indication right now that they are not doing that. So he doesn't want to sequester them during testimony. Now, the judge did, however, tell jurors that they should pack a bag and be ready because they will be sequestered once deliberations begin and we expect that will be sometime next week diane closing arguments are set for monday diane right. alex perez in minneapolis thanks for that and let's bring in host and legal analyst from the law and crime network terry austin for more on this terry good morning really quickly on the jury sequestration question could eric nelson be gearing up to create a case for appeal already with that 
I think Nelson is definitely gearing up for appeal. He's been taking notes the whole time for any issue that could possibly grant his clients some relief. And the sequestration, you know, he has already said that he thought the jury should all along be kept separate from the public so they wouldn't be seeing what's going on in the news. And we know for a fact that the jurors have seen some things going on in the news because the judge has spoken to them. So I think that might be an issue that he could take up on appeal. Now, the prosecution is preparing to rest their case today. Overall, do you think they successfully made their case beyond a reasonable doubt? I do, because if you think about it, they have established that this use of force was unreasonable. We saw that the last witness, which was on, was Stoughton, and he was amazing. He was from an academic perspective, but he broke it down to the jury as though looking at use of force was a science, and technically it is. You are supposed to be assessing the circumstance, assessing the threat, making sure that the force you use is in response to the threat, and whether or not that was reasonable. And he gave his opinion that this was not reasonable force. And that's going to go to the manslaughter count. And I think the prosecution, if they've established nothing else, they've definitely established that this was not reasonable. And that would be that manslaughter count. And Terry, yesterday we heard some emotional testimony from George Floyd's brother. And the goal of that spark of life testimony is to humanize the victim. But the judge also warned that if those witnesses venture too far into testifying about George Floyd's character, that could open the door for the defense to be allowed to talk about his criminal history. Do you think there's a risk that Courtney Ross, George Floyd's girlfriend, or Felonis Floyd, that their testimony may have ventured into that territory? I thought they would kept it very tight. They did a great job of making sure they didn't go into his character in that regard. They just talked about the fact that he was a loving son and a loving father, and they kept it very, very tight so there wouldn't be any chance that it opened the door to getting into his character. So great job. I think they could have done a little bit more in terms of his giving back to the community or other things like that that occurred when George Floyd was an adult versus the childhood. But I think that they were being cautious not to make sure they opened that door. All right. Terry Austin, always great to have your analysis. Thank you. And we will see you a little bit later for our continuing coverage of the trial of Derek Chauvin. Thanks, Terry. And court is set to resume within the hour. We'll have more on who the defense might call and what that could mean for the case as they prepare to present their case when we come back. He will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning.
Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Welcome back. As the prosecution rests in the Derek Chauvin trial, the defense is expected to start calling its own witnesses and presenting its case to the jury. Alex Prache is in Minneapolis with more on what we can expect today. Hi, Alex. Hey, Diane, this Tuesday, the big thing we're expecting is for the prosecution, the state, to finish presenting its case in this Chauvin trial. At that point, the defense will start calling its witnesses, and they hope to call Maurice Hall, the man who was inside the car with George Floyd that Memorial Day. But Hall has indicated he intends to plead the Fifth Amendment. But one of the standout moments yesterday, George Floyd's younger brother, Philonis, giving a spark of life testimony. He broke into tears, testifying that Floyd was a leader amongst their siblings and often made those banana and mayo sandwiches. Prosecutors then used a use of force expert testifying he didn't view Floyd or the bystanders as a threat, calculating three and a half minutes into the restraint before they started criticizing officers' actions. There was also a critical testimony from a cardiologist, Dr. Jonathan Rich, who says he found no evidence that Floyd died from a heart attack or fentanyl or methamphetamine overdose. Now, looking ahead, there's a press conference scheduled today between the Floyd family and the family of Dante Wright. And finally, we got a new timeline from Judge Cahill in this trial. He expects the defense to finish presenting its evidence by the end of the week, possibly even before Friday to have Friday off. And that means that come Monday, there would be closing arguments. And at that point, the jury would be sequestered. Diane. All right, Alex Perche for us in Minneapolis. Thanks, Alex. And that does it for this ABC News Live update. I'm Diane Macedo. We'll have live coverage of the Derek Chauvin trial when testimony resumes in just a little while. We'll see you then. Stay safe. matters most the straightforward facts abc news is america's number one news number one in the morning number one in the evening with america's most watched newscast number one in late night versus the competition the number one news magazine on friday nights number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition the number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news abc news is america's number one news powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! 
Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. sounds in America. The protesters squaring off with police amid cries for justice after the shooting death of an unarmed black man at the hands of police. We gather on this ground from which Dante's blood cries out and we gather to say enough. 20-year-old Dante Wright killed Sunday afternoon in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, just outside Minneapolis. What was meant to be a traffic stop suddenly turning into tragedy. Police say an officer accidentally discharged her weapon while attempting to arrest him. It was a fun. This is an ABC News Live special report. The death of George Floyd, Derek Chauvin on trial. Good morning, everyone. I'm Diane Macedo. The prosecution has just rested in the trial against Derek Chauvin. Now the defense is about to start calling its own witnesses. Let's listen. You swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Have a seat. Uh, I have to delay just a little bit. Having trouble getting the computer to work and there's something I have to read the jury, but you can be seated. All right. Hold on. Let me try and... My apologies. We're seeing an immediate sidebar here with the counsel and the judges as the defense starts presenting its witnesses. As soon as court came in session, the prosecution stood up and said that the state rests, which means the prosecution is now done presenting its case and calling its witnesses. Now it's on the defense to start calling their own witnesses and present their case for reasonable doubt on whether or not Derek Chauvin should be charged in the murder of George Floyd, or rather convicted in the murder of George Floyd. Hold on. And here's Judge Cahill. Let's listen. maybe having some technical difficulties there that he's trying to sort out. Now, the defense has called their first witness. That witness is on the stand. He has not taken the oath yet or introduced himself, so we still don't have a, a lot of information on who exactly is on the stand, who the defense's first witness is. But as you can see, Judge Cahill looks like he's trying to get one of his screens up and running. Now, earlier this morning, they also had a right, hearing in the absence of first, the jury. Uh, middle and last name and spell each of your names. And let's listen. My name is Scott Robbie Creighton. I, Team. I can't hear it. Can you? This evidence is being admitted solely for the limited purpose of showing what effects the ingestion of opioids may or may not have had on the physical well-being of George Floyd. This evidence is not to be used as evidence of the character of George Floyd. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. 
Mr. Creighton, by whom are you currently employed? Uh, Your Honor, is there any way that we can, um, I could hear it a little louder, could it be a little louder? I'm having a difficult head. Sorry about that, sir. No problem, sir. I just want to make sure I hear all the questions. Is that better? Yes, it is. Okay. By whom are you currently employed? Uh, right now, I'm uh, currently retired. I'm okay. not employed by anybody. Prior to your retirement, whom, by whom were you employed? Uh, the City of Minneapolis Police Department. And how long did you work for the City of Minneapolis Police Department? 28 years. Can you describe for the jury generally the various roles that you had for the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes, I will. Um, I started in 1993. Uh, I started on the street working as a 911 responder. Um, I did six years as a 911 responder, and then I transferred over to public housing for approximately nine months as a uh, public housing uh, officer. And then from there, I went to the 4th Precinct and became a community response team member. Um, involved as a street level narcotics investigator. Uh, I did that for 22 years. All right, now were you on duty on uh, May 6th of 2019? Yes, I was. If you had an opportunity um, to review various police reports and uh, body worn cameras from an incident on that date? Yes, I have. On that date at approximately four or f be just before five o'clock p.m., did you execute a traffic stop of a red uh, Ford Explorer? Yes, I did. And did you approach the passenger side? Yes, I did. Can you describe uh, just very briefly uh, the initial interaction that you had with the passenger of that vehicle? Um. I approached the vehicle uh, on the passenger side. Uh, the passenger window was down. Um, I started giving the, the individual uh, that was on, that was in the passenger seat commands several times. Um, uh, the passenger was um, unresponsive and non-compliant to my commands. Um, I then had to. Um, physically reach in uh, to, because I wanted to see his hands, because I couldn't see his hands. I reached in finally and grabbed his hand to put it up on the dash, and then that individual was uh, taken from the vehicle and handcuffed. Okay. Um, did you make any observations as to uh, the passenger's behavior? Could you repeat that question, sir? I'm sorry. Did you make any additional observations as to the passenger's behavior? Yeah. As, uh, in my mind, his, his behavior was uh, very nervous, anxious. Um, I will withdraw that question. In terms of, did you see the passenger uh, do anything physically with his hands? Yes, he turned away from me towards the driver's seat as continually uh, as I was giving him commands to see his hands. Did you draw your service weapon? Yes, I did. Did you um, observe the passenger put anything in his mouth? Uh, can you say that one more time, sir? I'm sorry. Did you observe the passenger put anything in his mouth? No, I didn't. Did you, uh, were you wearing a body-worn camera issued by the city of Minneapolis on that day? Yes, I was. And have you had an opportunity to review your body-worn camera prior to today's testimony? Yes, I have. Your Honor, um, based upon the order, I would move to uh, admit and publish Exhibit 1051. All right. Uh, 1051 is received subject to the motion of limine. If we may publish. Mm -hmm. Can you undo your uh, seatbelt, sir? Sir, passenger, can you undo your seatbelt? Go ahead, go ahead and undo your seatbelt. I, I, don't, I don't plan on shooting you. I'm just saying, just take, it, take your time. Okay, relax. Just undo your seatbelt. Let her take care of her guy. Just keep your hands out where I can see him. Hey! Let me... 
Keep your hands where I can fucking see them. Okay? Put them up on the dash. Put them on the dash. I'm not going to shoot you. Put your hands on the dash. Put your hands on the dash. The last time I'm going to tell you that. It's simple. I got you. He keeps moving his hands around. He, he, he won't listen to what I have to say. Okay. Put them on, on your head. Okay, okay, man. Open your mouth. Okay, Spit out what you got. Spit out what you got. I'm going to tase you. Spit it out. Come out. Oh, don't jerk away from me. Put your hands behind your head. That was one yellow pill, boss. Okay, now slowly come on out. Hand under. Put your hand on your head. Hand underneath. Okay, relax then. You're not going to get beat up or nothing if you just follow what we're asking you to do. Sounds like the prosecution requested a sidebar there as the defense is questioning their first witness. He's a former Minneapolis police officer involved in George Floyd's May 2019 arrest. The defense just finished showing some body cam video of that arrest. And before testimony even began, the judge called a sidebar and then instructed the jury that they are not to take any evidence from this line of testimony uh, as evidence to George Floyd's character, but rather what they can do is look at it as evidence of the potential of how drugs may have affected or not affected affected George Floyd's well-being. So we're going to hear more about this arrest. We did hear in the body cam footage the officers asking Floyd to spit something out of his mouth. Uh, and so the defense just finished playing that body cam footage. They're getting ready to continue to question this uh, retired MPD officer. And we're going to hear where this line of questioning goes. Let's listen. Did you subsequently identify the uh, driver of the, or excuse me, the passenger? Yes, I did. And who is that? Mr. Floyd. Um, Your Honor, based on the court's ruling, I have no further questions for this witness. Cross-examination. Good morning, Officer Creighton. Good morning. You testified that you were the officer who approached the passenger side of the vehicle. You approached George Floyd on May 6th of 2019, is that right? That's correct, yes. And you had your gun drawn when you approached Mr. Floyd, isn't that right? Yes, I pulled it, yes. And when you approached Mr. Floyd, he said, don't shoot me, man, I don't want to get shot, right? Something like that, yes. You told him to undo his seatbelt, correct? That's correct, yes, ma'am. And he did that, right? Yes, he did. And then you said, put your hands where I can see them, correct? Yes. And then he put his hands in the air? Yes. And then you told him to put his hands on the dash, is that right? That's correct. And that was when you grabbed his hand and forcibly put it on the dashboard of the vehicle, correct? Well, and yes. And then the other officer with you on the other side of the vehicle changed that to put your hands on your head, correct? That's correct. And then he put his hands on his head, right? That's correct, yes. And there was one officer who said that they were going to tase him, right? That's what I heard, yes. And you were yelling pretty loud, correct? Yes, I was, yes. It, it escalated real quick. Some profanity as well, correct? Yes. And you had your gun drawn the whole time you were giving commands, right? Once I started ordering him and he refused to show me his hands, yes, I eventually it escalated where I pulled my gun, yes, ma'am. And he was awake, correct? What's that, ma'am? Mr. Floyd was awake. Was he awake during this incident? Yes. He was conscious? Yes. He didn't appear to be in medical distress to you when you were pulling him out of the car, is that right? He was talking to you, he was standing up, is that right? Um, I don't know if it was specifically, sometimes he was talking, sometimes he was mumbling. 
Uh, he was incoherent in my mind a lot of the time during there. But you got him out of the car and you handcuffed him, right? That's correct, ma'am. And he stood next to the car, right? Yes, ma'am. He asked you not to beat him up, correct? That's correct, yes. He was able to walk, right? Yes, he was. He continued to talk to you? Yes. And former Minneapolis police officer, retired Minneapolis police officer Scott Crichton is on the stand right now testifying about a May 2019 arrest uh, of George Floyd. We saw some body cam video when he was being questioned by the defense. He is the defense's witness. Uh, they showed some body cam video of that incident and asked uh, Mr. Creighton, Officer Creighton, to identify uh, George Floyd as the person, the passenger in the vehicle seen on that body cam video. Now he's being questioned by the prosecution, and they seem to be trying to establish George Floyd's condition on that day in May of 2019, that he was talking, that he was more or less obeying commands, that he seemed coherent. You heard Officer Creighton saying he seemed incoherent to him, uh, but now answering a series of questions about the fact that Floyd was able to talk, he was able to stand, uh, et cetera. The uh, judge called a sidebar, though, so we're seeing, going to hear what exactly they're discussing. There seems to be a lot around this testimony because there's only so much the defense is allowed to bring in about George Floyd's past. And this particular case is allowed to come in only along the grounds of what it can establish about the possible effect that drugs may have had on George Floyd's well-being both back in May of 2019 and what that could mean for the possibility of how drugs affected his well-being on the day he died in May of 2020. So both the prosecution and the defense have to tread carefully in how they question this witness. And it looks like they're back from that sidebar. Let's listen. Ms. Aldridge, if you would. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer Green, you were describing that you got Mr. Floyd out of the car, correct? Yes. And he stood next to the car and you handcuffed him, correct? Uh, me and another officer had to physically handcuff him, yes. And he didn't fall down, correct? No, he didn't fall down. Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? Very officer Crane, uh, there was another officer on the driver's side dealing with the driver? Yes, that's correct, actually, too. And that officer was speaking to uh, or giving commands to the driver? That's correct. Simultaneous to the time that you were giving commands to Mr. Floyd? That's correct. Did you hear the officer say, spit it out? I may have, yes. I don't, I, you'd have to see the video, and if that's what the video shows, then that's what occurred. Okay. I have no further questions. Okay. Anything further? Officer Creighton, you were just asked some questions about what the other officers were doing. You were interacting with Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes. And while you were interacting with Mr. Floyd, he didn't collapse on the ground, correct? Wait a minute. What was the question? Can you speak up a little louder, ma'am? While you were interacting with Mr. Floyd, he didn't collapse on the ground, correct? No, he did not. Well, the answer is stricken. The objection is sustained. Yes. You were asking questions about what the other officers were doing, correct? That's correct. Your attention was focused on Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes, it was. And Mr. Floyd didn't drop dead while you were interacting with him, correct? No. Thank you. Nothing further. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Some very quick testimony there from former Minneapolis police officer Scott Crichton uh, describing you, a May 2019 time, arrest. The defense calls Michelle Mosing. Crichton was testifying to a May 2019 arrest of George Floyd. The defense showed some body cam video in that arrest and trying to establish the possibility of how drugs may have affected George Floyd's well-being both on that day and perhaps what that means for how drugs may have affected George Floyd's well-being in May of 2020. Uh, a lot of objections and sidebars during that very short and quick questioning and now the defense is calling their second witness. We're going to wait to see what that testimony 
We'll focus on that witness is now being sworn in. Testimony about the guilt be the truth and nothing but the truth. Have a seat. And before you begin, uh, if you could state your full name, spell each of your names, and then hold off, Mr. Nelson. Just give your full name and spell each name. Uh, first name is Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Last name is Mosing, M-O-S-E-N-G. And if you're comfortable taking off the mask, I pretty much leave it up to you, but if that would make it easier to hear you, that would be appreciated. <laughs> uh, members of the jury, this again uh, is regarding an incident or an occurrence involving George Floyd on May 6, 2019. As I told you before, this evidence is being admitted solely for the limited purpose of showing what effects the ingestion of opioids may or may not have had on the physical well-being of George Floyd. This evidence is not to be used as evidence of the character of George Floyd. Mr. Nelson, you may inquire. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Um, by whom are you currently employed? I am retired. Okay, prior to your retirement, uh, where were you employed? I was a paramedic at Hennepin County Medical Center, EMS. How long were you a paramedic for Hennepin County? Just under 34 years. Okay, and um, can you describe the education that you have uh, to become a paramedic? Uh, my, I have a two-year degree in emergency medical care and rescue from Mankato State, um, and then actually got an additional registered nursing. I uh, graduated from St. Mary's University in 91. Okay, and um, so you worked as a paramedic for Hennepin County for the entirety of your career, or did you have other employment? I actually worked for a year in Dakota County um, for one year, and then I uh, have worked at Hennepin, or had worked at Hennepin ever since. Fair to say you've gone to a large number of calls during the course of your career. Yes. All right. And you may not remember every specific detail about every call, correct? No. And uh, it, as a paramedic, do you maintain records about each call that you uh, go to in order to assess the patient's care? Yes, we do a run sheet or a patient, patient medical record that we hand off okay. at the emergency room. Now, if you could just speak up just a little bit. Sorry. That's right. Uh, prior to, um, to your testimony today, have you had an opportunity to review a run sheet uh, from May 6th of 2019 involving George Perry Floyd. Yes. Um, do you recall all of those details off the top of your head now? No. All right. Now, in terms of um, your recollection of May 6th of 2019, were you uh, summoned to the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes, Precinct 4. To care for, to uh, attend to Mr. Floyd? Yes. Um, upon arriving at the 4th Precinct, did you uh, talk to Mr. Floyd? Yes. Did you learn information from Mr. Floyd about um, what he had consumed and the time frame he had consumed it in? Yeah, it was uh, quite hard to assess him. Um, he was upset and... Um, Confused, some of the things he said were. Uh, I'm going to start into his next slide. So if you could perhaps please. Certainly. Did Mr. Floyd? Were you able to learn that Mr. Floyd had consumed some narcotics that day? Yes. What did he tell you specifically about what narcotics he had taken and when he had taken them? He he told me that he had been taking multiple, like every 20 minutes, um, and it was a, uh, I don't remember if it was Oxy or Percocet, but it was a um, opioid-based. It wasn't real consistent with his behavior. At that point, it was real elevated and agitated. No, I'm, I'm going to... The last statement about agitation is stricken is not responsive. You can just wait for the next question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but he informed you he had taken some, some sort of an opioid uh, 
every 20 minutes or something like that, correct? And then another one as the officer came up. Okay, so he told you that he had taken a pill um, at the time the officers were apprehending him. Correct. Did you do a physical assessment of Mr. Floyd at that time? Yes. Specifically, did you take his blood pressure? Yes, I took a set of vitals. Um, would you agree that uh, your first vitals were taken at approximately 134 and 59 seconds? Without looking at the run sheet, I wouldn't know for sure. It, would it refresh your recollection to review the run sheet? Yes. May I approach the witness room? Mm -hmm. was the first recorded vital signs. That refreshes your recollection? Yes. Did you need it back? Uh, I'd like to testify for memory. If you need to refresh your memory with that, just let us know and we'll allow you to refresh your memory. But otherwise, testify your memory as best we can. Okay. Thank you. At approximately 13.34, that's 1.34 p.m., agreed? You took his vitals, correct? Correct. And that would include his bl blood pressure at the time? Yes. And did you record what his blood pressure was at that time? Yes, it was 216 over 160. Did you ultimately make recommendations uh, to transport Mr. Floyd to the hospital? Based on that and other issues. Okay. Um, and ultimately, did he was he brought to the hospital? Eventually. All right. I believe that's uh, all I have, Your Honor. Is all good. Good morning, Ms. Mozang. Good morning. You provided treatment to George Floyd on May 6, 2019, correct? Correct. Is that yes. And you were concerned about his blood pressure at that time, correct? That was one of the things. And in, in the course of your treatment of him, he explained that his high blood pressure wasn't something new, right? Yeah, initially, he denied medical issues, but then when I discovered his blood pressure, I specifically asked again. And he said, yes, he had history of hypertension and had not been taking his medication. And he said he hadn't been taking his blood pressure medication for months, correct? Correct. And he told you that he swallowed some pills, right? Yes. Uh, approximately seven Percocet, correct? Mm. I documented, yeah, seven to nine every 20 minutes or so for a while. And Percocet is a brand name, right? Yes. Is that oxycodone and, and acetaminophen? Yes. And it's used to treat pain, correct? Correct. You testified that it's an opioid, yes? Correct. So he told you that he had been taking those pills uh, throughout the day, right? Yes, and he, I asked him why. He said it's because he was addicted. He told you he was addicted and he responded to your questions about taking the pills, correct? Correct. And he was able to walk, correct? Yes. He was able to stand up. Correct. And you wanted him to go to the hospital, uh, right? Correct. And he didn't feel like he wanted to go to the hospital, correct? Was, he was resistant to going to the hospital, right? I know he was real resistant to get on our bed. He was resistant. He was... It was hard to tell exactly what he was upset about. I'm going to object at this point. I'm here. sorry. Um, just with respect to going to the hospital, Your Honor. Yes. I'm going to limit your question to the question I asked to that. He didn't want to go to the hospital, right? I'll say yes. It took some time to convince him to go to the hospital, yes. correct? And you indicated that uh, he told you he had been addicted to opioids, correct? Correct. And he'd been addicted to opioids at that point for a year and a half, right? I am not aware of that. But he didn't feel like he needed to go to the hospital. 
he didn't want to go with us at that point. And you were referred to your run report, right? The, the record that you keep in terms of the treatment of patients. You, you see that up there, correct? Yes. Um, and according to your run report, you documented that Mr. Floyd was alert, correct? Yes. And that he obeyed commands, correct? Eventually. That's what's in your report, <laughs> right? Correct? Correct. And that he had an appropriate response to stimulation? Correct. Yes? Correct. Um, he wasn't nauseous or vomiting when you were treating him, right? No. His respiratory rate was normal? Yes? Um, it was elevated at times. You wrote know. respiratory effort normal in your report, correct? At the beginning, yes. His effort was normal. It was increased at times. And throughout your documentation, you wrote respiratory effort normal, correct? Correct. At, at 1334, at, 14, at 1409, at 1426, all those notes, you indicated that his respiratory effort was normal, correct? Correct. He was not in respiratory distress, correct? No. His blood oxygen level was normal, right? Correct. His pulse was normal, correct? Um, yes. His heart rhythm was regular or normal, right? Correct. His EKG was normal. Correct. He had a normal rhythm, the sinus rhythm, which is the rhythm of a normal healthy heart, correct? Correct. And you indicated that you had been um, worried about high blood pressure for the possibility of a stroke, right? Among other things, yes. But he didn't have a stroke, right? He didn't have any indications that we were picking up at that time. He didn't have a stroke while you were with him? No. He was never given Narcan, correct? Correct. He didn't stop breathing? No. His heart didn't stop? No. He didn't go into cardiac arrest? No. He didn't go into a coma? No. And you took him to the hospital, correct? Correct. And he was monitored for two hours and released right after, right? I don't know. <laughs> Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Sure. Just heard the testimony of former paramedic Michelle Mosang, who was called to the scene when George Floyd was arrested in May of 2019. Uh, she testified that when she got to the scene, she spoke to George Floyd. He admitted to her that he had taken seven to nine Percocets every 20 minutes or so, including taking one as the officers arrived. She said she was concerned because he had high blood pressure when she took his blood pressure. Uh, but on cross-examination, the prosecution established through Mosang that George Floyd had a history of high blood pressure, even absent uh, the drugs, and that he had told her that he hadn't taken his blood pressure medication in months. She said based on his blood pressure and some other factors uh, that she recommended that he go to the hospital. He did eventually go to the hospital. Five minute break, which means it'll probably be 10. But uh, let's go with five minutes for now. Thank you. And there you go. The court's taking a quick five minute break. Uh, but there, toward the end of the questioning, the prosecution, uh, through a series of questions, tried to establish through Michelle Mosang there that George Floyd, despite these concerns over his blood pressure and, and whether or not that was affected by the drugs that he ingested that day in May of 2019, that he was still functioning, was not in clear medical distress, and of course, survived. That incident. I want to bring in uh, legal analyst Terry Austin for a little bit more on this. Terry, we've now heard very quick testimony from two defense witnesses. One, the officer who was involved in this May 2019 arrest of George Floyd and, and how he approached the car and what he saw. We saw body cam footage from that arrest and then from the paramedic who was called to the scene. Now, it's clear that the judge is trying to keep the questioning about this incident very limited. Uh, walk us through what what the thinking is there and why the judge is specifically trying to limit any testimony that speaks to George Floyd's demeanor, emotional demeanor on that day, as opposed to his physical state on that day. 
So if you recall, Diane, there were motions in limine about this particular video, the May 6, 2019 video. And at that time, the judge ruled that only information regarding George Floyd's medical condition and his, you know, behavior at the time, what the individuals saw of Mr. Floyd, and not his character. So he is instructing each of these witnesses to only talk about the fact that they saw George Floyd acting a certain way, what was the effect of the medication. And he's telling the jury, frankly, that that's all you need to consider. And he's warning the attorneys to make sure that your questions are only talking about that. And frankly, Diane, I think that these witnesses, although Eric Nelson is calling them on behalf of the defense, I think that this cuts both ways. That May 2019 video definitely shows that George Floyd took some medication, and we know that already. But it also shows, and this helps the prosecution, and I think the attorney, Eldridge, did a great job at showing, okay, yes, he took these drugs, but he didn't die. He did not have a heart attack. He did not have a stroke. And so I think that this cuts both ways. And had I been the defense there, I would not have called these witnesses. Yeah, Terry, I wonder, uh, along those lines, you're saying that you're not sure these witnesses worked as favorably for the defense as maybe they hoped. Also, when we look at the body cam footage and we see how this whole incident ended, we know that ultimately the police called the paramedics and decided that George Floyd should go to the hospital, not to jail, and that he wasn't put in the prone position, and w what happened to him in May of 2020 is not what happened to him in May of 2019. So how does the prosecution, you know, can they take these defense witnesses and turn them into something that they can use for their own case? That's exactly right, and they will. They are going to say that the officers in May of 2019 used reasonable force, whereas Derek Chauvin did not. And the 2019 incident did not end up with Mr. Floyd dying. And in fact, if Derek Chauvin had done what these officers did, they made sure that a paramedic came to the scene. They made sure he got to the hospital. They monitored him, and then they released him. We could have had that exact same result in 2020, but the prosecution will most definitely argue, because of the unreasonable force that Derek Chauvin used, now we have an individual who could have been saved, given life-saving, you know, techniques, and in fact, that wasn't done, and that's why it resulted in his death. Now, if you're the defense, obviously, they had to keep the scope of questions here very limited. And there were a lot of stops and starts during these witnesses being questioned, particularly uh, the former Minneapolis police officer involved in this case, Scott Crichton. Uh, so the defense had to tread very carefully with their questioning here. But if you're the defense, based on what these witnesses did say on the stand, how are you turning that to raise reasonable doubt when you give your closing statement, closing arguments? So the reason Nelson called these individuals was all because of the cause of death. He basically wanted to show that all of this opioid was ingested and that this is the reason why George Floyd died. It had nothing to do with the fact that there was unreasonable. Nelson is going to try to argue that Floyd has this habit of ingesting these opioids and that he, you know, overdosed. And in the case in 2020, when he passed away, obviously, Nelson is going to argue that he just took too much. And this is what he does when he's stopped by the police. And the first time he didn't die, but the second time he did. And I think Nelson is going to try to argue that this is what ultimately might happen if, in fact, you are a drug user and you overdose by accident. I don't think it's a good argument. I think that it is going to backfire. But this is the reason he's calling these witnesses for the cause of death and the fact that Mr. Floyd used drugs. And I want to go to Alex Perche, who's outside the courthouse for us, because, Alex, it seems like the other thing the defense is trying to do here is establish that, in this case, it's at least alleged that George Floyd ingested drugs just as officers approached the car that he was in. And we have already heard them say in their opening arguments that people in the car with George Floyd in May of 2020 say the same thing happened there.
Yeah, I mean, you, you could hear defense attorney Eric Nelson try to make that point, especially with that stop from May of 2019, right, that this is George Floyd's M.O. when confronted by cops that he ingests pills. But, but also, you heard in that cross-examination uh, by Prosecutor Eldridge that, you know, Floyd was concerned about his interactions with police and that ultimately he still complied with their orders. And Terry, I wonder how effective uh, her line of questioning was uh, with the former officer, with Scott Crichton, when she's asking him, he put his hands in the air, he put his hands on his head, he was saying, please don't shoot me, which I think we all hear and think is a pretty logical response to someone pointing a gun at you. And she seemed to be trying to establish, despite the fact that Crichton said, in his opinion, George Floyd was incoherent, that the answers he was giving were pretty logical, that he was speaking clearly. We can hear him on the video. He's able to stand. He didn't get dizzy. He didn't fall. And according to her questioning, he didn't drop dead. She literally had Crichton confirm that. Um, so how effective is this line of questioning by the defense to just simply try to establish that he ingested drugs on that day? If the prosecution is going to come back and say, but look, he seemed pretty fine. That's exactly right. And I think she had a huge impact, the prosecution did, when she said, and he didn't drop dead. I actually thought we might get an objection there because it was just so emphatic, but there was no objection. And I don't think that Eric Nelson is going to be able to refute those issues because the fact that he had opioids in his system didn't necessarily kill him. And the fact that he had opioids in his system back in 2019 didn't mean he couldn't be coherent. And he answered questions. He responded to commands. And I think the prosecution is trying to show and demonstrate the same thing happened here, but we have a different result. And again, that's why I think it's going to cut both ways. And in fact, I think it will bolster the prosecution's argument because the jury is looking at this and they're saying to themselves, wait a minute. So this is what Mr. Floyd does when he's stopped by a police officer. He ingests additional drugs. He had drugs in his system, but he didn't die then. And he died this time. That just means that the response was different. It wasn't reasonable now. It was reasonable then. And this death could could have been avoided. So I think it is going to hurt the defense, and I would not have used them. We already know there were drugs in the system. It just wasn't worth the risk. I wonder, it seems like the one place where the defense made some very clear-cut headway was in asking about the testimony of George Floyd's blood pressure on that day in May of 2019, when he's asking the paramedic, did you take his blood pressure at the time? She says yes. I think she said it was 216 over 160. I'm not a medical doctor. I know you're not either. But that sounds high for my references on what I know is considered relatively normal in terms of blood pressure. So I imagine we may hear more about that from medical experts on the defense down the line. But, but what does that do for Eric Nelson's case if he can establish that George Floyd's blood pressure was so high on that day in May of 2019 and clearly was in enough danger, enough concern by the paramedics' uh, evaluation that she said he needs to go to the hospital? I think he did make a point there. You're right, Diane. He established the fact that Mr. Floyd was in some medical distress and his blood pressure was very high, and that sounded very high to me as well. But again, I think it's going to hurt him because the response to that was the fact that they sent him to the hospital. They took care of him. This individual was in their custody and they had the duty to take care of him. And yes, the fact that he had high blood pressure is showing that he was in medical distress, and that's exactly what the defense wants to do. They're trying to say that these drugs and his heart caused his death, and it wasn't anything that Derek Chauvin did. But the jury is going to be able to understand, okay, he had a heart condition, and yes, he was on drugs, but he did not have to die that day. 
And Terry, the one part where I couldn't quite follow where the prosecutor was going with her questioning was when she started to ask about how resistant George Floyd was that day to go to the hospital, how he didn't want to get on the uh, on the gurney, how he didn't want to go to the hospital, how it took them a while to convince them, convince him rather, to go to the hospital on that day. Why would the prosecution want to establish that? Here's why. He was, quote unquote, resisting, whether that's passive resistance or active resistance or aggressive resistance, he was resisting. And the difference here is when he resisted in May 6th of 2019, they dealt with it. They handled it. They de-escalated. They took him to the hospital. They took care of him. They saved his life. And now, in 2020, the difference between what happened in 19 and 20 is the fact that there was no duty of care and the fact that they did not save him. They could have done CPR. They could have responded to the fact that he had no pulse. So I think the prosecution right then and there was trying to establish the fact that he's owed a duty of care. He was resisting. But even though he was resisting, back in 2019, they were able to de-escalate. They were able to get him to respond to their commands and actually go to the hospital. And that's why, in fact, his life was saved. And it seems like the prosecution, in addition to establishing, you know, watch the video. I imagine the message to the jury is watch the video, decide for yourself. You see that he's talking, he's speaking clearly, he can stand up, he didn't fall down. Also, and, and once the paramedic is on the stand, then asking Michelle Mo saying his blood pressure, uh, not his blood pressure was normal, but his respiratory effort was normal, his pulse was normal, his blood oxygen level was normal. And you hear her over and over saying yes, 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 yes. So what does that do for their case that this was not Drugs didn't kill him then, and drugs didn't kill him in May of 2020 either. That's exactly right, Diane. I think Eldridge did an excellent job of establishing the fact that all of these conditions existed, but it didn't kill him. His blood pressure was high. We, you know, saw that he was standing up. He didn't fall down. So she's trying to say it, it doesn't matter if he had a bad heart. It doesn't matter if he took these drugs. He was still able to walk and talk and respond to all of the commands, and he was able to survive that day without someone's knee on your neck. He wasn't put in the prone position. She mentioned that as well. And I think she's establishing the difference between the response of the police officers back in 2019 versus the response of Chauvin and the other police officers in 2020. And she established that extremely well, even though the cross and the recross were, or the, the cross, the recross, the direct and the redirect, they were all very short. I was kind of surprised that they were all that short. But the reason is because the judge limited the testimony. So we saw them get up and get down in, what, five, 10 minutes. Yeah, it was it was a quick one for sure. And the last thing that Michelle Mosang said on the stand uh, after explaining that he didn't have a stroke, he didn't have a coma, they didn't give him Narcan, so clearly they weren't uh, extremely concerned about any anything extremely life-threatening there on the scene in terms of the drugs. She said that ultimately George Floyd was monitored for two hours and then released right after that. Exactly. And again, going to the hospital saved his life. I mean, I keep saying saved his life. His life really wasn't in any sort of threat at that point in time. And I think that's what the prosecution was trying to establish, that he had these symptoms, he had these pills and drugs in his system, but he didn't die. And part of the reason he didn't die was because they called paramedics, they came, the paramedics took care of him. We saw the witness talk about the fact she took all of his vitals. None of that happened with George Floyd in May of 2020. And in 2019, they took him to the hospital. And it turns out he didn't have to stay overnight. He didn't have to get a surgery. He didn't have to have anything done. And I think she's trying to establish there his system is accustomed to this. He's been taking opioids. She actually asked the witness, did you know how long he's been addicted? She said she didn't know exactly how long. But the prosecution is definitely establishing this is what happens. It's every day. He takes these opioids. She's not making light of it, but she is saying that his system is accustomed to it. He didn't even need to stay overnight. And he checked in. He checked out. And he's 
alive up until, you know, obviously in May of 2020. Right. So the prosecution, they're trying to show that George Floyd survived that incident without any big interventions from the hospital. They just monitored him and let him go. And so the drugs didn't kill him then. They didn't kill him in May of 2020 either. That's what the prosecution will be trying to establish through these witnesses. The defense will be going in a different direction, as we explained. But there is something else that happened in the trial today, too, and that was before the jury was brought into the courtroom. We heard a hearing this morning about body cam footage, and I want to go to Alex Perche again, who's live outside the courthouse for us, for a little more on what that discussion centered on. Alex? Diane, so, I mean, there, there there was some contention about what was shown in police body camera video. And at, at one point, uh, the, the, the prosecution objected to uh, video shown after a certain point because that body camera actually showed an officer in his squad car, and there were details uh, about George Floyd uh, in front of that camera that would be uh, projected for the jury to see, and they, they didn't they didn't want that. And so there was an agreement, there was an agreement to, uh, to, to, to stop the body camera footage before that. But again, this is about showing that George Floyd is not on trial here. It is a trial of Derek Chauvin. All right. Now it sounds like trial is back in session. Let's listen. Come on up. You can just have a seat for now. Uh, if you testify, I'll place you under oath, but otherwise, uh, we're just going to have a discussion a little bit here, So, uh, but we do need to hear you so that the court reporter can take everything down. So, uh, you have been subpoenaed by the defense. I can't uh, even really hear you. I can do that. You've been subpoenaed by the defense uh, to answer certain questions about uh, being with George Floyd on May 25th, 2020. Uh, what you observed about his physical condition at various points in Cup Foods, and basically a time frame on when you were with him that day and what you observed about him. Uh, specifically, I think focusing mostly on the time in Cup Foods, but then also in the motor vehicle before the police came to the window. Yep. Okay? Uh, and it's my, and you're uh, willing to answer those questions yes. about George yes. Floyd? Okay. Um, this, the parties also have the right to ask you in order to test whether your perceptions are accurate on mm -hmm. uh, whether you were under the influence of drugs or alcohol that day. Are you willing to answer that question? Yes. Okay. Am I or him? Are you willing to answer the question well, whether you were under the influence yes. of drugs or alcohol? Yes, I was not. <laughs> okay. We're not going to be eliciting an opinion from you whether George Floyd was under the influence, just for how he looked. Okay. Uh, and, you know, how he acted. Yep. But not an opinion about whether he was under the influence. Okay. But the lawyers, in order to make sure that the jury knows whether to consider your evidence and how much weight to give it, is whether you were sober or under the influence. Are, are you willing to answer? that question yes okay now you understand I don't find that those questions would uh, expose you to criminal liability but you do have a Fifth Amendment right mm -hmm. uh, not to incriminate yourself um, do you need time to talk to a lawyer or? No. and I have limited the lawyers to those topics mm -hmm. so as not to get anything that might tend to incriminate you that you're not expecting okay yep do you have any questions no. do you need time to talk to a lawyer Sir. Okay, ready to go then? Yes. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to bring the jury back in, and then I'm going to have you stand up so I can swear you in, and then we'll go from there. Do you have any questions? No. Okay, great. Let's bring in the jury. And you can just remain seated when the jury comes. And the judge has now called the jury to enter the courtroom as the defense calls their third witness to the stand. This is a bystander who was there in Cup Foods the day that George Floyd was in the store. And this witness is expected to testify as to how George Floyd looked and seemed that day. Uh, the judge has made very clear that they will not be asked uh, any questions about 
whether or not they believe George Floyd was under the influence of drugs, but just simply what his demeanor seemed like uh, on that day for the sake of the jury hearing what happened before uh, officers came to the scene and before that police encounter with George Floyd. Now we're waiting to see who the next witness is going to be. Again, the jury's coming back in the room. This after we already heard testimony from a former Minneapolis police officer involved in a May 2019 arrest of George Floyd. Floyd was the passenger of a car at that time, and the officer described what it was like as he approached the car. We saw body cam video uh, from that uh, incident and then heard a paramedic who was called to the scene and ultimately advised that George Floyd go to the hospital on that day. And now defense attorney Eric Nelson is about to question the defense's third witness in this case. Let's you listen. Your you can raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right. Have a seat, please. And before we begin, uh, we're going to have you state your full name, spelling each of your names. Shawanda, S-H-A-W-A-N-D-A, Renee. R E N E E H Hill H I L L. Mr. Nelson? Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Hill. Hi. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I just have a few questions about May 25th of 2020. Do you recall that date? Yes. On that date, were you at the Cup Foods located in Minneapolis? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Did you run into anybody that you knew while you were there? Yes, George Floyd. And uh, while you were at the Cup Foods or in the Cup Foods, did you have an opportunity to observe Mr. Floyd's behavior, demeanor, things of that nature? Yes. How would you describe Mr. Floyd's behavior while inside of the Cup Foods? Happy, normal, talking, alert. Okay. Did uh, you? Uh, did he offer to give you a ride? Yes. A ride to wherever it was My you were going. Okay. And um, so did you go to his car with him? Yes. Once you got into the car, did you observe any changes to his demeanor? When we were in the car for the first, like, eight minutes, we were talking and, you know what I'm saying, hugging, you know what I'm saying, talking about what we were about to do. And then I got a phone call. And so I was on the phone for the rest of the time until the little boys came to the truck, to the car. He fell asleep at that time. So at some point during the course of the time that you were in the car with Mr. Floyd, Mr. Ho Floyd suddenly fell asleep. Yes. Right? And the phone call you received, was that from your daughter? Yes. And so you were talking with your daughter during that time? Yes. Yes. Um, and you described, uh, would you agree that at, at some point, uh, some you said some little boys, are those employees of the yes. store? <laughs> yes. That's okay. Um, the store employees came and approached the car, correct? Yes. And at that point, Mr. Floyd suddenly fell asleep? He was already asleep. He was already sleeping? Yes, when they came to the car. And when they came there, I tried to wake them up. They tried to wake them up. I tried to wake them up over and over. And his friend tried to wake him up, and he kept. He woke up. Then he'll say something. Uh, he made a little gesture, you know, and nodded back off. Okay. Was he that, did that a couple times? Was that kind of a sudden change from how you observed him in the store to the car? Yes, but he already told me in the store he was tired because he had been working. I'm object. There is an objection. Objection, Grounds? Meeting. Yes. The answer is stricken. Overruled. Um, and so, at some point, did the uh, store clerks leave the side of the car? Yes, I told them that I would wake them up and send them in there because I didn't have the money on me. I used my money. So. Okay. And did you continue to try to rouse yes. Mr. Mr. Floyd? Wait, wait until it finishes the question so that we don't overlap. Okay? Because the court report is taking everything down. It's really hard to feel over. Oh, okay. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so did you continue to try to uh, awaken Mr. Floyd? Yes, I tried a couple times, but then, you know, I just let it go for a minute because I was back on the phone. And all right, and, the rest of and did the store clerks come back to the car a second time? No. And um, were you, uh, at some point, the police officers approached the car? Yes. And um, Mr. Floyd uh, was aroused by the police? Yes. I have no further questions here. Mr. Ray. Good morning, 
Miss Hill, I just have a couple of follow-up questions for you, okay? Yes. Um, so during the period that you were with Mr. Floyd in the store, uh, he was, uh, you said he was alert? Yes. Friendly? Yes. Talkative? Yeah, talking, yes. And, that. Okay. Yeah. and when you went uh, out to the store, he walked by himself out to the store? Yes. In fact, did a little dance as he went out to the yes. car? Yes. We just have to make sure that you yes. wait till the question's done so we aren't talking over each other, okay? I know it's a hard habit to break, but we just have to be careful with that, okay? And when you got back to the car, um, at some point he nodded off. Yes. Um, but you were able to wake him, correct? Yes. And talk to him? Yes, but he wasn't that coherent at the time. He was just awakening? Yes. And nodded off again? Yes. And at some point, the police officers walked out, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And, um, and then he, uh, well, you woke him up when the police officers walked out, correct? Yes. And so then he was awake. Yes, you just want me to say yes or no, explain what you want me to do. Well, explain. I want to explain everything. So he, when I tried to wake him up, he woke up the second time. I said, Floyd, the, the police is here. It's about the $20 bill wasn't real. I kept saying, baby, get up. The police was out. So he looked, and we looked to the right, and he had the police. He tapped on the window with a, with a um, flashlight. And I'm like, Floyd. And so he turned back around again. He's like, what, what? And I was like, baby, that's the police. Open the door, roll down the window, whatever he told him to do. So he looked back, and he instantly, when he seen the man, the man had the gun at the window at the, at, when we looked back to him. So he instantly grabbed the wheel, and he was like, please, please don't kill me. Please, please don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. What did I do? Just tell me what I did. Please don't kill me. Please don't shoot me. And I'm like, Floyd, yes, baby, it's not. You said explain him. So I, I did. Explain I did. what state he was in, sir. I did. And I, I have to ask some questions. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off. I really am. But I want to go back and just cover one thing quick. Cause you, where were you sitting in the vehicle? In the back right passenger seat. Okay. And so when officers back came, passenger seat. were there two officers that came to the vehicle? Yes. So one came to the passenger side and one to the driver's side? Yes. And so initially you saw one officer to your right on the passenger side, correct? No, I seen, I was up like in, you know, I'm trying to wake him up, so I'm in the middle, like at the time, you know, when the police were there. That's how I was able to see him, too, just we both looked at the same time. Yeah. And um, when he was, uh, during this time period, mm -hmm. coming out from Cup Foods and being in the vehicle, mm -hmm. did he complain of shortness of breath at all? No. Uh, did he complain of chest pains at all? No. And other than being sleepy or nodding off a little bit, did he seem no. abnormal to you in any way? Not at all. And did he seem startled when the officer pulled a gun on him? Very. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, so in, while you were in the car, or prior to getting in the car, Mr. Floyd appeared to you to be normal, correct? Yes. When he got in the car, he fell asleep, correct? We talked for a while, then he fell asleep. And then ultimately, you had to make several efforts to yes. try to wake him up. Yes. I'm not going to Thank you, Ms. Hill. We appreciate you coming in. Uh, you are excused. Thank you. So again, that's Shawanda Hill. She was the woman in the car with George Floyd on May 25th. We saw her on some of the police body cam footage. She testified that while in Cup Foods,
that George Floyd was happy, he was normal, he was talking, and he was alert. But she says once he got back in the car that Floyd was sleepy. She says that he, for eight minutes, they were talking and everything was fine. And then she received a phone call. She got on the phone. And the next thing that she noticed, the police, uh, by the time the police came to the car, uh, she said that he had fallen asleep. Uh, she also said that when the Cup Foods employees came out to the car, well, let's listen to what the defense is saying here. That sounds like they're calling their next witness. Uh, but Hill says that ultimately that Floyd fell asleep several times uh, in the car, that they tried to rouse him several times and that he would kind of gesture and then nod off. But ultimately he was awake and alert once officers approached the car uh, and uh, one officer pulled a gun on George Floyd there. Uh, that's, again, Shawanda Hill's testimony, the woman who was in the car with George Floyd on May 25th. And now the defense is calling their second witness, or rather their fourth witness, uh, to the stand. Let's listen. The defense seems to be awaiting their fourth witness here to approach the stand. The judge is now standing to escort with witness to the stand and swear them in for their testimony today. So far today, we've heard from a former Minneapolis police officer involved in a 2019 arrest of George Floyd, a paramedic who was called to that scene, and now Shawanda Hill, who was in the car with George Floyd on May 25th when police initially approached his car. And now here's the defense's fourth witness. Give us your full name, spelling each of your names. Peter Chang, uh, first thing is Peter, P-E-T-E-R, last thing is Chang, C-H-A-N-G. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Mr. Chang, by whom are you currently employed? I'm employed with the Minneapolis Park Police. Are you a licensed peace officer? Yes. Could you please describe the training and experience that you have uh, to the jury? Uh, training, I went through the Minneapolis uh, Police Academy. Or prior to that, I did the uh, skills for a metropolitan state. Passed my skills, I went to a uh, police academy through Minneapolis. After passing the, I guess, academy, I went through a uh, FTO phase. Is that field training? Yes. Okay. And that consists of five months. After passing that, I went on the street. Okay. And you, uh, have you spent your entire law enforcement career with the Minneapolis Park Police Department? Yes. And how long have you been a licensed peace officer? Uh, about to be my fourth year in August. Okay. Um, were you on duty back on May uh, 25th of 2020 in the, your capacity as a patrol officer for the Park Police? Yes. And did you ultimately respond to a call at approximately 8 o'clock p.m.? To the park, uh, to the Cup Foods store. Yes. And um, can you describe for the jury how it is that you became uh, a part of this incident? I was uh, at a station at a park close by. Uh, I heard three Tony called out that they were taking out one, I believe, and then I heard a lot of background noises, and I heard dispatch asking for assistance. I was one of the closer squads, so I saw uh, self-assigned to that call to assist 320. Now, let me ask you, is it common for Minneapolis Park Police to assist on calls with the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes. Okay. Um, your jurisdiction generally is within the parks? Uh, yes. However, you are uh, able to back up or assist officers with the Minneapolis Police Department, right? Yes, that's correct. Let me ask you uh, one quick question about your experience. Um, you said that you went to the Minneapolis Police Academy, right? Yes. Even though you were looking to become a Minneapolis Park Police Officer? Yes. Do the Park Police and the P Minneapolis Police Department, you have the same academy? Yes, yes we do. Do you have the same field training process? I believe so, yes. And then do you um, participate in uh, continuing education in service as a police officer? Uh, yes, sir. Is that also in conjunction with the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes. All right. 
Now, after you, um, so you, you responded to the Cup Foods location? Yes. And can you describe for the jury initially what you observed and what you did? When I got there, I initially stopped in front of Cup Foods and I observed the two officers 320 across the street. So I drove my squad across the street and parked. I got on my car, uh, 320, one officer stayed, they were code four. Uh, I guess got out of the car. I observed, I believe, Officer Kane with one of the individuals who I later identified was Floyd. Uh, Floyd was in handcuffs, sitting on the ground, uh, leaning against the wall, and Officer Lane was with two individuals by the car. Now, let me um, ask you quickly, did you know either Officers King or Lane prior to this incident? Uh, no. Okay. Now, um, were you asked to do something at that point? Uh, once I got out of my car, Officer uh, Kane asked me to identify uh, Floyd in our system. So I just went back to our, my squad car and uh, identified Floyd. All right. And what happened next, sir? Uh, once I was in my car identifying Floyd, I was there Officer Lane and Kane. Uh, and it's assisting Floyd towards their car, which was in front of Cafoots. Now, can you describe where, uh, that would be Squad 320, correct? I believe so, yes. And can you describe where Squad 320 was parked and where you were parked? 320 was parked in front of uh, Cafoots. They were on the northbound lane facing southbound. And then I was basically across the street on 38th. I believe my... The front of my squad car was facing eastbound on 38th towards Dragon Walk. Yeah. Did you then move your squad car? Yes. Once I identified Floyd, I looped because I observed Officer Lane and Kane assisting Floyd to their squad car. I looped my squad car around and parked in front of their car, their squad car. So your cars were sort of nose to nose? Yes. At an angle though, right? Yes. All right. What happened next? After that, I got on my squad car. I observed Officer Kane and Lane as pinning Floyd against the squad car, so I wanted to go assist. But once I approached them, Officer Lane told me to go watch the car, and I did that. And you did that? Yes. And then were you, um, uh, where did you go in relation to the car? Uh, the car was parked on 38th Street, so I basically went across the street to the car. Okay. And um, what did you do then? Uh, when I approached the car, I observed the two individuals that initially when I arrived, I saw Officer King Lane with, uh, I guess, reaching inside the car. And I basically just told them to back away from the car and not reach inside or get anything from the car. So you were monitoring what the two passengers were doing at that time? Yes. Was your attention focused on what officers King and Lane were doing, or was it focused on what the passengers were doing? It was more focused on the vehicle and the two passengers. Okay. Now, um, at some point, did you observe another squad car arrive? Uh, yes. And can you describe uh, that interaction that you had with those officers? I believe that was squad 330. They arrived coming westbound on 38th. Uh, they parked in front of the SUV, and I basically just directed them towards 320, which was which they were in front of like uh, foods. Okay. Um, did you know the officers, either of the officers in squad 320? No. Excuse I, me, 330. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 330, not uh, 320. No, I probably met Officer Tao a couple of times, but no relationship. Okay. And you'd never met Officer Chauvin prior to that? No. All right. Now, um, what happened next? Uh, basically went across the street and then I assisted 320. And again, my main focus was just the car and the two individuals. And as uh, Mr. Floyd and the officers were across the street, did you notice any uh, changes in the area? Uh, yeah, as the, the, there was a crowd. And uh, I guess the crowd was becoming more loud and aggressive. A lot of yelling across the street. Did that cause you any concern? Uh, concern for the officer's safety, yes. Did you go over to try to help them? Uh, no, because I asked my job was to watch the car and the two individuals that were by the car. 
Did you know whether the car had been searched at all by officers? At that time, no. Were you concerned about that? Yes. Okay. Um, now, as a, I am assuming that on this day you were in a, a uniform similar to what a Minneapolis police officer would wear? Yes. So you were fully uniformed? Yes. Um, with all of the, the duty belt and all of the things that are on the duty belt, right? Yes. Uh, you were driving a Mark squad car? Yes. And does your uh, department require you to wear a body-worn camera? Yes. Was your body-worn camera active uh, and recording this event? Yes. Now, um, have you had an opportunity at this point to review the footage that was taken by your body-worn camera? I have. And um, does that appear to be a fair and ac uh, accurate representation of the things you observed? Yes. Now, in terms of as the crowd or the group of people were uh, uh, congregating around Squad 320, did you notice anything in terms of the tone or tenor of the voices of those people? They were uh, very aggressive. Yes. Aggressive towards officers, yes. Did the, did the volume increase? Uh, yes. Okay. And so how, how were you reacting? How were you splitting? Well, how were you reacting to that? Uh, yes, I was uh, focused on car, but then it distracts me, and I was concerned for the officer's safety, too, so I just kept an eye on his officers and the car and, and individuals, okay. passengers. And if we can just show the, and just show a couple of parts of your body worn camera. And if you just look at the screen in front of you. Does this appear to uh, be your body worn camera? Yes. And uh, I note uh, at the top right-hand corner here, there is a date. What is the date? Uh, May 26th. Uh, of 2020? Yes. And I notice a time here of 11025Z. Do you know what that means? I do not. Okay. Um, are you familiar with Greenwich Mean Time? Uh, no. Oh, no. Okay. So you don't know why the timestamp, you said you were, what time would you originally estimate that you were um, dispatched to this call or did, that you assigned to this call? I'll say approximately 8, eight o'clock. Okay. Obviously, there's a time difference here uh, that says 1, 10 p.m. And you have no idea why that would be. Uh, no. Okay. Now, but it does appear to, to be your uh, body-worn camera from that day? Uh, yes. The same thing that you've observed before? Yes. All right. Then, Your Honor, um, I would uh, move to admit uh, Exhibit 1054. Subject to the court's prior rulings, 1054 is received. So we're going to watch about three minutes of your uh, body camera here. Permission to publish?
Now, Officer Chang, does that uh, represent that initial interaction that you had with office or with officers King Lane, uh, Mr. Floyd, and the passengers of the vehicle? Yes. All right. And did you then, in fact, uh, use your computer to enter in the um, name of George Floyd? Yes. All right. And um, after you did that, what happened next? Uh, again, I observe Officer Lane and Kane assist uh, George Floyd to their squad car, which was in front of Cup Foods. So I, I uh, slewed my squad car around so I could be closer and I uh, got out of the car. And uh, again, I observe Officer Lane and Kane I was pinning Floyd against their squad car, so I went to assist. But once I approached them, Officer Lane told me to go watch the car. All right, I'm going to, um, if we could take this down, Your Honor. And in front of you, Officer, I'm uh, again showing you uh, part of your body camera footage. Yes. And it appears to be the same date, the same uh, after you've run the information and looped the car around. Yes. And does this video accurately reflect uh, what you saw and ex saw that day? Yes. I would move, Your Honor, for the admission of Exhibit 1055, which is a, an approximately 23-minute, 24-minute part of Mr. Chang's body camera. Subject to the court's prior rulings, 1055 is received. Permission to publish? You may.
Just stay put, all right? I don't want anybody near his car. Is anybody going to check my name? Because I, my daughter on her way here to get me. All right, where's the ID? I don't have ID. All right, why don't you stand right there, okay? They know who gave them the money and what not. Okay. She has to give my partners their names or no? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are there. Yeah, is it? Okay. Did he write it down? Uh, yep. You wrote down everything? Okay, stay put, all right? Let's see what my partner does. Damn, yeah, he still won't get in the car. Just sit down, dude. Dude, they got to push him in this car. Look, he's fighting to get out. That's fucking resistance. What is he doing? We'll see what happens, all right? You guys just stay put until what? Tell my partner's come back here. Ricardo, how are you with 
related to Floyd. Oh, you know him. That's a, he used to do security work at the Salvation Army, man. Are you? How do you know him? I don't know him. I'm telling you how. Right there. He okay. Security work. So how are you guys together then? We was getting a rag. Yeah. Oh, okay, so you two are together. No. I seen him in the store too, but that's my ex. You okay. Know what I'm are you? Are you? How, how do I you two know each other? How do, how do you not know him when he said he's with you? No. no. It's making it more difficult. Right. It's making it more difficult. I know. I think he got shot. He got cheated because he was falling asleep a little bit, and then when he woke up, they was up in the doors. How you doing? Yeah, he started saying, please don't shoot. Right. That's why I had my hands showing. Officer, do you see the uh, individual on the left hand walking by? Oh, uh, yes. Um, you had no interaction with her at this point? No. You'd agree that this is at 123 and 17Z of your body camera footage? Yes. Yeah, I had my hand showing, though, but uh, Mr. Adam is still me too. 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 Me I was getting a, a laptop and it didn't work, so he gave me my funds back. Okay. You can come in and talk to him. Okay, sure. You mind if I get my little mask? I Where is it? What is it? I got my COVID mask. Where is it? Right here. Uh, go ahead. Huh? Go ahead. Let's make it quick. Face me. Huh? Face me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope I that's good. If you guys are gonna, you guys are no warrants or nothing. Then after all this is settled, you guys are good to go out. All this is settled. Can't I just ask him? Oh, wait. There's so. Don't you hear your friend talking? Young over there. Oh, I can see him yelling and talking. Oh, he's making to the, to the store person. Well, I'm waiting for my partners. I'll talk to my partner and see what's up. Yeah, no, I'm talking about, I know the people in the store, man. Okay, that's good. Next door, 2313 Washington Street, Northeast. There's a black male assaulting a female. Officer, I'm just going to look right here at the door to see if I left any time right here. All right, let's get that's it, man. Ricardo, just the door. All right, yeah, nobody's come close to us, so right now we don't need a mask yet. So, right now, nobody's come close to us, so we're good with the mask. Oh, this is that he called her. Did he call her? Is it a white girl? Yeah. Is she short? Yeah, right here. Stay put, guys. All right? I want to be involved in that. Like, the suspect is sitting in the house. Let him go. They did something, boy. All right, let's stay here, right?
stay put here. All right, tell my partners and I'm done over there. They can figure things out. We'll figure things out, right? Right now, we're grabbing an ambulance for your buddy from Florida, okay? Uh, so he might have hurt himself. Yeah. They found him? He might have hurt himself. Oh. All right? Who knows? Shawana? He on the ground with everything. Stay over here, okay? He on the ground? Yes! Where? Right here! Oh, I'm stopping to Shawana, you're not helping. Once our partners get over here, they can explain to you guys, okay? Where's his phone? It's in the car. Better take the car, okay? Nope, I don't want you reaching a car, okay? It's right there on the seat. He'll get to his car once he's done with that, okay? His car is not going anywhere. Yeah. Don't go into a car. It's the fresh seat, I don't want you guys going to the car. That's it. Once my partners come over here, you guys can ask, right? What? Just go straight, man. It's tight here. You guys good? Oh. I don't know. Uh, Officer Chang, uh, pausing the video for a second, you'd agree that the ambulance appears to be leaving at 13021Z on your body worn cam? Yes. Let's wait for the 320. <laughs> Here's a book, man. Yeah, are you guys good with diesel? I'm gonna double check. Here's a book. There's a notebook in there. His phone. He's already gone. He doesn't need his phone. Is that his phone? Put his phone back. Yeah, put his phone back. He's gonna. Have to He's gone already. He went to the hospital. Tell him where it is. Are you sure? Yeah. Put his phone back. That's it. You know I'm rough. Yeah, okay. what's up? You might have called it family something. Now I want your old family out. I ain't even. What happened to him? I didn't talk to them yet. You heard it. Okay, did you ran him though? Nope. No, that man took our name. So, you it suppose you probably have his ID. What happened to him? Fucked up. All right. They stopped him. That's a partner of your partner's in the order. He fucked up your ID. Yeah. He fucked up. He said. They kept it put on it. They kept it. I don't even know what happened. What? Yeah, okay. Oh. Alright, you guys are good. Okay, thank you.
Well, he said these two are good, but I'm not too sure about this. What? That's Sylvia's truck. That's our friend Sylvia. Okay. Ex co worker. But let me try. If I get a phone, I can call her and tell her, sir. Well, her the car is going to stay put right here until we figure it out. Well, you better lock it because it's phone sitting right there. Oh, well, well, Just stay put. Yeah. My car is going to come back. I don't know. I don't know what the plan is with the car. Hey, you mind if I just get his phone? Okay. I don't want you guys touching the car. Officer Chang, you'd agree that the uh, timestamp on your body-worn camera when the fire truck arrives is 1:32 and 50 seconds Z, correct? Yes. Officer Chang, you'd agree that uh, now the fire truck appears to be leaving, correct? Yes. Time stamp on your video is 13506Z, correct? Yes. Our subject to the court's ruling. Now, a few follow-up questions here, Officer Chang, for you. Um, it seems to me that you're walking around quite a bit. Can you explain why? Uh, it's pacing back and forth just to make sure that, I guess, I mean, I was concerned for the officer safety because of the crowd. So I just want to make sure that the officers were okay. okay. Did you observe other people at other locations besides where Mr. Floyd and the officers were? Uh, you can say at least one at every corner of the intersection. Did you observe people standing um, in the Speedway parking lot? Uh, yes. And there were one or two people on the corner where you guys were? Yes. Um, and at least one person across the street uh, to the west, right? Yes. Southwest corner. Now, in terms of um, the general area, would you describe that as a pretty busy intersection? Uh, yes, traffic and foot traffic, yeah. 
So a fair number of cars, vehicles traveling through that intersection? Yes. As well as a fair number of people on bikes or on foot walking past? Yes. All right. Um, ultimately, uh, did this pretty much end your involvement in this case? Yes, that's correct. So you, you pretty much uh, went back to your regular duties with the park police, correct? Yes. All right. Based on that, Your Honor, I have no further questions. Cross examination. Good morning, Officer Chang. Good morning. Just, just a few follow-up questions for you. Um, in the video we just watched, um, at one point when you were talking with Officer Tao, it sounded to me like you you asked him, "Still red?" Yes. What is that? What you said? Yes. What does that mean? Uh, if his body camera is still on. And so you were asking him if his was on. Yeah. And that's because you had yours on still. Yes. And so, Officer Chang, when you're working for the Minneapolis Park Police, um, you go through the academy with um, city police recruits, correct? Yes. Um, and at that point, when you're going through the academy, do you know whether you're going to end up in the park police or the city police? Uh, when you first start the academy, you already know who. <clears throat> sorry, you already know who you're. I guess working for him, yes. So as far as you know, those recruits, you, know, you could be working with them someday in the future. Uh, I guess on the street, I mean, we, if we patrol the same area or precinct, yes. But. Right, but when you start, you could end up being a city officer just like them. Uh, no. Okay. So when initially, when you first start, I guess you already get the offer from the employer. So I already received the offer from uh, Minneapolis Park Police prior to starting the academy. Okay, now I got it. So when you're in the academy, you know you're going to be Park Police and the others may be City Police. Yes. All right. But when you get out there on the streets, um, while you monitor the parks, you also have authority to assist with calls outside of the parks. Yes. So in terms of an average shift, let's say, you know, how often do you do this where you assist on a city police call? Not often, unless we're close by. Unless, uh, we don't, I guess there's no calls at the parks, but we pretty much keep us so busy with the park system. But if, but you know, if, if you self-assign to help a city uh, call, you're not going to get in trouble from your supervisor for that? No. Because okay. that's all, you know, part of your responsibilities, you're allowed to do that. Yes. And in fact, when you're doing that, when you're working in the park police, you have the same um, radio traffic, you're able to hear the same radio traffic as um, the city police officers. Yes. Um, and in fact, I think we heard you refer to the city officers here as your partners, correct? Yes. So when you're there, you look to them as you know, your partners in working this scene. Yes. And you would suspect that they feel the same way about you, I assume. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and um, with this particular call, um, you heard uh, a request for backup, right, on this call? Yes. Um, and because you heard some noise in the background, uh, you decided initially to go lights and sirens. Yes. And, and to self-assign, I think, was the term you used. Yes. Okay. And um, at some point, though, on your way there, you turned off your lights and sirens, right? Yes. Okay. And that was before you actually arrived? Yes. And when you arrived, um, I think we even heard, um, as you're pulling up, the officers already assigned call code four, correct? Yes. And what is your understanding, or back on May 25th of 2020, what was your understanding about what code four means? Uh, scene safety. So it's under control, correct? Yes. All right. And when you got there, um, you got out of your squad car, correct? Yes. And you see two city officers. Yes. And um, one who you later find out is Officer King. 
Yes. Is speaking with Mr. Floyd. Yes. And Mr. Floyd is sitting on the sidewalk against the dragon walk. Yes. He doesn't appear to be threatening in any way at that time, does he? Uh, no. Doesn't appear to be agitated or upset in any way at that time? Uh, no. So right there sitting on the sidewalk, he was pretty peaceful? Yes. And um, when that happened, um, you never heard the officers call for a code three to other officers responding? No. So they did not call a code three, correct? No. That's <laughs> We're doing this question thing. Um, you heard later there was a call for code three on the ambulance, the EMS, correct? Yes. But there was never a call for code three for the responding officers? I don't believe so, no. And um, when you arrived and got out, I assume you were trained to assess the situation, correct? Yes. And you did that as you're getting out of your squad car? Yes. And um, when you did that, did you hear Officer King ask Mr. Floyd for his name? I did, yes. And you heard Mr. Uh, Floyd give his full name? Yes. Spell it? Yes. And his date of birth? I believe so, yes. And then you were asked to run that through your system and, and you were able to do that, correct? Yes. So, um, Then you um, observed as the officers, Lane and King, walked Mr. Floyd over to their squad car, correct? Yes. And that's when you decided to move your squad car over to, to that area, correct? Yes. And your intention there was to help those two officers with what they were doing? Correct. But as soon as you got out, they asked you to go watch the scene by the, the Dragon Walk with the two passengers. Yes. And you did that. You then walked back over to that location. Yes. And once you walked back over there, you really couldn't see what was going on with Officers Lane and King and Mr. Floyd in front of the cup foods. I believe at that time they were still, I mean, still had Floyd against the car. Yeah. I, I believe during that time, yes. Okay, so against the driver's side of their squad car. I believe so, yes. Um, but um, once you walked over to the far side of the road, over by the Dragon Walk, you could no longer see what was going on with Mr. Floyd. Yeah, yes. You uh, indicated that um, the crowd was getting uh, louder and uh, more aggressive, correct? Yes. And... Um, but you knew that there were now four officers over at that scene, correct? Correct, yes. And so your main focus was on watching those passengers? Yes, in a car. And you assumed when you were doing that that those four officers were okay over there because there were four of them, correct? Yes. And if they had radioed for help, you would have heard it over your radio? Yes. And they never radioed for help, did they? No. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Anything further? Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Members of the jury, we're going to take a 10 minute break while we check the availability of the next witness. It'll probably be our last break before uh, we break for lunch. Okay. All right, the court, they're taking a 10 minute break in the trial of Derek Chauvin. The prosecution rested very early this morning, first thing they said in the courtroom. And so the defense has now started calling their witnesses. Right now, we have heard from a former police officer who was involved in a May 2019. Uh, arrest of George Floyd, where he's accused of having ingested drugs as police approached the car. We also heard from a paramedic who was on the scene of that in, uh, incident who talked about uh, Floyd's condition that day, saying his blood pressure was very high, but that his vitals otherwise uh, seemed normal, and that ultimately Floyd was sent to the hospital, monitored for two hours, and released. Then we heard testimony from Shawanda Hill. She is the woman who was in the back seat 
of the car with George Floyd in May of 2020, on May 25th, the day he died. And Shawanda testified uh, that in the cup foods that George Floyd seemed happy, awake, alert, he was talkative, but that once in the car, about eight minutes after they entered the car, that he started to fall asleep. And uh, she also testified that as the cup foods workers approached the car, that Floyd was asleep then. I want to play that clip for you. The store employees came and approached the car, correct? Yes. And at that point, Mr. Floyd suddenly fell asleep? He was already asleep. He was already asleep? Yes, when they came to the car. And when they came there, I tried to wake him up. They tried to wake him up. I tried to wake him up over and over. And his friend tried to wake him up. And he kept, he woke up. Then he'll say something. Uh, he made a little gesture, you know, and nodded back off. I want to bring in Terry Austin, host and legal analyst of the Law and Crime Network, and also Robert DiCello, uh, a trial attorney, to offer some analysis on some of what we heard today. And Robert, I'll start with you, because we hear from Shawanda Hill, on the one hand, that Floyd seemed normal in the store, happy, alert, talkative, et cetera. But now we're hearing this testimony that the defense has prepped us for, that we heard about in opening statements, and that is that George Floyd was falling asleep in the car before officers arrived at the scene. And, and they're trying to make the point throughout the course of this case that this may have been a drug overdose. And we've heard over and over again that fentanyl often causes people to fall asleep uh, and that people who overdose on fentanyl often do, in, do so after falling asleep. And over and over, the prosecution has countered that by pointing to the fact that in the video that we see, the bystander video during the arrest and encounter with police over by the squad car, at no point is George Floyd asleep. Now we hear from Shawanda Hill that in the car, he was. What does that do for the case? Well, it creates a number of confusions, I think, um, message-wise. You know, one of the most important things that a trial lawyer does when they're presenting their side of the case is they want to stay on a clear message. And if we're following what's being presented by the defense right now, what we're seeing is the story of the interrupted overdose. You know, it was an overdose in process or in progress when the officers came to the to the side of the car, drew their weapons and took uh, George out of the car, set him against the side of the building, got his name, got his information. Uh, so, it, you know, again, that doesn't fit what we would normally expect an overdose to look or sound like. Now, had they dragged him out of the car when he was unconscious and laid him on the ground, they might have an argument that could make more sense. So hopefully they're going to have witnesses that can fill in these blanks that I'm pointing to. On the prosecution side, the prosecution is going to have, I think, a, a better time explaining this. They're going to have the opportunity to say, you don't have interrupted overdoses. That's not what's happened here. What happened here was he had taken some substances, some, some fentanyl and some other substances. He got sleepy, and then the officers came. They arrived uh, to talk about the $20 bill situation, and they took him out of the car, and the rest, as we know, is tragic history. So I think that's the net effect. It's some confusion there on the part of the defense in terms of messaging, and I would hope that they can fill in those blanks as they go forward. And I, I want to play another clip, and this is where the prosecution seems like they're trying to show that Floyd was otherwise okay. Uh, this is in a line of questioning again to Shawanda Hill after she testified that he was sleepy in the car uh, as before and as police arrived and that they tried to wake him several times and weren't really able to. He would wake briefly and then go back to sleep. The prosecution starts to ask her if she noticed any other symptoms for George Floyd. Let's listen to that clip. When he was uh, during this time period, coming out from Cup Foods and being in the vehicle, mm -hmm. did he complain of shortness of breath at all? No. Uh, did he complain of chest pains at all? No. And other than being sleepy or nodding off a little bit, did he seem no. abnormal to you in any way? Not at all. And did he seem startled when the officer pulled a gun on him? Very. And so I want to go to Terry on this one. Uh, Terry, on the one hand, again, we heard Hill talk about how sleepy Floyd was in the car. But now you have the prosecution asking, did you notice any of these other things that normally go along with an overdose? And we know that from hearing all the other testimony in the case. And here you hear her say over and over again, no. 
you know what? I think that her cross-examination canceled out the direct examination. She didn't want to be there. She was subpoenaed. We heard the judge talk about the fact you've been subpoenaed outside of the jury's presence. But she basically confirmed what the defense said on direct and also what the prosecution said on cross. She said for Eric Nelson, she said, yes, he fell asleep. It was hard to wake him up. He was incoherent. So that supports the defense's argument that, in fact, he had lots of drugs in his system and he might have died of an overdose. But then when we saw the prosecution come back up and ask about specific sentences and specific symptoms that George Floyd had, she basically confirmed what he said. She said, yes, of course, I woke him up. And he was startled when the police came and tapped on the window, and he talked, and he was walking around. She confirmed the fact that when he was in the store, he was happy, talking, walking. He even danced a bit when he came out. So I think if I had to assess overall what the jury's thinking at this point, she kind of canceled herself out. She confirmed what both of them said, and I— I basically would actually say the prosecution came out just a little bit ahead here. And, Robert, we have often talked throughout the course of this case of not only what witnesses say on the stand, but also their demeanor on the stand. And we saw with Shawanda Hill, despite the judge talking to her before the jury came into the room, make sure she was there willingly to testify and that she was comfortable with some of the questions she was going to be asked. Once questioning started, particularly cross-examination by the prosecution, it seemed pretty clear she wasn't thrilled about being there. How does that affect her testimony? Diane, that's that's exactly right. She was not happy to be where she was. I I, I agree with Terry a hundred percent. You know, jurors are just us, right? I mean, they're the ones just like us who are sitting watching people getting questioned as they sit in their jury box and they're asking the most important question, which is, is this person being truthful? Is this person giving me information that I can trust? Because their biggest fear is getting it wrong. They don't want to get this case wrong. They never want to. So they're, they're certainly assessing the reluctance of the witness. They're assessing the hesitation or the gestures, the facial expressions, all of that. It all factors in. Uh, I, I, I want to ask or add one other point, which is that as this witness is testifying, she's br and I want to echo what Terry said, she's actually doing exactly that. She's kind of giving to both sides. The real question will be, does any of what she say fit with the defense expert presentation that we have yet to hear. And that's the thing we're going to be looking for. I think that's sincerely the strength of the defense, of the defense case, and we haven't heard it yet. Yeah, it seems that was particularly true with the earlier testimony, too, from the police officer involved in Floyd's May 2019 arrest, and then uh, with the paramedic, who was also there for that incident, especially with the officer. There was a really short line of questioning. Eric Nelson barely asked him anything at all. It seemed more about presenting his body cam footage and just getting a few details out of him. But is that all just to set up what we're going to hear later on from medical experts, Robert? It has to be what's called foundational evidence. And frankly, what we're getting from, you know, Shawanda Hill or from Mosang or the paramedic who was with us earlier in the trial or even Officer Crichton is, if it's properly framed for the jury, it's foundational evidence that talks about a man with substance abuse issues who is likely using substances. And then the experts for the defense will make their scientific assessment as to what really caused this man's death. The goal, I think, is just to get one, it takes one juror to have reasonable doubt to find not guilty. And that will be a hard road to to hoe here, but we'll see if it happens. And then we heard from a Minneapolis Park police officer, Peter Chang. He responded uh, to the scene as backup on May 25th. And I want to go over to Alex Prache, who's live outside the courthouse for us, because, Alex, we actually heard them talking about Chang's testimony before the jury even entered the courtroom this morning. And one of the big sources of debate was whether the defense would be able to show his body cam footage and how much much of that footage would be allowed in the courtroom today. Can you walk us through a little bit of what they were debating this morning and ultimately what the decision was? I mean, we know they obviously allowed some body cam footage, but it wasn't straight through. 
Yeah, that, that's right, Derek, Diane. And I mean, there there have been some constraints on on almost all the testimony that we've seen thus far today, and that includes Officer Chang. And we saw those body camera uh, footage of his played essentially in two clips, and that's that's because that the the the, the, the state, the prosecution, didn't want a, a portion of this body cam footage shown. It shows whenever he goes to his car and he runs George Floyd's name. He was told to by the other responding officers to run George Floyd's name, uh, and the, his uh, his record shows up, and they didn't want that to taint uh, the jury. So that essentially it was broken up into two different clips. We saw that, uh, but they, they they limited it what the jury could see in this uh, in this body camera footage. And I, I want to go to Terry on a little bit more about that conversation because Terry, one of the things that they talked a lot about in that hearing this morning was hearsay, how you were going to be listening to certain things that are hearsay throughout the course of this body cam video. And it, we did hear a bit there from Shawanda Hill and Maurice Hall, the camera, uh, the two people who were in the car with George Floyd. Chang's body cam is almost the entire time focused on them, and you can hear them discussing what they are seeing, particularly during Floyd's first encounter with police by the squad car when they're trying to get him into the squad car um, and unable to. And you can hear Hill at one point saying, Damn, he still won't get in the car. Just sit down. They've got to push him in. Look, he's fighting to get out. What is he doing? Now he's going to jail. What does that do for the defense's argument? George Floyd is not on trial here, but the defense is clearly trying to show and remind the jury that he was resisting. And here is his own, you know, the person who was there with him that day. She doesn't say she's his friend, per se, but they know each other, and here she is. Ta narrating this event for us, essentially. Exactly. You know, this morning when they were arguing whether or not to admit this video, the defense absolutely wanted it in. The prosecution was saying, no, it shouldn't come in, it's hearsay. The judge ultimately said, First of all, it's probably not going to be admitted to assert the truth of the matter, so it's not hearsay. It doesn't fall into that category. But then he went on to say, and even if it is, it comes under an exception that it's residual. It can come in. It, it's not a big point in this whole issue. And you're right. It's showing the conversation between Maurice Hall and Shawanda Hill, and, in fact, that information is something that was caught on this body cam. And so the judge, at the end of the day, said he thought it was relevant and he thought it should come in. The only issue he found was that what went on, and Robert mentioned this, as far as what it said about George Floyd, there was some background information that shouldn't go in because that's not relevant. And the judge made sure that the defense cut that out. And you might recall he said, I can do that now, Your Honor. I can cut out and make sure I slow this in clips and not show the whole thing all together and take out that piece of it. So he did that, and the judge allowed the officer to talk about it, to view it, and we saw everything that went on. We basically saw that he was assigned to take care of the car, to take care of those two witnesses. Witnesses, and he talked about the crowd. And I think that was the main reason that Eric Nelson put him on. Repeatedly, he talked about the fact that the crowd was loud and distracting. And so I think that was the main reason he was put on the stand. That is one of the arguments that they are making on behalf of Derek Chauvin, that he was distracted because of this loud and unruly crowd. And that is, in fact, what this officer was able to establish for them. Yeah, and Robert, that's that seems to be another pillar, really, of the defense's areas of reasonable doubt. One is the idea that George Floyd maybe died of a drug overdose, not from the law enforcement restraint. And the other main point seems to be that they would have offered him more care had they not been distracted by this crowd, and, and they were more concerned with defending themselves against this perceived threat, and that took them away from what the care they otherwise would have administered to George Floyd. And I wonder how influential you thought Chang's testimony there, where he says that the crowd was becoming more loud, aggressive yelling, and that that made him concerned for the officer's safety. Diane, I, I didn't find Chang to be particularly persuasive on the on the point that the crowd was that unruly, where care to George Floyd would be an issue. Um, having been with um, 
officers like that in situations where I've been cross-examining officers like that. I also heard something that you hear in trials like this, where the officer is putting a spin on the facts, frankly, in a way that helps show them. And that spin was, I think his quote was, it, they became more aggressive. They were becoming more aggressive. I mean, the only thing we saw on the video, as as would be jurors uh, from ABC News, was the notion that they were starting to yell more, ask more questions. Hey, what's going on? Even even Shawanda was saying, "Wait, he's still on the ground. Why is he still on the ground?" These kinds of things were happening. And when the ambulance showed up, they were questioning, "Why is the ambulance showing up? And why is the ambulance going? And did that really happen?" So we didn't hear the kind of threats that um, that you would typically expect to hear in such a situation where an officer couldn't render care. The other thing I wanted to point out from that video that struck me, there's a, there's a moment where you see the officer taking his hands and putting these leather gloves on. And it's just an ominous kind of strange message that, that, is, that is being telegraphed into this, that we may have to get violent here. In a situation over a $20 bill, again, it's going to be tough for the defense to frame this testimony, both of Chang and the others today, in a way that really pushes this thing in the direction of a, of a not guilty. And we did hear Chang again later in the testimony after they showed the body cam. They kind of went there again under questioning by the defense, saying that he was asked why he was moving around a lot, because obviously we're watching his body cam footage, and you can see that he's sort of shifting directions every now and then, and the camera moves, and he says, I was pacing back and forth because I was concerned for the officer's safety. He says, I was concerned because of the crowd, and I just wanted to make sure that the officers were okay. So this is definitely a point that the defense wanted to make sure that they got across and that the jury heard about Chang's concern over the officers because of the crowd. But I want to go back to Alex Perche outside the courtroom, because, Alex, on cross-examination, the prosecution also brought up another part of the body cam footage, and that is where we see George Floyd initially in handcuffs, sitting on the sidewalk outside the, I think, the Dragon Walk, uh, across the street from where the ultimate police encounter uh, ends up happening. And you can hear Chang say that he seemed pretty peaceful at that time. Not only that, Diane, but there's a critical point that the prosecution wanted to make, and that's what the police there were saying themselves. See, they had listed a code four, which for scene safety. And so you heard in that cross examination uh, the prosecutor saying, so the scene was under control, correct? And it seems to me that you respond, responds, yes. There was no call for code three like there was in, 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 the, in the case for, for medical response from the police, which would have escalated uh, and, and, and alerted officers that there needed to be more scene safety. All right. And it sounds like they're coming back in the courtroom, coming back from that 10 minute break. Let's listen into the trial. Your Honor, for the record, the defense recalls uh, Officer Nicole McKenzie. The defense just called Officer Nicole McKenzie. You'll remember she was a prosecution witness uh, who testified about the medical response to George Floyd on May 25th. She talked a little bit in that testimony uh, while being questioned about excited delirium. Ultimately, the prosecution objected. They didn't continue with that line of questioning, but the defense then asked to call her as their own witness. And let's have you state and spell so your we're going to see how this questioning uh, goes with Nicole McKenzie, but we are expecting to hear her talk about excited delirium today. K-E-N-Z-I-E. Yeah, Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Ms. McKenzie. Morning. Officer. Officer, I apologize. I, I'm sorry. Um, you've previously testified in this case, correct? I have. And uh, just to refresh the jury's recollection, what is your uh, role again with the Minneapolis Police Department? I'm the medical support coordinator for the department. Okay. And in terms of... Can you take your mask down? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the training that you provide to officers, uh, fair to say that the training consists of both academy training and uh, veteran officer training called in-service. Yes, sir. And in terms of uh, the training that your department provides, 
does your department provide excited delirium training to officers in the academy? In the academy, yes. And that's not something that routinely is given to the veteran officers? Correct. All right. Now, you understand that uh, Officer Lane, who is a part of this case, recently attended the academy? Correct, yes. And um, he would have seen the materials that the Minneapolis Police Department provided relevant to excited delirium? Yes, sir. And you've had an opportunity and you've reviewed the PowerPoint presentations that are prepared in that regard? I have. Do you want the instruction? Members of the jury, uh, you're about to receive evidence regarding excited delirium training that was received by Officer Lane at the police academy. This is being offered for the limited purpose of explaining why he used the phrase excited delirium on May 25th, 2020, and what that meant to him. This is not being offered as a state of mind or knowledge of the defendant, since we have no indication in the record that this defendant, Mr. Chauvin, uh, took this training. So accept it only for that limited purpose regarding Officer Lane. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. So just uh, going to show you, uh, this has been pre-marked as Exhibit 1053. Does this appear to be the uh, training materials the Minneapolis Police Department provides for officers, cadets in the academy? It does. Um, does it, and just skipping through, does this appear to be a accurate uh, copy of that? It appears to be so. And I'll just kind of scan through fast. be pretty much the entirety of that training? It looks like it, yes. Okay. And um, can you just describe for the jury generally what excited delirium is as you train it? Certainly. It's uh, a condition that's a combination of a variety of different medical um, uh, issues that are happening at the same time. This could be something like psychosis, um, Um, I'm sorry, um, uh, agitated, uh, agitated delirium, um, it could be uh, a pressurized speech, incoherent speech, um, superhuman strength, hyperthermia, they could all be present. And um, does the Minneapolis Police Department train cadets, what types of things cause excited delirium? In a general sense, yes. It's a combination of uh, pre-existing factors. It could be cardiovascular disease, um, also illicit drug use, and also mental health um, diagnoses. Okay. And in terms of um, the uh, signs that officers are trained to look for, could you describe what those are? Yeah, we do use an acronym um, to correlate with that, and we use the acronym of not a crime. Um, so there's a varying different things you might see if somebody's presenting with excited delirium. Um, like the person, because they are experiencing um, hyperthermia, meaning excessive temperature, uh, they might be removing their clothing, they might be speaking incoherently. Um, whether it's a bystander or the caller, uh, they might describe that the person had just snapped. Um, it, and if I could reference my materials, I can go through a little more in detail. Um, so for purposes and subject to the state's objection, the, the defense moves to introduce Exhibit 1053. Subject to the court's rulings, uh, 1053 is received. Uh, you see uh, the first uh, letter of your acronym, not a crime, before you? Yes. And um, what does that stand for? Uh, the patient might present as naked or sweating, removing their clothing. Okay. And the second slide being, or excuse me, the next uh, letter being O? Yes, and that's objects, exhibiting violence towards objects. Okay. T? Is tough and unstoppable. And that's what you described as like superhuman strength? Yes, sir. A? The onset is acute. What does that and, mean? And that's where somebody will say the patient just snapped. So it's rapid or fast? Right. 
C? Uh, the patient is confused. Might be speaking incoherently. R? Resistant. And define that? Um, that the person will likely not be able to, uh, they don't have the capability about them to respond to commands um, to comply. Okay. And I? Incoherent. And how would you define incoherent in this sense? Um, if somebody's like experiencing some level of psychosis, they might be talking about complete nonsense. Their words just don't even make sense. Um, and there's really no dialogue you can have with them, meaningful dialogue you can have with the person. Okay. And M? Uh, that'd be mental health. The person uh, or callers have some kind of information that leads to believe there's some mental health issues going on. And E? And that EMS should be requested early. It's fair to say that if an officer uh, suspects um, excited delirium as occurring with a suspect, there are certain steps that they are encouraged to do, correct? Correct. Um, can you define what an officer should do if they encounter a suspect they suspect is suffering from excited delirium? Uh, definitely get more resources started because you might need more resources than you would think. And then also having EMS stage um, at a safe distance away until the situation's under control. And obviously um, attempt to control the subject? Correct. Through physical restraint? Yes. Uh, it's fair to say that once a person is in handcuffs under the excited delirium, uh, you train officers to put that suspect in the recovery position, agreed? Correct. And what would be the purpose of um, bringing EMS on scene? Uh, because people that are experiencing the excited delirium syndrome, uh, they can rapidly go into cardiac arrest. And that's how you train uh, Minneapolis police cadets, correct? Correct. Now, again, as far as veteran officers, they may not see this particular training materials, correct? They would not. And But is, is excited delirium a subject that is discussed in in-service trainings generally? It has been in the past, but that was not with the medical support team. And so in terms of use of force or other questions? Or other areas of training? Correct. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I have no further questions. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer McKenzie, I have just a few follow up questions for you. Um, so, the, the basic training. Uh, an excited delirium with cadets or recruits um, is to is what to look for. Correct. And then secondly, what things they can do. Correct. And one of the things that they are told to do is to put the person in the side recovery position, correct? That is correct. And that's to help facilitate breathing. Yes. Because excited delirium, if it exists, uh, could compromise proper breathing. It, absolutely, yes. And officers, um, both in the academy and veteran officers, are trained on CPR. Yes. And so um, they are also trained that they have an obligation if someone becomes pulseless or unresponsive to initiate measures such as CPR. Yes, sir. And that would be true of, as I said, veteran officers as well, correct? Correct. It's our policy. And um, cadets like uh, Officer Lane received CPR training, correct? Yes, sir. And an officer like uh, Mr. Chauvin would have received CPR training on a regular basis. Yes. You were asked about the acronym uh, to help identify potential markers of this condition? Yes. Um, would you um, defer to an emergency room doctor uh, on whether someone is actually experiencing excited delirium? Absolutely. It's not our place to diagnose that. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Thank you, officer. Uh, you are excused now. Thank you. 
Your next witness is available after lunch. What time? Uh, Alright, members of the jury, we're gonna take our lunch break and uh, let's reconvene at 115. We'll see you then. All right, court is on a lunch break right now in the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer charged in the death of George Floyd. We just finished hearing from Nicole McKenzie. She's a medical support officer for the Minneapolis to Police Department. She was actually called as a prosecution witness uh, earlier in the case to testify essentially to how officers are trained in terms of administering care to, to uh, a subject who is in medical distress during an arrest. And she testified how officers are both trained on CPR and trained to start administering CPR when someone is unresponsive. Now, during that testimony, she spoke a little bit about excited delirium. So here you have Eric Nelson calling her back as a defense witness to talk more about that angle. And what we heard today from Nicole McKenzie there is how the Minneapolis P Police Department trains officers on excited delirium. Now, this is not training that Derek Chauvin would have received. And so we heard the judge instructing the jury that this is really just to explain why we hear Officer Lane, one of the other officers involved in this case, mention concerns about excited delirium on the body cam. And I want to go to trial lawyer Robert DiCello to talk a little bit more about this, because, Robert, one of the things we heard McKenzie describing was pre-existing factors. And again, this is not her speaking as a medical expert on excited delirium, but she's talking about what officers are taught about excited delirium. And what she's saying is one of the things that they are taught can be precursors to excited delirium are things like pre-existing factors like cardiovascular disease and illicit, illicit drug use, as well as mental health diagnosis. And we know that in this case, two out of three of those are in play. We know that George Floyd had some heart uh, conditions, and so there's your cardiovascular disease. And then we also know that he was on drugs that day, and so there's your illicit drug use. How strong is that testimony for the defense here? Uh, Diane, this is a really important moment in the trial. Let me explain why. Uh, first of all, I'm surprised that the judge allowed this testimony in. Excited delirium, so let's, let's learn a little bit right here. Excited delirium is a medical diagnosis of exclusion, which is in my world and in medical terms, uh, a phrase that means when all other things are ruled out, this might be the cause. And what is it? Well, in 1985, excited delirium was first found in people who had ingested cocaine. And there was no real physiological explanation for how they died, but they were in restraint at the time of their death. And so since 1985 to the present day, medical doctors haven't really even agreed on whether this is an actual thing. It's something that is often found, however, most usually correlated to physical restraint. And so the thing that the defense really wanted to get to the jury today was the words of that manual that they presented, or the police paperwork, paperwork where she had to say, no crime. That's just planting the idea. I, I, I'm telling you something from behind the scenes. We love to see opportunities as trial lawyers if we can suggest our side of the case through the other side's information. And that's exactly what they did. No crime. So they're telegraphing that. Second reason they want her in this case is if the jury gets confused enough, they might think, and this is why I was surprised that the judge let this in, they might think that that's a real thing that this particular police officer can talk to us about and teach us about, when in fact, it's a medical thing that no medical doctor in the prosecution's case talked to, found, supported, any of that. This just came out a week ago when, while she was being cross-examined by the defense counsel, Mr. Nelson, she mentioned excited delirium as being something that was trained. And to your point, one of the officers on scene with Chauvin who's a newer guy, who's trained on this kind of exotic um, condition, asks while they're handling Floyd, do you think this could be excited delirium? And I, I posit that he hardly knows what he's talking about, because here's what it contains. You've got, you're going to have some agitation. You're going to have superhuman strength. You're going to have hyperthermia. And just to give you an example of what hyperthermia really is medically, it's like a temperature over 105. 
It's not a guy who's got 101 temperature or who's sweating or whose heart is beating fast. So a pretty critical uh, conversation to have is why did the, the judge let this in? And I'll tell you why. He doesn't want this case coming back. He's going to give the defense their due and see if this will instill some reasonable doubt. And, and Terry, to Robert's point, we... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we had I thought we had Terry Austin with us. Well, Robert, I'm going to ask you to follow up on your own point then, because what we haven't heard Nicole be uh, redirected. What, do you expect that the prosecution is going to follow this forward in their closing arguments in trying to point out one what you said, but also the fact that some of the things she described we didn't hear described with George Floyd. Here she is saying that. You know, people often with excited delirium cipher hypothermia. We often see them, she says, taking their clothes off at random times. At no point throughout the course of this incident do we ever see George Floyd trying to take his clothes off. And she's talking about, you know, when callers call 911 or, or any other bystanders describe someone who they suspect to be in this state, they often describe the person as having just snapped. You know, could the prosecution use that testimony to their favor by saying, you know, we didn't see that with George Floyd? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you actually got a precursor of it in the cross-examination that we just heard. There was some poking in terms of, did you see, did we have this piece of information about George Floyd? Did, did George Floyd behave in this manner? Some gentle pushes. But yeah, the fact of the matter is that the, the prosecution is going to ride or die with their medical people. And they're going to tell that jury, as, as I'm talking to you right now, they're going to tell that jury, there is something you can trust. It's your eyes, it's the video, and it's the doctors, none of whom gave credence to this excited delirium idea. It is just a ploy, they will say, that the defense has put forward because they've got to say something. Now, the defense will respond, I, I imagine, no, there's something to this. But again, we have to caution each other right now. We haven't heard the defense medical experts. So once we do, we'll see if they can tie this excited delirium theory into anything meaningful. And I want to correct myself. I said that you might hear it in cross-examination. Obviously, she was already cross-examined by the prosecution. I meant in closing arguments. Um, but I, the other aspect of this seems to be the question of what they're then trained to do if they do suspect that someone has excited delirium. And that's where we saw more along the lines of what the prosecution was trying to get at uh, with that. And I want to bring in Daniel Herbert on this, criminal defense attorney Daniel Herbert, uh, who I believe is with us right now. And what we heard along those lines, Daniel, was them talking about the fact that officers are trained in this case to a, call EMS, have them staged nearby. And the defense was trying to point to the part where they're trained to get the situation under control and to perhaps, or in most cases, or in all cases maybe, restrain the person who's going through this. And so does that, how much does that work to the defense's case of if they suspected excited delirium, that they followed the protocol at least up until that point? They were just trying to get George Floyd under control as they're trained to do. Yeah, I agree with my colleague. It, it, it was a little bit surprising that the judge allowed the testimony of that uh, police officer. Um, however, uh, clearly he limited her testimony to what they are trained on. And it, it, it's an important point for the defense. Uh, I don't know how persuasive it is, but they need to show that they believe that Mr. Floyd was uh, capable of very violent and abnormal behavior that would have caused a danger to themselves or to uh, to himself. So, you know, I think that was um, the testimony that needed to get out. And, um, you know, the park police officer gave some testimony, too, that I thought um, somewhat helped the defense. And uh, I can explain on that if you want. Oh, well, I do want to get into Officer Chang's uh, testimony in a second, but I want to stay with Nicole McKenzie uh, just for right now while we complete the thought there, because um, you talked about how this this angle of the testimony is where the defense was trying to go in terms of we were just trying to get him under control the same way officers are trained to do if they suspect excited delirium. Um, but, Robert, the other part of that was the prosecution then asking her about 
what else officers are trained to do if they suspect excited delirium. And what we heard her talk about was, A, they're trained to put people in the side recovery position so that they don't impinge on someone's breathing. We know the officers didn't do that in that case. And that also, if someone becomes unresponsive due to excited delirium or anything else, they're supposed to administer CPR. And while she testifies that Derek Chauvin did not receive this specific training on excited delirium, that Officer Lane was the one who received that training, she says he would have received that training on CPR and what to do in terms of side recovery position and administering CPR if someone's unresponsive. What does that do for the defense's case of reasonable doubt here? I'm sorry, are you asking me that question? I was asking I Robert, but I'm wondering if maybe we lost Robert. Uh, Daniel, why don't you go? Daniel, go ahead and you answer. Yeah, it, it, that doesn't help the uh, defense. Um, certainly, that was a uh, you know the, the defense recognizes that their uh, that their witnesses are not going to be um, perfect for them. Uh, they called her for a particular reason about the training for excited delirium, and that was uh, important testimony for them. But then the uh, the the downside of it was the prosecution can talk about their training with respect to uh, providing some life saving measures. Uh, which which certainly weren't done here. And, you know, it's a calculated risk, but, you know, th there's no question that the CPR and life-saving measures uh, weren't done in this case. So they, they certainly uh, just have to eat that point. And, and, Robert, I think you can hear me now. Overall, how beneficial do you think this testimony was for the defense? I, I I don't think it was very beneficial, honestly. I, I think it, it again, it's it's one little block in a big wall that they have to create. And that wall of reasonable doubt has got to get thicker, stronger, and bigger before it can be believed. All right. And so I want to backtrack now a little bit um, to the testimony that, that we heard Daniel bring up there, which is Minneapolis Park Police Officer Peter Chang. Now, he responded to the scene as backup, and when he arrived at the scene, was instructed to essentially stay by Floyd's car, to watch George Floyd's car, the car he was driving that day, and also the two passengers in that car, Maurice Hall and Shawanda Hill. Now, I, I want to go to Alex Brochet to talk a little bit about the debate that happened before the jury entered the courtroom. The, the judge seemed to be cautious about how much of this body cam footage uh, from Officer Chang's body cam they were even going to allow in the courtroom, Alex. Diane, that's right. And essentially, I mean, we saw this video in two chunks, right? There was a middle portion missing. And that's because during that uh, that, that stop, uh, when Officer Chang arrived on the scene, he heard George Floyd's name and he was told by the other, other officers there to, to run that name. And so you see him return to the squad car and the positioning of his body camera uh, actually shows what comes up on his screen. Uh, George Floyd's details, uh, some, uh, some, some, some prior information that they didn't want to, uh, to to interfere or taint the jury's perception because again we're saying this is the Chauvin trial it is not the George Floyd trial and so thus the, the judge decided that that portion would be excluded from uh, from from this 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 video that was played out this afternoon and Alex we can't see the jury uh, but we do have pool reporters in the courtroom who are there in person. And so they're getting to witness some of the body language that we're missing watching this whole thing play out on the live feed. Can you tell us a little bit about how the jury is reacting throughout the course of today's testimony, the first day that the defense is calling witnesses? Diane, so we just got a, uh, the latest poll note, and I can tell you that there was a lot of interest from the jurors about the phrase excited delirium. You heard uh, uh, Officer McKenzie talk about the acronym for it uh, in diagnosing it, not a crime. Uh, a lot of notes being taken down during that. Also, uh, a lot of interest whenever uh, she mentioned that officers needed more resources when you attempt to control a subject through physical restraints. And then another point where uh, that drew interest from the jury was uh, when she talked about uh, the need to put a person on their side in, in, in treating that. So, I mean, we can see there was a lot of juror interest uh, in, in, in uh, the diagnosis of excited delirium and, and also the treatment for, uh, for during, a, during a stop. So I want to go back to the lawyers on that one then. We, I want to talk about Chang's testimony. But first, Robert, your quick thoughts on hearing what the jury seems to be tuning into. 
I, I'm finding that very fascinating. I wish I could see their faces too. It, it, it indicates exactly what I began my remarks with earlier, which is that when you get the opportunity to telegraph no crime, when you get the opportunity to have a police officer talk about a vague medical uh, diagnosis, uh, the defense has got to be liking that. And so, Daniel, I now want to go to um, the testimony that we heard from Officer Chang. I want to play a clip of that because one of the main things that he seemed to be on the stand to do for the defense was to talk about his concern over the officer's safety because of the crowd. And so I want to play a clip for you where he describes not only the crowd, but the intersection in general. It seems to me that you're walking around quite a bit. Can you explain why? Uh, it's pacing back and forth just to make sure that I was, again, always concerned for the officer safety because of the crowd. So I just want to make sure that the officers were okay. Did you observe other people at other locations besides where Mr. Floyd and the officers were? Uh, you could say at least one at every corner of the intersection. Did you observe people standing um, in the Speedway parking lot? Uh, yes. And there were one or two people on the corner where you guys were? Yes. Um, and at least one person across the street uh, to the west, right? Yes. Southwest corner. Now, in terms of um, the general area, would you describe that as a pretty busy, busy intersection? Uh, yes, traffic and foot traffic, yeah. So a fair number of cars, vehicles traveling through that intersection? Yes. As well as a fair number of people on bikes or on foot walking past? Yes. So again, I want to go to criminal defense attorney Daniel Herbert. Daniel, what did you think of that? We know that this is a central pillar of the defense's case. One, that George Floyd may have died of an overdose, but also that officers were distracted by this growing crowd that they perceived as a threat. Now, for the first time, we have somebody who was there at the scene saying, I was concerned about their safety, too, because of the crowd. It's a very important point. Uh, because the officers, especially Chauvin, has to show that he was in fear. And when you have somebody handcuffed on the ground in a prone position with your knee on their neck, it's very difficult for anyone to believe uh, that there was a reasonable fear for Mr. Floyd from his perspective. So what the defense is, and they made this very clear in their opening, uh, they are focusing on uh, the factors that were surrounding uh, Mr. Floyd namely the crowd. And I think the biggest thing that they wanted to get out, and I believe did get out somewhat effectively from the park police officer, was A, that this is an officer that um, is not part of the same police department. He recognized the danger. Uh, he showed up. He's not part of that conspiracy with Chauvin and the other officers. And I think most uh, important is uh, park, that the park police officer showed that um, the vehicle was not searched. It showed that the two occupants of the vehicle had not been searched, and it showed that uh, that the that Chauvin and his fellow officers were so concerned about their safety that they didn't want to run this individual, Mr. Floyd's name. They didn't want to uh, take somebody away from uh, Mr. Floyd because they thought he was dangerous. So they had uh, the park police officer go over to the vehicle, um, and then you know you heard in the clip you heard some of the testimony from. The occupants were there uh, essentially witnessing Floyd uh, struggling with the officers and certainly not complying. And they're saying things like, why is he fighting with them? Oh, man, he should just get in the car. So I, I think those are important points that the defense needed to get out because they have to show some type of reasonable fear. And Mr. Floyd alone clearly is not that reasonable fear. Well, and Robert, how, how much do you think that influences the jury to see this part of the body cam where we're seeing the two passengers who were in the car with George Floyd essentially narrating what they're seeing at the beginning of his encounter with police when they're trying to get him into the squad car and they can't quite do it. And you hear Shawanda Hill saying, oh, he won't get in the car, just sit down, they have to push him in. Look, he's fighting to get out. What is he doing? Now he's going to jail. The defense didn't circle back to that, but the jury heard that on this video. Yeah, uh, Diane, they did. And I think what it creates is, could this have been George Floyd's fault? It's that nasty question that nobody wants to say out loud. Could this have been all avoided 
if George just would have calmed down? And why didn't he just sit in the car? Why didn't he just stay there? Uh, if they can carry the day with one juror on that question, and if one juror believes this is George's fault, uh, it's going to be a tough day for the prosecution. But we'll see. Again, we've got a long way to go. Uh, and I want to go back to Alex Perche, who's live outside the courtroom for us, because, Alex, the prosecution did take on that very point that Robert just brought up. And we've heard over and over again throughout the course of this trial to remember that George Floyd is not on trial here. But the prosecution actually started talking about some more specifics that we heard in this video that maybe we civilians can't recognize, which includes the codes that they were calling uh, on the, as you hear the 911 operator talking into their radios. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what the prosecution was getting at there? Absolutely, Diane. So we heard uh, the defense try to lay the groundwork that uh, Officer Chang was walking around. They asked him, why was he walking around? Well, he was concerned for the safety of the other officers and, and the crowd that had amassed around around that area where George Floyd was uh, was, was was being held. And uh, then you, you saw the, the, the state, the prosecution, come back and say, well, when you arrived, a code for it had been issued, and so it was for scene safety. And so the, the 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 state attorney says, so it was under control, correct? That's what code four means. And you see Officer Chang respond, yes. He had in throughout the entire process, they hadn't upped that um, that 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 level of caution from the, from the officer's standpoint. And so you know the the state will point to the fact, if the officers were so worried about the scene and it not being under control, why didn't they uh, radio in for for more backup? And for more help. And Daniel, the other thing that the prosecution also picked up on, in addition to the point that Alex just made, was the idea that before they brought him over to the squad car, he asks Chang, the prosecutor asks Chang, you know, how did Floyd appear when he's sitting on the sidewalk? Did he appear threatening? Did he appear agitated, upset? Did he seem pretty peaceful? And the answer to the first three were no. And the last one was yes, that he seemed pretty peaceful. So what does that do for the idea that, one, the next, the next witness on the stand is testifying that maybe they suspected, uh, you know, excited delirium, and here you have another officer who was on the scene before things got heated and before Floyd started resisting, saying that everything seemed pretty peaceful. Well, it, it does go to uh, rebut some of uh, Miss Hill's testimony, who testified before him, where you know she got out information about how Mr. Floyd was uh, essentially incoherent and falling asleep, and uh, and and you talked about earlier about how the jury didn't hear something um, when Mrs. Hill was testifying, but one thing they did hear, and it was stricken. And uh, I'm not sure if you noticed it, but Miss Hill, uh, she was being asked questions about her observations of Mr. Floyd and, and about him sleeping. And she got out that uh, he told me he was working last night, something along those lines. Uh, clearly hearsay, the judge properly struck that testimony, uh, but the jury heard it. And uh, uh, they're not supposed to consider it, but you can't unring the bell. Um, so I, I think that, you know, it was. It was information that, uh, you know, it shows that, that Mr. Floyd was was certainly coherent enough to provide his name and provide his uh, date of birth and other identifying factors. And, yeah, it undercuts a little bit the argument about uh, perhaps um, fear of uh, excited delirium or some other condition. Um, however, uh, what the defense is going to argue is that can uh, come on rather quickly, uh, even after somebody is very calm and answering questions. All right. Trial lawyer Robert DiCello, criminal defense attorney Daniel Herbert. We're going to ask you guys to stay with us if you can. The same for Alex Perche, who's live in Minneapolis for us. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the other witnesses the defense called this morning and in general, how day one is going as the defense starts to present their case to the jury in the trial against Derek Chauvin. We'll be right back.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the trial against Derek Chauvin charged in the death of George Floyd. Uh, the defense started presenting their case today after the prosecution rested early this morning. And so their first witness was retired MPD officer uh, Scott Creighton, who was involved in a May 19 arrest of George Floyd. At the time, George was a passenger in a car. And we heard Creighton testify uh, about how he approached the vehicle. And we also, more importantly, saw body cam footage from that arrest. During that encounter, Floyd is alleged to have ingested drugs not only throughout the course of the day, but also as officers arrived on the scene. And so a lot of what was supposed to come out of that testimony was how he was physically affected by the drugs he ingested on that day. And I want to bring in our attorneys, criminal defense attorney Daniel Herbert and trial lawyer Robert DiCello to talk a little bit about what we got out of that testimony. Uh, Daniel, this was very quick questioning, particularly by the defense of Officer Creighton. It seemed almost like they just wanted to get the body cam footage in and just confirm, hear him confirm that, yes, that's George Floyd that you see in the video. And they kind of left it at that. They did, but they certainly uh, are hoping for much bigger meaning than that. Uh, they're hoping to that it resonates with the jury that uh, here is Mr. Floyd on another occasion um, not complying with police officers, uh, swallowing narcotics uh, to show that essentially his prior bad acts were the same acts that he committed uh, on the day in question. And Robert, on cross-examination, we heard uh, Crichton being asked 
and he did say that, in his opinion, George Floyd was incoherent. But then we heard the attorney asking him, agreeing that Floyd was answering questions, he was responsive, he was talking. Uh, you know, she asked a lot of questions that made it seem like his emotional responses were logical, that he was, you know, a little fearful of having a gun pointed at him, et cetera. And that, more importantly, he was able to stand, he wasn't, he didn't fall to the ground, he didn't drop dead, which is a question that she literally asked, did he drop dead? And we heard Creighton say no, that he didn't. Uh, and so how far does that part of the case go if ultimately we know that Floyd survived this encounter and even the officer on the scene is explaining how he was more or less responsive and, and making some sense and standing okay and, and so on. Diane, this testimony is going to go as far as a single juror might carry it. And by that, I mean, if a juror starts to, to think, you know, maybe Floyd is a drug user, and maybe because he's a drug user, um, this is really his fault, and maybe he bro broke the law because he's a drug user. So if, if, if we create this appearance of his character being bad, which is, by the way, why this testimony was so narrowly uh, controlled by the judge. And so let me explain what I mean by that. The judge says to, to the lawyers, look, you can only have Crichton talk about a couple things. We're not going to create the appearance that his prior character issues, drug use, maybe he swore at his mom when he was 10 years old, whatever the stuff is that Crichton can bring out that's bad about this man's character, that's not why he's being called. And so he tells that to the jury in what's called a curative instruction. He tells them, we're only bringing this in for a limited purpose, not to say anything about George's bad character. Because if we could do that in court, then it'd be just like if we were meeting in a restaurant talking about some guy down the street that we knew that was bad to his wife, and so he probably sped past that police officer and caused, you know, did a crime. So we can't have that in courtrooms. And so that's why this testimony is powerful, and it will go as far as one juror could take it. I mean, if one juror hears that, just as it shouldn't be presented, just as the judge instructed it should not be used, it could be beneficial to the defense. Yeah, we did also hear him kind of rein things in any time it seemed to veer toward uh, Floyd's emotional state during that arrest. And even before the questioning started in pretrial motions, we did hear the judge specify that he didn't want to go down that road and he was only going to allow information about this case in, that, that May 2019 incident in, that pertained to Floyd's physical reaction to the drugs he took that day, nothing about his emotional state, which is why we often heard them stop the questioning, even when paramedic uh, Michelle Mosang started talking about why he was upset. They stopped that line of questioning right there and then. And anytime she mentioned words like upset that spoke to Floyd's demeanor, as opposed to his physical state. Uh, but Daniel, it did seem like the defense may have made some headway in talking about his physical state, specifically when Mo Seng started talking about his blood pressure. She said she took his blood pressure that day, that Floyd had told her that he took seven to nine Percocets uh, spaced out over 20 minutes each, and that he took one right before as the officers were approaching the car. And I know that you said that's gonna speak to sort of his MO, the, the fact that, oh, well, if he did that, in May of 2019, maybe he did that in May of 2020, as the defense is alleging as well. Uh, but also, the what effect that drug may have had on him. And she's saying that his blood pressure was 216 over 160. And I don't think you have to be a medical doctor to know that that's high. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I mean, really, their motive here, the defense, is, is to show that it's essentially to dirty up Mr. Floyd. And it's to show that, um, yeah, some of that testimony that came out about the prior incident um, undercuts some of their argument, but they're hoping that the positive side uh, that they will get out of that testimony is not that he ingested drugs on this date and that he was fine. It's that a year later, you know, this guy was, you know, in a, in a, in a worse state than he was in before that. And maybe he got lucky on the first date, but uh, on the second date, he had the same, uh, he did the same acts and took the same uh, combination of prescribed and non-prescribed drugs. And on this date, he didn't get that lucky. And that's what killed him. And that's what they're trying to imply by that.
And I, I want to break away for a second because we do have some breaking news now. The families of George Floyd and Dante Wright, the 20-year-old uh, black man shot and killed by police outside of Minneapolis, uh, the families are holding a joint press conference right now with their attorneys. Let's listen to that. There was a time when nobody in America should be killed by police. It was in this pinnacle trial of Derek Chauvin, which I believe is one of the most impactful civil rights police excessive use of force cases in the history of America. And we believe with everything in our heart, Katie, that police would be on their best behavior, that they would exercise the greatest standard of care, that they will concentrate on de-escalation in a way that they have never concentrated in America. But regrettably, two days ago, we saw Dante Wright for a traffic citation, and Attorney Storms is going to talk about this, because y'all do understand we're still in the midst of a pandemic where many people in this state could not get their license tabs on their license plates renewed because the DMV, like everything else in America, was shut down. And so it was told, police, you need to be sensitive because there are going to be a lot of expired license plates out there. But I guess when you're driving while black, people sometimes forget memos and initiatives about the realities of life. And you were here from his mother, and I, it's snowing, so everybody's going to try to be brief. You were here from his mother about the phone call in the car where was said about why he was stopped, because it's evolving. It's evolving so they can justify the unjustifiable. But we're not going to let them justify it, are we? Because Dante Wright life matters. Dante Wright life matters. Dante Wright life matters. And so when you think about the fact that Dante was trying to get away, he was not a threat to them. Was it the best decision? No. But young people don't always make the best decisions. As his mother said, he was scared. And you have this 26-year veteran on the police force who was training them. Brandon Trey. He was tra- She was the trainer of the officers. And so for 26 years, you know how you're trained that your duty weapon is on your dominant side and your taser is on your non-dominant side. And why is that? Because it's foreseeable that in an exigent situation, if the taser is beside the gun, you might pull the wrong thing. But after 26 years, you would think that you know yeah. what side your gun is on and what side your taser is on. You know the weight of your gun and you know the weight of the taser. You know the gun is black. You know the taser is going to have some reflective color on it. And so it is unacceptable. It was intentional they stopped them. It was intentional they used the most force. They could have gave them a ticket. That's what they do in traffic citations. It reminds you of George Floyd. That was a misdemeanor. They could have gave him a ticket for that. But when it's black people in America, they engage in the most use of force. And it ends up with deadly consequences. And that's why we're here today. And so, without further ado, I'm going to have Attorney Jeff Storms address you briefly, and then we're going to get to uh, Falonis uh, and Brandon and Rodney Floyd talking about 
what advice they can give to this family. And then you're going to hear from this mother, father, and this mother of Dante Wright. Attorney Jeff Storms. And we actually have some other breaking news that we want to get to in this case. The officer who allegedly shot and killed 20-year-old Dante Wright in a Minneapolis suburb has actually resigned her position. She previously was placed on administrative leave. Officials in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, are now giving a press conference on that. Let's listen. Uh, a, an eventful uh, uh, several hours uh, for our city. We are still experiencing uh, trauma in our community uh, from the events uh, that unfolded, uh, which led to the uh, killing of Dante Wright. Yesterday, I was able to speak with Dante Wright's uh, father and express our condolences on behalf of the city. I want to bring you all up to speed on uh, a number of events that transpired yesterday, uh, including events that transpired today. Uh, our, that is our commitment, is to continue to be open and transparent and continue by, to provide information on this evolving uh, crisis. Yesterday, the uh, City Council of Brooklyn Center uh, met uh, in session and took uh, a series of actions to address the uh, current uh, crisis. That included uh, a vote in which uh, the council uh, voted to uh, streamline the uh, chain of command uh, with the department and uh, voted to uh, according to our city, in accordance with our city charter, uh, have the command of the police uh, department uh, under the uh, uh, office of the mayor. That was the, the first action uh, the council took. The council then uh, took action to uh, relieve the city manager of his duties. As you all know, the city manager uh, had uh, responsibility and command over the police department until yesterday. The city council also uh, passed a resolution yesterday uh, uh, in, in support of um, uh, relieving the uh, police chief and the uh, officer uh, who, who um, was involved in the, in the shooting. As of this morning, uh, we have the uh, resignation. Uh, we have received a resignation a letter from Officer Kim Porter. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we have also received a letter of re re resignation uh, from the police chief. Right. Can you two come up? So, uh, so with with the uh, police chief's uh, resignation, uh, we're going to uh, appoint uh, two of our senior commanders uh, to play uh, critical leadership roles in uh, leading the department through this crisis. Um, 
Commander uh, Tony Groning is going to be the acting chief, and uh, Commander Garrett uh, Plesland is uh, going to assist the chief uh, uh, with regards to handling uh, this current uh, crisis. And so that is the update. Those are the updates we have for you uh, at the moment. If you have any questions, uh, we're happy to stand for questions. Mayor, two questions. First, can you have uh, the acting chief say his name and spell it? And were they sworn in moments ago while we were waiting for this news conference to start? Uh, my, what? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, did you want me to? Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mary. I'm just trying yeah, to please go ahead. Uh, just uh, say your name. Spell your name. Tony Grunig, T O N Y G R U E N I G. Hey, Commander, did you want to spell your name as well? You are the, you're now the precept of the microphone, so we can hear Sorry, Acting Police Chief, yes. And how long have you been with the department? 19 years. What's on your heart stepping into this new role at a time like this? I don't have any prepared statements. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to step forward and fill a leadership role right now. Go for the Lord. I understand. That's why I say I don't like asking how you feel, so that's what it means. Sure, yeah. You know, it's it's very chaotic right now. You know, we were just informed less than a half hour ago or an hour ago about the whole the change in status. Um, there's just a lot of chaos going on right now. We're just trying to wrap our heads around the situation and try and create some calm, right? And that can kind of transition into, we'd like some calm for the community, just some pause and community calming as we as we try and wrap our heads around the entire situation. Mayor, I have a question for you. The, let me just say the acting chief here um, has uh, uh, spent a lot of time working uh, in the community, working with the community. He's someone who knows Brooklyn Center well. Uh, has uh, probably, I would say, more than any other, um, any any other person in the department has a, a very strong commitment uh, to to working directly with the community to help resolve issues. He's done that throughout his career. Uh, that is why he is the uh, the right person to uh, step forward and take on uh, this role at this time. And Mayor, let me ask: it, Since Officer Potter was allowed to resign, is she allowed to keep her pension? And can she join another police department? You know, I, I do not have the answer to that. I do not know that. Yeah, I can believe that going police protocol might be able to answer. Uh, are you no, prepared I, to speak I, to that? No, I, I can't. I don't know okay. the situation in her uh, benefits yeah. package. If she so, so we, so that that's that's uh, information we can get back to you on. Mayor, how does this change the situation for the department now that the officer has formally resigned? How does that change things going forward for your department, for the city rather? Well. Uh, you know, I what I what I understand is that uh, the the officer stepping down uh, has the effect, I think, of uh, uh, speaking to to one of the the, the 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 things that the community that folks who have been uh, out here uh, uh, protesting uh, have been calling for. And that is uh, that the officer should be uh, relieved of her duties. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this will help uh, bring some calm to, uh, to the community. Although, uh, you know, I think ultimately people want justice. They want, you know, full accountability under the law. Uh, and so that's what we're going to continue to work for. Uh, we have to, you know, make sure that um, justice is served, uh, justice is done. Uh, Dante Wright, you know, deserves that. His family deserves that. And, you know, I'm appreciative of, of uh, the officer, uh, you know, stepping down uh, and, and, and saying that, you know, she felt that was the right thing to do, uh, right thing to do for, for the community. And, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. Did the city ask her to resign? Um, we, we did not ask her to resign. Uh, that was a decision uh, she made. When did she make this decision, and did she get wind that you were planning to terminate her? I do not know if uh, she got wind of uh, an impending termination or not. Um, you know, she 
you know, I believe informed uh, the city uh, this morning at approximately uh, 9.56 this morning. At 9.56 a.m. this morning. Mayor, what kind of message are you hoping these personnel changes send to the community, especially specifically the police chief? Well, certainly, I mean, you know, we... <laughs> We, we, we want to send the message to the community that uh, we're taking the situation very seriously. Uh, although, although things did not unfold the way uh, we, we thought ultimately they should unfold, uh, we're, we're hoping that we're turning over a new leaf now. Uh, I'm confident in that. I think that you know, we're going to develop uh, uh, an approach uh, that is community-based. Uh, that is uh, based on working with the very strong voices in our, commu in our community, uh, people who are influencers in our community, uh, in partnering directly with uh, the police department, uh, partnering directly with the, with the leadership uh, to try and um, at the same time provide uh, people the opportunity to uh, speak up and deliver their grievances to government, uh, but to do so in a way uh, you know, that their anger is channeled uh, to, to protesting, um, and, and we, want, we want the community uh, to know that um, this leadership uh, for the department here, uh, these are two individuals who are, uh, and, and the acting chief in particular, uh, they both are committed, committed to engaging uh, the community, engaging people who are out here protesting, and that's the message uh, we, we want to send. Uh, we think that we can do both. We can keep the community safe. And we can do that by working with uh, the, the community and, and working with leaders. And, and who is ultimately in charge now? Is it you? Is it the city council? Is it the acting city manager? There seemed to be some confusion about that yesterday. There's no, um, okay, let me clear that up. So uh, I, I am in charge, ultimately. Um, obviously, the uh, acting city manager uh, has day-to-day uh, -to -day responsibilities. Uh, over the, uh, the the department, and um, uh, and and uh, and you know, so so that is the chain of command. I got a question. So can I ask Will, you about the? Uh, the do you guys plan on removing that blue thin line flag from the in front of the police station? That is for all three of you. Any of you three can answer that question. I'll answer that. Uh, I have gotten a number of inquiries about uh, the flag. Uh, I've, I've gotten inquiries from the ACLU of Minnesota, um, requests, uh, you know, to have that flag taken down uh, because they see it and, and the community sees it as uh, inflammatory. And so uh, with people coming to the department expressing their anger uh, and, and seeing the flag, uh, you know, we don't want the flag to um, be a flashpoint that, you know, Angers people and and does that in a way that uh, you know that that you know that they're 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 going to come to the to the department um, and so we've asked the flag to be removed. Uh, has the flag been removed? Yes. I'm, I'm not sure, Mr. Mayor, but we will check. Okay. I, I my understanding is that. Um, do you know? Do you know whether the, no, the blue no, flag has? No, okay, you're not aware. Time. Okay. The first I've heard of it. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I do believe that the 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 flag is is no longer there, and and what's there is uh, the American flag. So one of the controversies, uh, in addition obviously to the killing of, of Dante, was the way the police responded to the peaceful protesters, tear gas and rubber bullets. Now that you're in charge, can you uh, ensure us that we're not going to see a repeat of that tonight? This is uh, a very, very difficult uh, question to answer, quite honestly. Our city council passed a resolution yesterday. I, I forgot to, to say this earlier. Um, and that resolution, I don't have the language uh, in front of me right now, uh, but that resolution uh, spoke to what our officers are allowed to do and are not allowed to do. Uh, could you, can you find that resolution for me, please? Thank you. Well, I, 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 will, I, I, will, I will reference uh, what, what the res resolution says uh, in terms of how our officers can behave. One thing I want you all to know is that prior to this uh, 
situation. There was a, a regional central command uh, set up related to the George, I'm sorry, the uh, Derek, Derek Chauvin trial. Uh, and that, that operation uh, has been mobilized uh, to respond here in Brooklyn Center. There, there, there's a regional command center uh, that has uh, command and jurisdiction um, over the, uh, the, the, the state patrol, uh, the, the joint uh, uh, law enforcement agencies that are acting in Brooklyn Center, including, including the state patrol, the National Guard, uh, and the uh, Hennepin County Sheriff's uh, Department. And so they are, they are given orders to uh, respond uh, using uh, tear gas and, and rubber bullets. And we have not given those orders here in Brooklyn Center. One, thank you. One thing I, I will say is uh, we, we are committed to not using those forms of, of, and those tactics. Uh, let me just say what the language in the Brooklyn Center's uh, City Council resolution uh, says. And this is a resolution limiting police crowd control tactics during protest. Um, it says, um, you know, whereas the city of Brooklyn Center is, is uh, Brooklyn Center experienced a tragic incident which started a peaceful protest, and whereas locations uh, can limit police tactics uh, and brutality in response to protests. Uh, to protect civilians and maintain their rights to protest, uh, whereas given the violence police uh, perpetuate, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, against uh, protesters, it should uh, even less, it should be even less of a, a priority uh, to issue curfew enforcements, uh, and curfew enforcements can lead to um, an excuse for more arrest and violence, so we want to be careful how we're uh, instituting curfews uh, against people who are uh, protesting peacefully. It's one thing when, when people are protesting peacefully, it is another. Let me just be clear, uh, if, peaceful, if, if people are not protesting peacefully and they're engaged in, uh, you know, uh, in any kind of uh, use of force against law enforcement, I just want to say that there, are, uh, there, there is a difference there that we, we recognize. Um, so, so, so the so so the city of Brooklyn Center prohibits the use of tear gas and other chemicals. Uh, the city of Brooklyn Center bans other violent uh, crowd control uh, uh, and dispersion techniques, uh, such as the use of rubber bullets uh, as a tool against uh, protesters. Uh, the tactics of uh, kettling, also uh, known as police lines, to arrest large numbers of of people. Um, in regulating uh, crowd control techniques, the city of Brooklyn Center bans uh, violent tactics such as chokeholds and implementing harsher punishments for the use of, uh, of uh, for the use of those uh, maneuvers. Uh, the Brooklyn Center uh, Police Department should uh, not prevent people from videotaping them. The Brooklyn Center Police Department uh, should not be able uh, to cover up their badge numbers to avoid. Uh, accountability for violence toward the protesters. Now, there, there are no instances that I know of where any of our officers have, have engaged in, in, in that, in covering up batch numbers or, or trying to avoid accountability. I just want to be very clear about that. But uh, these are, this is the resolution that the, the City Council passed, and, and these do uh, reflect our values. Mr. Mayor, Thank yesterday you, you said you wanted her badge, and you repeated this morning on our broadcast that you wanted Officer Potter fired. Why was she allowed to resign, and why didn't you fire her instead? Well, uh, I, I just want to be clear that um, uh, in in order in order for us to to make that decision, uh, we we were going through our own uh, processes to make sure that uh, that that internally uh, we had. Um, all of the documentation in order, uh, in order to be able to do that. But, you know, the officer uh, resigned, and, and so we, we have that resignation at this moment. And because she resigned, what does this mean for her legal representation? Will she still be allowed to use the union if she is, in fact, charged? Because she resigned, what does this mean? I don't know the answer to that, um, but that is, that is a question that we, we will get back to you on.
Chief Brother, can I move off the uh, son for a few times? I'm just really concerned that the acting chief here, he can't wrap his head around that. What went on with Dante Wright? I wrap my head around it every day. So we don't need him back the part. We need him to be the part. We need him to have empathy, sympathy, and compassion. And you need to look yourself in the mirror and speak to your own core of your heart. If it was your kid, how would you feel? What would you do? And you all keep traumatizing us over and over again. And you can't wrap your brain around it. But yet you go home to your kids and wife every day. And I'm the last boy without a child. When Sandra Bland got killed, I could wrap my head, my heart, and everything around it. And my son was living then. I'm going to need you to do more than just wrap your mind around it. That's what I'm going to need you to do. Because, see, it's corrupt cops here in Brooklyn Park and in the state of Minnesota. And it's a deadly state for black, brown, and indigenous people. But you can't wrap your head around it. But you go home and you wrap your arms around your kids every day. Every day. I'm going to need you to wrap your mind around it. I'm going to need you to get in tune. I'm going to need you to put your boots on the ground and act like you care about black, brown, and indigenous bodies. That's right. Act like it's today with your kids. No more racial profiling. No more just because you're black, because you're brown. No more. I'm sick and I'm tired. And it's people like you and you. You can look away all you want to. I'm talking to you too. It's people like you. That causes our families, yeah. causes yeah. us to suffer. Right. You don't know what it's like. It's right. You don't know what it feels like. I'm sick of you all. You know, you can take the trash out, but it has a way of recycling itself mm. and coming right back. Mm. I'm tired of it. Mm. Get rid of the trash, man. Mm. Right. Amen. Well, thank you. Um, so, as of, I mean, as of this moment, I, I don't believe any officer, right? Is so that's the mayor of Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, Mike Elliott there, uh, talking about the police shooting of Dante Wright. A lot came out of that conference, uh, but the big headline here is that the officer involved, Kim Porter, has resigned, as has the police chief. I want to go to Alex Perche for a little bit more on what came out of that press conference. And Alex, it sounds like from what the mayor is saying, as far as he knows, this was a voluntary resignation by Kim Porter. They didn't ask her to resign. She volunteered to hand in her badge this morning. That's, that's right, Diane. Officer Potter uh, handed in her uh, resignation or tendered her resignation letter uh, just before 10 this morning. Now, we, we heard the press conference yesterday where uh, Mayor Elliott said that he would support her being relieved of her duties. But again, uh, they said today that he did not call for her to resign, that this was on uh, uh, on, her, on, on her own. And we actually have a copy of the, that letter, and I want to read a portion to you, uh, Officer Potter saying, I have loved every minute of being a police officer and serving this community to the best of my ability, but I believe it is in the best interest of the community, the department, and my fellow officers if I resign immediately. Uh, so again, um, Officer Potter resigning along with the police chief, the acting police chief at the press conference, we just heard him uh, describing this as chaotic, that they were just informed of a lot of these changes uh, about 30 minutes prior. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, Brooklyn Center um, dealing dealing with a lot this afternoon. They sure are. Alex Perche live outside the courtroom of the Derek Chauvin trial in Minneapolis for us. Alex, thank you. When we come back, we're going to have more on the Dante Wright case and the trial against Derek Chauvin. Stay with us. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it.
The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier Podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back to ABC News Live's continuing coverage of the trial of Derek Chauvin. I'm Diane Macedo. And I'm Terry Moran. This is the day the defense of in its case, and defense lawyer Eric Nelson, on behalf of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, has called four witnesses so far. And these are eyewitnesses, the defense's eyewitnesses, both to the May 2020 arrest that led to the death of George Floyd and also to a previous arrest. And what they're trying to get out of these eyewitnesses are little points uh, of fact that they believe uh, show their theory of the case, that George Floyd had used drugs, had done so previously in a previous arrest, uh, and that in the 2020 arrest, May 2020 arrest, he'd fallen asleep in his vehicle, evidence, perhaps, the, uh, the defense will argue, of some opiate uh, action in his body. Uh, what they're going to do at some point is then bring experts into knit together this eyewitness testimony and any other that they have, along with the points that Eric Nelson believes he got out of prosecution witnesses on cross-examination. So this is Derek Chauvin's defense, and it focuses on the character and conduct of George Floyd. And we're joined now by Mayor Victoria Woodard. Of the, uh, she's the mayor of Tacoma, Washington. This is a city that's seen its own share of protests, both in response to George Floyd's death, but also the local death of Manuel Ellis, who died in police custody last spring. Uh, mayor Woodard, thank you for being here. We just heard the latest uh, on the police shooting of Dante Wright. The officer involved, Kim Potter, just resigned along with the police chief. Uh, I first, before we want to shift over to, uh, to the Derek Chauvin case, I want to get your reaction to that, what you just heard and the general take from the police department in that case, that this was an accident and that Porter, uh, Potter rather thought she was firing her taser. Well, I certainly understand that, but um, that 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 explanation doesn't work for the family who's lost a son. But I certainly, as as we have done here in Tacoma, obviously call for a very thorough and independent investigation to figure out exactly what happened. I also there there are those of us who are talking across the country as mayors about having conversations about the redesigning of the taser. So this will never happen again. We know it's happened before, um, but it's just it is a it is yet another horrible tragedy in our country um, that just continues to happen. And we just we've got to do better as a country. We've got to hold our officers accountable as a country, and we've got to we've got to think more of the lives of black African, of black Americans in this country um, and what they experience. And Mayor Woodard, when you see the civil unrest that we're seeing in Minnesota right now, uh, it does feel like a threshold has been crossed almost in, in that progress that, that you're talking about the country needs to make. People just have just had it. And, and when an incident like that comes up, especially so many of them now on video, uh, it's, yeah. it, it has just crossed a line. Well, what's your reaction, both as a community leader, as, as mayor of Tacoma, and, and as a black woman with all that experience? Absolutely. Well, cer certainly, there, there, people are tired. Um, and, 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 you know, you kind of, we say enough is enough. And you think when you say enough is enough, it won't happen again, but it continues to happen. Um, here in Tacoma, um, with when when the George uh, Floyd case, you know, when, when the incident happened, and then we learned of the Manny Ellis incident, and, and people took to the streets in Tacoma. I will say one thing I appreciated about that is that you can take to the streets. You can protest. You can make your voices heard, but it doesn't need to be in a destructive way. Now, what I hope we don't do as a country is continue to focus only on the destruction and not the reason why people are so upset and angry and hurt um, and, and heartbroken. So 
Um, when I say to the people who want to protest, please, please try to do it peacefully. Please do it peacefully, because if not, then it detracts from the message that we're trying to send, which says that this is unacceptable. So, so if you, I, I, I agree. Take to the streets. Make your voices heard. Don't give up until things change. But let's do it peacefully, because at the end of the day, when we break out windows and we do that and we do those kinds of things and we loot, that takes away from the message. And the other thing I'll say, and we saw this in the summer, is the reality is, is that. <clears throat> The people who are marching are not always the people who are, are, are breaking the windows and, and looting. So let's not all also assign that blame to everyone who's calling for change. And Mayor Woodard, we heard from Mayor Mike Elliott of Brooklyn Center there saying that he supports peaceful protests, that, that, that he very much supports it, in fact, but that he's drawing the difference, as you are, between that and between, uh, you know, people who are coming out primarily at night here and, and starting with destruction and perhaps violence. So what's your advice to Mayor Elliott as he seeks, as he says, to try to support people's right to peaceful protest while also trying to kind of lower the temperature that's coming out at night in his city? Absolutely. People, number one, people need to feel like they're being heard. So he needs to, he needs he needs to continue to um, to answer their questions and to be to be um, as transparent as he can and share as much information he as he has when he gets it. Um, and then continuing to call for people to be peaceful. For me, it wasn't just calling for people to be peaceful. I actually went out and marched with people in the streets um, during our protest. And then I also encourage people to continue to protest um, and so and to continue to peacefully protest we had protests in Tacoma before um, George Floyd and Manuel Ellis maybe 200 people we had tens of thousands of people protesting in Tacoma and for for 99 percent of the time it was peaceful and that was true uh, at protests across the country there were there was Absolutely. violence there was violence on some of the edges of the, but the vast majority of protests last year were peaceful, which is some, a message that doesn't get out enough. But let me ask you about, about the fix. What we hear is uh, police reform, defund the police, change the nature of policing in, in America. What does it look like to you when you think as a mayor as to how we begin to take practical steps to change? Well, you know, I can tell you what we're what we're doing here in Tacoma, and it's doing more than just just the basics, right? So we've we've done the eight can't wait, we've signed the Obama's pledge, and are sticking to that. But we're calling for accountability at every level. Um, here in Tacoma, here in Washington State, not only are we looking at things locally, but we've just had what I think is a great um, session as our as our legislature gets ready to be done with session. But we implemented a lot of state laws about police accountability. One of the things that was a number one priority for Tacoma is independent investigations across the state of Washington. Well, that passed out of the House and the Senate and will be going to the governor's desk. And those are the kinds of fixes that, that, will, that will get us to the change and the transformation we want to see. But we knew that that wasn't just at our doorstep as a city. We had to make time and make it a priority to lobby and talk with our state legislators about the kinds of changes we need them to implement so that we can make a difference here in the everyday lives of the people who call our city home. And, and Mayor Woodard, this is all happening in the backdrop of this ongoing trial against Derek Chauvin, charged with the death of George Floyd. So how do you think this trial will impact this larger discussion about policing that's really going on around the country? Well, you know, it, it, it all depends on the outcome. I mean, but the fact, I guess for a lot of families, the fact that there is a trial shows that there's a change. The fact that, that we're actually going to court to hold someone accountable for taking the life of an African-American man is different. Um, but we're going to wait for the outcome. And this is but one case. This is, this is the largest case, you know, the biggest case that we're looking at right now. These incidents are happening across the country. Um, and we've got to make sure that not only happens in Minneapolis, but in every other state and city across this country, that police are held accountable accountable um, when these kinds of um, incidents take place. And, and Mayor, what is, there's so much uh, anguish and anger, uh, obviously, around these incidents that we now, as I say, see so, so much. As you look towards the, uh, the future 
Are you optimistic or, or less optimistic that, that we can make some progress that makes a difference for the people who are hurting? Absolutely. Well, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, I have to be in this line of work because if we only focus on what isn't happening um, or what won't happen, we will be lost in despair and I would never leave my home. So I have to believe, um, especially with the people who stood up this past summer and over the past year, um, the eyes that have been opened and the fact that a lot of people are calling for justice and not just people who look like me. I have to believe that there is a change coming. But what I will say is that we didn't get here overnight and we're not, like, we're not gonna change it overnight. So we've got to stay diligent. We've got to make sure that even after the George Floyd trial, no matter what happens, that we are still making sure that we are holding our police officers accountable and that we're making the transformational changes that need to be made. Because let's be clear, the community is not the only one who wants to transform. I know that there are police officers across the country in my own city who want to see this transformation happen. They didn't sign up um, for what's happening now. So I believe we all want to see it. We have just got to stay diligent and not give up up. We've got to continue to push the needle, continue to, to, to call for change, and to continue to work for change, because it's not just what will affect us, it's what's going to affect our grandchildren um, and our great-grandchildren. We've got to leave this country better than when we found it. All right. Mayor Victoria Woodard of Tacoma, Washington, we so appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's our pleasure. And the trial of Derek Chauvin is set to resume in just a few minutes. When we come back, we'll have a look at what to expect from the rest of the day. We'll be right back. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, all our patients, how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. A Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their <laughs> shoes, then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Welcome back to ABC News Live's coverage, continuing coverage of the trial against Derek Chauvin, charged in the death of George Floyd. Trial has just resumed after the lunch break, so let's listen in to what's happening in the courtroom. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Please. If you would. Thank you. And if you could begin, uh, let's make sure the microphone is pointed towards you. There you go. 
If you could begin by giving us your full name, spelling each of your names. Barry Vance Broad, B-A-R-R-Y, V-A-N-C-E, B-R-O-D-D. Mr. Nelson. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Broad. Afternoon. Uh, are you currently employed? I am. And where are you so employed? I'm self-employed as I own a consulting company, BVB and Associates. And uh, what do you, what areas uh, do you consult in? Uh, police practices and use of force. All right. Now, uh, did you have a career as a police officer prior to starting your company? I did. Can you, for the jury, please describe generally your education that you received in order to become a police officer? So I have a bachelor's degree in law enforcement from George Mason University, which is in Fairfax, Virginia. I have a California Community College teaching credential from San Francisco State University, and I'm a graduate of the Labor Management Relations Program at University of California at Davis. Okay. And uh, did you serve as a licensed police officer in various capacities? I did. When did you start your law enforcement career? So when I graduated college, I was a seasonal police officer in Ocean City, Maryland. And I was a deputy sheriff for six months with the Onta County Sheriff's Office in Arlington, Virginia, assigned to the custody division. And I was hired by the United States Park Police, which is a law enforcement branch of the Department of Interior. Is that a federal law enforcement agency? That is a federal law enforcement agency. Okay. And I started my career with the Park Police in Washington, D.C., and then I was transferred to San Francisco Field Office in 1977. Then I went on loan to an undercover drug task force in Marin County, California. And then I went to Santa Rosa Police Department in 1982. And how long were you with the Santa Rosa Police Department? Then? 22 years. I had 29 years total law enforcement experience. All right. Um, in your capacity as a police officer, do you have any specialized training or experience? I did. And what is that? So I had special assignments as with the Park Police. I was certified by the FBI as a defensive tactics instructor in 1978. I started teaching in the Santa Rosa Public Safety Training Center, and I also taught law enforcement rangers throughout the western region of the National Park Service. Can you explain um, what defensive tactics, tactics is generally? So when you look at the topic of use of force, that could include handcuffing, hands-on techniques, baton techniques, handcuffing, pain compliance, and under the use of force umbrella, there's also firearms, but I focused almost entirely on the defensive tactics portion of use of force. And so um, you, you testified that you taught defensive tactics that you called it the, uh, I believe, the Regional Training Center? Uh, it's, it is a regional academy, but the official name is the Santa Rosa Public Safety Training Center. Can you and, describe what that is? So a uh, recruit police officer would attend the training center for their California Post Basic Academy certification. Um, National Park Service Rangers also attended that academy. Corrections officers attend that academy, probation officers, and there's also a EMS component. Firefighters go to that academy, and it also services in-service training. In service is uh, training for uh, licensed officers? Yes. To meet their continuing education credits? Yes. And how long did you teach there? 35 years. Uh, in the use of force always? Yes, in what, addition to other topics. What were the other topics that you trained? Uh, weapons laws, interview and interrogation techniques, um, collision scene preservation, Verbal judo, tactical communication skills, or some of the others. What, what's verbal judo? So it is actually a, Dr. George Thompson developed the program shortly after the Rodney King incident, thinking that police officers needed better tools to communicate with people. So verbal judo created an outline on how an officer who would make a traffic stop could use verbal skills to overcome a person's potential noncompliance. Did you also um, 
teach or uh, in crowd control, crowd management type issues? I did. So well, the topics I taught at the training center was defensive tactics, crowd control, chemical agent, impact weapons, and a variety of the other topics that I just discussed earlier. Okay. And so you did that for 35 years while you were still uh, actively a peace officer? So I taught while I was a police officer, and then when I retired in 2004, I continued teaching in the training center for another nine years. All right. Do you have uh, any, have you received any certifications throughout the course of your career? Uh, several. Can you describe for the jury some of the certifications that you've held? So I have a post basic, intermediate, and advanced certificates. And then as far as instructor certifications, I was certified by the FBI as a defensive tactics instructor. I was certified by the California Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission as a defensive tactics instructor. And through California Post, I was also an impact weapon instructor, chemical agent instructor, less lethal munition instructor, verbal judo instructor, pepper spray instructor, to name, I can't remember them all. Okay. Um, do you, so can you describe the nature of your uh, private practice, so to speak, in terms of the use of force? Um, I take cases from plaintiffs and defendants in civil cases and criminal cases. I do use of force consulting for a variety of public defenders offices in California, and I was also a member of the, I was a use of force consultant for the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. Okay. Have you um, been involved in prior cases to review the uses of force? I've had a little bit over 140 cases that I was actively involved in. Okay. Have you provided testimony in courts uh, throughout the United States? I have. Or other arbitrative type civil hearings? Yes. Can you uh, tell me the number of times that you've testified in either civil or criminal cases? So since 2016, I've testified in court, either criminal or civil, both state and federal, 10 times. Um, and in terms of other types of hearings, depositions, uh, things of that nature, do, do you testify there as well? Yes. Um, can you describe some of the states where you have previously uh, testified? Uh, Illinois, California, Hawaii, and that's about it. Have you ever been hired on a case here in Minnesota? Yes. And who hired you in that particular case? Uh, Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. Now you're being paid for your services, correct? Yes. Can you tell the jury your hourly rate and the number of hours you've uh, spent on this case? I've spent roughly 60 hours. I make $350 an hour for courtroom appearances and $275 an hour for case reviews. And how much have you, uh, what's the total about you've earned so far? Uh, in this case, $11,400. Now, simply because you're being paid, does that mean you're going to always buy a particular party? Does that mean you're always going to side with that party? No. In your career, have you ever uh, been retained by someone and found their use of force to be improper? On uh, several times. How is it that you became involved in this particular case? When this incident first occurred, I reached out to the city attorney's office here in Minneapolis, told them that I had some... Overruled. I had some exposure to the George Floyd incident, and I was offering my services to the Minneapolis city attorney's office. And you were ultimately not retained by the city attorney's office or the state, correct? That's correct. Um, you then were retained by my uh, office? Yes. Right. When you were retained, did I, were you provided with a scope of your engagement? I was. Could you explain for the jury the scope of your engagement in this particular case? You asked me to analyze the actions of Derek Chauvin and give opinions regarding his conduct and actions towards Mr. Floyd. Okay. 
can you describe uh, the materials that you reviewed uh, in order to analyze this case? So I received thousands of pages of materials, but I've learned through my experience that I don't need to review materials that really don't have anything to do with the officer or the officer's policies or the use of force policies. So I've pretty much focused my review on the videos, the snapshots of the body ward cameras that the officers were wearing, uh, miscellaneous statements, the use of force policies, and training records. So when you say there were some materials that were not relevant to your analysis, can you just kind of give a general example of what that would be? Uh, horse manor patrol responsibilities, um, vehicle maintenance responsibilities, things of that nature. Okay. But anything pertaining directly to your analysis in this case, you did review? I did review. Okay. Now, based upon uh, your training and experience and your expertise in the use of uh, force matters, um, your review of the materials that have been provided to you, have you formed opinions in this particular case to a reasonable, de reasonable degree of professional certainty? I have. And can you just briefly overview your opinions in this particular case? I felt that Derek Chauvin was justified and was acting with objective reasonableness following Minneapolis Police Department policy and current standards of law enforcement and his interactions with Mr. Floyd. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot over the last couple of weeks about the Graham versus Connor factors. Are you familiar with the Graham versus Connor factors? I am. And can you just very briefly um, provide your definition and your uh, how you look at those factors. So in my 35 years of teaching, it's not just dealing with tactics, but it's dealing with providing an officer the mindset that what they need to justify to use various tactics that they were trained in. And the standard of Graham versus Connor is, you know, what would a reasonable officer have done in a similar set of circumstances that you're doing. Now the Graham versus Connor factor is it, the first one is the severity of the crime at issue, correct? Yes. How do you analyze that Graham versus Connor factor? So I know in my experience and the experience of officers that I've been in contact with is that the higher risk an arrest may be, like say an armed bank robber. You know, armed bank robber, you would pull your gun, order them to the ground to take them into custody. Okay, you know their danger, you know their threat level right off the bat. Whereas I can't imagine how many times I've been exposed to personally or have seen other officers dealing with a simple thing as a traffic stop or a jaywalking violation or some minor offense and they end up in a fight for their life just because of the conduct of the individual they're contacting. So in terms of the severity of issue, is it always what was the initial response in your per or, or is it something that evolves over time? Well, the initial response, of course, is important, but it's really how the person you're interacting with as a law enforcement officer responds to you. Okay. And that's, does that go into the second gram factor? It the, does, the imminent threat. Right. And can you just explain the imminent threat factor? So imminent is, from a police officer standpoint, you don't have to wait for it to happen. You just have to have a reasonable fear that somebody's either going to strike you, stab you, shoot you. So you try to plan to deal with the imminent threat, and then you adjust your tactics accordingly based upon how the suspect is reacting to you. Okay. And the third gram uh, factor is whether the suspect is actively resisting or attempting to evade, correct? That's correct. And can you explain that to the jury? So again, the level of resistance is commensurate with how they resist you justifies an officer to use a variety of tools on their tool belt. So if a suspect is resisting your efforts to handcuff them and they spin away and try to punch you, an officer doesn't have to go fist on fist with them. The officer's allowed to escalate to use an impact weapon, taser, pepper spray, or other tools. Now, in terms of, again, the um, 
the analysis of Graham versus fa of Connor, are there other factors or components of that analysis that are relevant? Yes. Can you explain some of those? So as you're reviewing an incident such as this, you have to try to see it through the eyes of the officers on the scene. You know, what factors were they dealing with? What circumstances? What was the suspect doing? What were onlookers doing? Were there environmental hazards? And then try to put yourself in the officer's shoes to see what they, the decisions they made, were they objectively reasonable or not? So it's, you would agree with the other uh, people who've testified in this case that the standard involves objective reasonableness? Agree? Yes, I do. Based on the totality of facts and circumstances of this case? That were present to the officer at the time. And a view from a reasonable police officer on the scene? Yes. And what, a, what about hindsight? So it's easy to sit and judge in an office on an officer's conduct. It's more of a challenge to, again, put yourself in the officer's shoes to try to make an evaluation through what they're feeling, what they're sensing, the fear they have, and then make a determination. And does that prohibit or preclude a review of a police officer's conduct? No, not a review, no. Now, when you approach a uh, use of force case such as this, do you apply a particular methodology in order to uh, in order to analyze the Graham versus Connor factors? I do. And can you explain for the jury the methodology that you've used in your previous cases or in your career? So it's a pretty simple review. So I look at when the officer contacted the individual. Did the officer have legal authority for a detention? So let's talk about a traffic stop. If somebody runs a stop sign, police officer has the right to detain you. Do a citation. You as the person running the stop sign doesn't have the right to resist the officer. So anything that would have evolved from a lawful detention, the officer has certain rights to continue the investigation. Now, a detention can, so detention you need reasonable suspicion for. To make an arrest, you need probable cause. So when I'm looking at use of force cases, I want to make sure that the officer had a, lethal, a lawful right to detain or probable cause to arrest. And um, in terms of the uh, lawful right to detain, you used the term, what was that term? Reasonable suspicion? Reasonable suspicion to detain. And what constitutes generally reasonable suspicion to detain? That you see an infraction or a misdemeanor or a felony, and the person that you're going to detain, you have a reasonable suspicion that they've committed an infraction or another crime. And in terms of probable cause to arrest, how would you define that? It's pretty much as the statement says that the person probably committed the crime. And so officers, when they make an arrest, they base it on probable cause. So in terms of um, putting a suspect in handcuffs, is that automatically an arrest? No. It, can it be a detention? Could be a detention. So the first, just to make sure I understand uh, your testimony, your first prong of your analysis is to determine whether the officer had justification to detain the suspect, correct? Yes. What's the second part of your analysis? Now, how does the suspect respond to the officer? If it's an arrest situation and the officer tells the suspect to turn around, put your hands behind your back or behind your head, and the suspect complies, and the officer handcuffs the suspect, that's good. If the suspect doesn't comply and they begin to resist, then I look at what level of the resistance did the suspect display to the officer, and then what did the officer do to overcome that resistance? Now, let's talk briefly in the second prong about the different types of uh, resistance that a suspect could uh, use. Can you describe the levels of resistance that you look for? So no resistance would be compliance. That's always the goal. Uh, the next level would be passive resistance, where a suspect, you tell the suspect to turn around, put their hands behind their back, and they don't. They're not resisting you, they're just being physically non-compliant, 
yet without any type of physical strength or any type of maneuvers that they may try to do to prevent you from handcuffing them. So the next level would be active resistance. So I go to put you into a handcuffing position and you pull your hands away or you struggle with me. So that's active resistance where they're using energy to prevent an officer from accomplishing their goal. And then now that same suspect who I want to handcuff pulls away from me and they swing at me. So that's active aggression. And all those cues are allowing me to start escalating up the ladder of force options I have available to me. Now, in terms of um, your experience um, in various jurisdictions, do use of force policies differ from city to city, state to state? They differ slightly. Um, usually deadly force policies are fairly consistent. Um, some agencies have more liberal use of force policies than others. Um, some agencies now are starting to adopt policies that you can't shoot at a moving vehicle if the only weapon is the vehicle itself. So there's a little bit of a learning curve there for agencies. Okay. So in terms of your, um, again, analysis, the first prong being whether there was a justification for the detention, the second prong being um, the level of resistance exhibited by the suspect, correct? Yes. And what's the third prong? What the officer did to overcome that resistance. So if somebody pulls away from you and they're actively resisting, does the officer pull out their baton and strike them in the head? That, to me, would be excessive. Okay. So was the officer's use of force proportionate to the level of resistance demonstrated by the suspect? Objectively reasonable, correct? Yes. All right. So in terms of your three-part analysis, did you apply that analysis to this case? I did. In your opinion, was this a use of deadly force? It was not. Can you explain that? So I'll give you an example that I used to teach my academy classes. So officers respond to a domestic violence situation and the suspect is still there and he fights with the sus he's, excuse me, he fights with the officers and the officers are justified in using a taser to overcome this person's noncompliance. They tase the individual and the individual falls to the ground, strikes their head and dies. So that isn't an incident of deadly force. That's an incident of an accidental death. And in my review, I would look to see whether the suspect's resistance to justify the use of the taser was objectively reasonable. Can you, um, can you describe what you would call control techniques? So control techniques are me putting my hands on you. And it could be, you know, escort position where I put my hand above your elbow and my hand on your wrist. It could be pain compliance techniques, which means I'm doing some joint manipulation on various parts of your body. And if you're doing what I'm asking you to do, it doesn't hurt. If you don't do what I'm asking you to do, I can motivate your compliance through pain compliance, stimulating you with pain. Now, in terms of your analysis of any case, you, um, I think you described this a little bit, but you, did you refer to kind of an increase of level of force to overcome the resistance? How would you describe that? Uh, police terminology is called one-upmanship. So, you know, police officers don't have to fight fair. They're allowed to overcome your resistance by going up a level or resorting to a different force option to let them accomplish the goal of getting you to comply. Are officers also required to de-escalate in certain circumstances? Yes. And, and can you describe the process of moving up or down that use of force? And it really, it's always in response to what a suspect is doing. So if they're fighting, you're fighting back. You're trying to control them. Once they're controlled, you reduce your justified levels of force, yet you're still in control of the person. Anybody you take into custody, you have to maintain control of. Uh, 
again, in terms of the use of force, what relevance does possible drug influence have in an analysis? Has quite a large impact, in my opinion. How so? Well, because people on the influence of drugs may not be hearing what you're trying to ask them to do. They may not understand. They may have erratic behavior. They may have total, they don't feel pain. So techniques you would normally use to, compl to com make somebody comply, they're not feeling. They may have superhuman strength, or they may have an ability to go from compliant to extreme non-compliance in a heartbeat. Do you train officers to keep drug-influenced uh, suspects handcuffed? I do. Why? So there's been many instances where handcuffs were removed from a drug-influenced suspect, and as soon as they were removed or some type of first aid measure started to be applied, the person is right back to fighting you, and you're in a fight for your life. So I've trained and I've been trained that when you're dealing with drug-influenced persons, they stay handcuffed until they're taken to a medical facility, if that's what the case may be, and they're putting soft restraints on a gurney so they can be treated. Can you describe the concept of situational awareness? Yes, you know, I kind of break it down that uh, a police, you know, most people's head should be on a swivel. You know, if you're walking down a street and you hear somebody running up behind you, your mind process, your mind thoughts shouldn't be, well, I wonder if they're going to tackle me, if they're going to rob me. No, you head on a swivel, which means you're cognizant of your awareness, see things that may be a threat or hazard to you, plan for them. And especially as a police officer, a police officer in uniform, stands for certain things. Unfortunately, criminals don't wear uniforms, so officers don't have the luxury of being able to look at somebody and automatically determining if they're going to be a threat or a risk to them or not. Does uh, the concepts of situational awareness come into or factor into your analysis? It does. How so? So what other threats are present besides the person that we're dealing with? Are there environmental hazards? Is there traffic going by on the street? Are there onlookers? Are there more people starting to focus on your arrest versus just walking down the sidewalk? Um, the officer's exhaustion level, you know, what are other officers doing? Things of that nature. Is an officer entitled to rely on information he or she receives from dispatch in formulating whether they're going to use force? In justifying force, I would say no. In preparing to deal with the situation they're being sent to by dispatch, then I would say yes. Okay. How does, how does that differ? differ? So an officer has to take into account what they see on the scene. Dispatchers do the best jobs they can, but they're usually only getting information over the telephone. And the information may be inaccurate, may be false, may be exaggerated. So it's up to the officer on the street to determine what is the best course of action. Okay. Have you reviewed um, Officer Chauvin's uses of force in this particular case, taking into consideration your analysis, as well as some of the concepts we've talked about? I have. And um, let's talk about um, Mr. Chauvin's uses of force. Where would you say the first use of force that Mr. Chauvin in, engaged in occurred? Uh, when he joined Officer King and Lane trying to put Mr. Floyd in the back seat of the patrol car. And in your view of that uh, use of force, um, what is your perspective on that? Uh, that Mr. Floyd's level of resistance was, it was objectively reasonable for those officers to do the techniques that they were doing. I felt that that level of resistance exhibited by Mr. Floyd justified the officers in higher levels use of force that they chose not to select. And would that be a, if an officer chooses not to use a higher level of force, is that a, a, an element of de-escalation? Objection leading. Rephrase. How does an officer's decision to use less force factor into an analysis of de-escalation techniques? 
So, you know, an officer sees an incident, feels it has these justification to use these tools that deal with the incident, but just due to the personality or the personal makeup of the officer, they chose not to. They try to expire a lesser technique to see if it'll work. And then if it doesn't work, then they escalate. Okay. Now, um, you, you've watched, you testified you've watched the videos in this case? Yes. Does that include the body-worn cameras of the Minneapolis police officers involved? It did. Did it include various bystander videos? Yes. And surveillance videos from area stores? Yes. And from your perspective, just generally, what are some of the limitations of camera analysis? So a body camera shows what the camera is pointing at. Um, it doesn't see what an officer may see in their peripheral vision, doesn't show what an officer is actually feeling through their hands or sensing through their levels of awareness. Um, and in low light situations, a body cam shutter responds to lighting situations quicker than the human eye does. Overruled. I'm, your last statement? About the, the shutter release on the body cam is that it adjusts quicker to lighting situations than the human eye does. Now, um, so in terms of the initial uses of force, the officer's efforts uh, to get Mr. Floyd into the car, you felt that they were objectively reasonable? I did. Did the use of force then continue after uh, Mr. Floyd was restrained on the ground? I don't consider a prone control as a use of force. Um, let's, let's back up just a second. The removal or um, Mr. Floyd's getting out of the vehicle, however that was, um, did it, did it, does that constitute a use of force? Um, the manhandling or the three officers taking Mr. Floyd out of the car and placing him on the ground, yes, that's a use of force. Was it justified or objectively reasonable in this particular case, according to your opinion? Yes. So when they brought Mr. Floyd to the ground, are you saying you don't consider that to be a use of force? Uh, up to that point, it was still a use of force, yes. Okay. Once Mr. Floyd is on the ground, in your opinion, does there continue to be some level of resistance by Mr. Floyd? Yes. How would you describe that? Um, active resistance. He was still struggling, the effort, struggling against the efforts of the officers. And I saw on one of the body cam videos that Mr. Floyd appeared to kick at Officer Lane. Is there a reason why officers would take a suspect, a res actively resisting suspect to the ground? Yes. Why? So officers are trained that any time you get resistance from a suspect or you're dealing with a high risk suspect, it's safer for you, the officer, and for the suspect to put him on the ground in a prone position face down for a variety of reasons, some of which are it makes the suspect's mobility diminished. They can't get up and run as quick. It takes away some of the use of their hands so they can't grab you without turning their body, which would give an officer time to react. Um, it limits what they can do with their feet. They can still kick, but they don't have as much mobility or power that they would if they were standing. Now, in terms of uh, this particular case, you understand Mr. Floyd was handcuffed at this point. Yes. Does the fact that Mr. Hand, Mr. Floyd was handcuffed somehow um, come into the analysis as to whether or not to put him into a prone position? No, any resistor, handcuffed or not, should go to the ground into a prone control position. And can you describe generally what you mean as a prone control position? So it's where the suspect either, in this case, handcuffed, handcuffs are behind the back, placed on their stomach and their chest, and officers are in a position to apply body weight to keep the suspect on the ground and to keep them further immobilized. Would it be common practice in that situation 
uh, to employ an MRT or hobble restraint? You're good. What would be the factors to determine whether or not an officer um, would employ such a technique? So can the officers control the person's legs? Does the person need to have their legs controlled in the situation they did? And could Officer Lane be successful in trying to control the legs? So those are part of the force option selections that they had to make. In terms of your familiar officers in this particular case, uh, considered the use of the MRT? Uh, they did. And they ultimately decided against it, correct? That's correct. How does that factor into, or the, the decision to not employ the MRT factor into the analysis? That it's one of those situations where they were justified in the maximum restraint and chose not to. So why they had that decision making, I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, Mr. Floyd had made comments about being claustrophobic. And I know in the teaching I've done with leg restraints, if you leg restrain somebody in training or on the street that is claustrophobic, it creates a reaction. How does the fact that um, EMS had been summoned factor into your analysis? That I think what I've read in the materials is that there was a fire station literally seconds, if not a minute to a minute and a half away. So if you have somebody that's under control and is need of medical attention and EMS who have the training and equipment to do a lot better job than police officers can do, um, that would be relevant to me that, okay, we call them, they're gonna be here instantaneously. Let's just kind of stabilize the situation and wait for the professionals to show up. Would a reasonable police officer, based on the reasonable police officer standard, is that a factor that uh, comes into the analysis, the, the EMS response time? Yes. What about a suspect um, keeping a, su a suspect in the prone position who is potentially drug impaired? Are there safety reasons to do that? Again, so as I discussed earlier, potential erratic behavior, going from compliant to non-compliant, um, not feeling any pain, potentially having superhuman strength, and it's just safer for the officer and for the suspect to keep them in that prone control. Why would it be safer for the suspect to keep them in that prone control? Because if they were to get up and run, handcuffed, trip and fall, sustain facial injuries, other injuries on the ground, their mobility is reduced, their ability to move is reduced, and the ability to hurt themselves is reduced. What, what if they became sick, for example? Prone control, instead of having somebody lay on their back where they could aspirate on vomit, prone control, their face is down, airway is clear. If they vomit, it's not gonna go down their trachea or down their throat. Now, you, you've obviously, in addition to watching the cameras, you heard what Mr. Floyd was saying at that time, right? Yes. And um, how do officers take into account uh, an analysis of words versus conduct? So you hear what the suspect is saying. So if I want Mr. Floyd to get in the back of the car, and he's saying, I will, I will, I will, but he's not and I'm trying to force him in, he says, I will, I will, but he's not, then his actions are telling me he's not getting in the car regardless of what he's saying. What about um, as Mr. Floyd was going into the car and there was this act of aggression as you've defined it, and Mr. Floyd at that point was saying he couldn't breathe, but he continued to say that later. How did the, how did the words he was saying initially comply or comport with his actions in that instant? You know, I have advanced first aid. I certainly don't have medical degrees, but I was always trained and feel it's a reasonable assumption that if, if somebody's, I'm choking, I'm choking, when well, you're not choking because you can breathe. If somebody's saying they can't breathe, yet it appears to me they're taking full breaths and they're shouting, to me, the layperson, they can breathe. Is that common, a common misunderstanding within the policing community? I believe it is, yes. Objection, lack of foundation, right? Overall. 
So in terms of um, a reasonable police officer standard again, is a reasonable police officer who has used force in an instant, can they consider that in uh, prolonging a detention or a prone control of a suspect? So if the officer was justified in using the prone control and now the suspect is on the ground in a prone control, the maintaining of the prone control to me is not a use of force. Why is it not a use of force? Because it's a control technique. Without, It, it doesn't hurt. Um, you've put the suspect in a position where it's safe for you, the officer, safe for them, the suspect, and you're using minimal effort to keep them on the ground. Now, you're familiar with the concept of positional asphyxia, correct? I am. Can you describe for the jury um, uh, what you train and have been trained that are the dangers of positional asphyxia? So the training I received is that a target person for positional asphyxia would be somebody who is very obese. And now you take that obese person and you handcuff them behind their back, really pulling their shoulders back, really constricting their rib cage. And if you put them face down on the ground, that would be the training model for somebody who could be prone to positional asphyxia. And when I was first in law enforcement and the training I initially did regarding leg restraints, is that you used to hobble a person's ankles, tie the ankles to the handcuffs, and then put the person face down, and that created even more pressure on the person's sternum and rib cage and reduced their ability to breathe. So that technique was modified to address the positional asphyxia issues. You would agree that the Minneapolis Police Department trains officers to place people in a recovery position, correct? Yes. And we would agree that that was, is based out of concerns of positional, positional asphyxia, agreed? Yes. Now, are there situations where a reasonable police officer would not put a person in the prone position into the recovery position? Yes. Can you describe what those may be? So in this situation, there was space limitations. Mr. Floyd was butted up against the tire of the patrol car. Um, there was traffic still driving down the street. Um, there were crowd issues that took the attention of the officers. Um, Mr. Floyd was still somewhat resisting, so I think those were relatively valid reasons to keep him in the prone. Now, in, term, in terms of um, your training, uh, again, as uh, that you have been trained and trained other officers uh, in the use of crowd control or crowd control issues, right? Yes. Um, how in law enforcement is a crowd defined? So a crowd is just like if you look at a football stadium. So it's a group of people gathered together for a common purpose. So a crowd, by definition, isn't unlawful. Um, and actually the law enforcement session is just two or more people constitute a crowd. So because it's not unlawful, it doesn't mean that it doesn't become a consideration for the officers. Okay. Um, can you explain in your analysis how you think the crowd or this group of people that had uh, gathered around and were watching uh, affected the officers in their use of force? So we kind of go back to the situa situational awareness issue is that, yes, the officers are dealing with Mr. Floyd, but there's also other factors for them to consider. And in this case, the crowd started to grow in size, started to become more vocal. So now officers are always trained to deal with, right, so what threat is the biggest threat? Is it the suspect on the ground in front of me in handcuffs? that we have relatively control? Or is it the unknown threat posed by the crowd that could go from verbal to trying to interfere with my arrest process in a matter of seconds? Did you factor that into um, your analysis of this case? I did. How did it, how, how so? I could see that Officer Chauvin's focus started to move from Mr. Floyd to the crowd. To one point, I think Officer Chauvin felt threatened enough that he withdrew his pepper spray canister and gave verbal commands to the crowd to stay back. 
So now he's dealing with the bigger threat. So um, just to kind of wrap up, could you summarize the final opinions that you have made in this case? I felt that Officer Chauvin's interactions with Mr. Floyd were following his training, following current practices in policing, and were objectively reasonable. Thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Slisher. Sure. So the court goes to a sidebar there. Uh, the We're judge. Take a quick uh, bathroom break. Five minutes, please. Calling a quick break. You can step down to this. As the defense calls its witness and uh, expert witness in the use of force, Barry Brody spent 27 years on the Santa Rosa, California Police Department. He's taught uh, for many, many years, uh, and now he has a consulting business. He's, he's essentially a, a consultant, a, a professional expert witness in cases like this for both prosecution and defense. Here for the defense, uh, you just heard the bottom line from Barry Broad that this was uh, that what Derek Chauvin did from the first use of force uh, with George Floyd, trying to get him into the vehicle, the police vehicle there, right up to the end was a lawful and objectively reasonable use of force. This, of course, uh, one of the two major arguments the defense is trying to refute by the prosecution that it was the excessive and unreasonable and unlawful use of force by Derek Chauvin, that knee on the neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds that led to the death of George Floyd. They will also no doubt have a medical expert to come in and say that what George, what Derek Chauvin did did not kill George Floyd. But let's talk about this. Let me go first to our reporter on the scene, Alex Perchet, who is just uh, hard by the courthouse there in Minneapolis. And Alex, uh, this is a witness, you know, he's got a tough job, though. The whole world saw this video of uh, George, Derek Chauvin with his knee on George Floyd's neck and was horrified by it. The vast majority of people, uh, this expert witness for the prosecutor for the defense, has to say what you actually saw was not what it felt like, but was actually a completely reasonable use of force by police officer Derek Chauvin. Well, and, and not just that, Terry, but you saw them go step by step with how Chauvin interacted with George Floyd and him saying that this is a part of training, whether it be the prone position uh, or also saying that uh, that he believed that George Floyd was still passively resisting uh, even while he was on the ground. And, you know, that that uh, led to him, uh, you know, the, his his positioning um, uh, on, on, on the ground and in that kind of controlled that can kind of controlled area. Uh, and so. So, yes, I mean, this for the defense is that codifying uh, you know, testimony that Chauvin's actions were exactly justified, which is what they're ultimately going to prove. And they just need to have that one juror uh, that, that, that buys this testimony. It is, it is a tough one, as, as you point out, because what Barry Broad has to do is say right up until the moment that they lifted his lifeless body onto the stretcher, what Derek Chauvin was doing was reasonable. And uh, this expert witness, Barry Broad, for the defense saying, well, uh, he was still resisting even though he had stopped breathing and his heart had stopped. Let, let's bring in our expert legal panel here, civil rights attorney Kristen Gibbons-Fedden and trial lawyer Robert DiCello. And Kristen, let me begin with you uh, and just get your reaction. It's a hard job for the defense expert here, given uh, obviously the central piece of evidence. We all saw it. And he's got to say that it was lawful, it was within the training, and it was reasonable. That's hard. Absolutely. And you know what? Like you kind of pointed out, defense has to call an expert. And they did. But my belief is that defense is going to really have a hard time overcoming all of the testimony from officers from Chauvin's own department, including his chief. The state really didn't leave much space for the defense to create really that much doubt. But as you pointed out, you really only need one. Now, I thought that this expert's much of his testimony was very hypo hypothetical. You know, it wasn't really applicable to the case at hand. He talked about the impact of drugs, may not be able to respond or may not be able to feel pain. 
but you heard Mr. Floyd screaming out that he cannot breathe. You also heard him coherently answering his name, um, being able to spell his name. And so that impact that he was hypothetically talking about in regards to the use of force was really inapplicable. He also described an individual who was tased, falls to the ground, hits his head and dies. Again, it does not resemble what we saw in this hand. It's a tough job, but I don't think he was able to do it. And I want to go to Robert DiCello on how you handle this, this aspect of the defense. Look, uh, Kristen is right. He has to call an expert witness. He's got to uh, make some kind of showing to the jury that what Derek Chauvin did was was lawful and, and reasonable, and yet he, to do so, he's got to say things like, well, you couldn't really put him in the side recovery position because there was a space limitation. They were outside in a street. There, were, there, were, there was not that much traffic. They could control the traffic. They had officers there to do so. It, is there a, a risk that he's going to backfire on him, that he's got to make really difficult arguments to, to believe for the jury to buy into what he's saying? Good afternoon, Terry. Yes, this is a this is a, a, a dicey situation right now. In fact, my hands are sweating. I got to tell you, if I was as a as a former prosecutor and a civil rights trial lawyer, I am I am anxious to see what the prosecution's cross examination is going to be. I have plenty of questions right now for this expert. Uh, first of all, let's just get this out of the way real quick. I can't believe that there was no objection on the way he summarized Graham v. Connor last week. You and I were talking, and I said I'd love to do a, a show on just that case, because what he said was wrong. He said to the jury, and I can't believe it went in, you have to see this case through the eyes of the officer. That is not, that is not appropriate under so many levels, but that's what came in. So now the concern is, how does the prosecutor do that cross? Whew. Right. I mean, because, please continue, because the, the, the distinction you're drawing, if I've got it right, is what the jury heard from this witness is your job, jurors, is to put, your, uh, is to put yourself in the shoes of Derek Chauvin when the law is put yourself in the shoes of a reasonable officer? Is that? Exactly, exactly. It is to be, you, you put yourself as a fact finder in this situation as the person who is a reasonable police officer. You do not, and, and so for so many reasons, do anything like what was said in court. All right, well, let's see what Prosecutor Steve Slusher does on cross-examination. Mr. Floyd in the prone position on the ground, handcuffed, was not a use of force. That's correct. And I believe, according to your testimony, it's because, in your opinion, um, that position is not likely to inflict pain. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, uh, if it did, in fact, inflict pain upon Mr. Floyd, would that change your opinion? Only if the positioning of the body or if the officers were manipulating Mr. Floyd's hands in a way that would create pain, then yes, I would say that would be a use of force. So my question is, if, if Mr. Floyd actually experienced pain, would that change your opinion? Would it be then a use of force if pain was actually inflicted upon Mr. Floyd? If the pain was inflicted through the prone control, then yes, I would say that was a use of force. And the prone control, as we're describing here, just so that we make sure that we're talking about the same terms, would be um, placing Mr. Floyd on his stomach, correct? Yes. Face down. Yes. Handcuffed. Yes. And uh, as applied here on a hard surface on the pavement, correct? Yes. Right. And so if... Uh, if we're talking about that as the as the prone, you're calling it a prone control. Yes. Can I use it interchangeably with prone restraint? I think that's that the same. Term? Okay. So I'll refer to it as a prone restraint. Uh, Mr. Floyd is face down, handcuffed behind the back. Correct. Yes. And uh, at some point, the defendant is on top of him. Is that right? I think he had his knee on him. I'm not sure if I would describe that as being on top of him. Uh, if I may uh, publish to the witness Exhibit 17. All right. And so uh, as, stated, as shown here in Exhibit 17, you're able to see the exhibit. Is that right? Yes. All right. And you see that the uh, defendant 
has his knee on top of Mr. Floyd. Is that correct? I see his knee in the vicinity of the upper back and neck area. Is it on the top or the bottom of Mr. Floyd? It's on his back. Top being top of the head or? You tell me, is it on the top, the bottom, the side? Where is his knee? I see his knee on the upper spine and neck area. Is the upper spine then on the top? Okay, we can go, we can use top. Okay, you would agree with me then? Yes. Okay. And so the defendant is on top of Mr. Floyd? His knee is on top of his. And you can't see where his other knee is in this photograph, is that right? That's correct. Uh, but you have reviewed the body-worn camera footage, correct? I have. And you've looked at the other exhibits that have been submitted in this case, or no? Uh, most of them. Okay. And so you're aware that now what we're looking at here is the defendant's left knee on top of Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes. Are you aware at this point in time that the defendant's right knee is also on top of Mr. Floyd? I believe it was on his arm or to the side of his body. You believe it was on his arm? Yes. Okay. On, on top of him, though, right? Yes. Okay. And so, to answer my question, the defendant is on top of Mr. Floyd on Exhibit 17. Is that right? Again, when I say on top, I think he's laying his complete body on top of Mr. Floyd. What I see is, is the knee positions. Okay. Both knees on top of Mr. Floyd? Yes. Okay. And uh, and also, are, are you aware that uh, the defendant weighed approximately 140 pounds at the time this took place? Were you aware of that by your review of the records? Yes. And uh, in your experience, does the clothing and equipment uh, that the defendant is wearing in, his, in Exhibit 17, could that add some amount of weight uh, to the defendant? Yes. And that would then increase the amount of pressure or force being placed on Mr. Floyd at this time. Is that right? It could. Okay. And so looking then at Exhibit 17 and just starting with the fundamental uh, premise of your testimony that what we're seeing here is not a use of force, I need to ask you if you believe that it is unlikely that orienting yourself on top of a person on the pavement with both legs is unlikely to produce pain? It could. What do you mean it could? Is it unlikely to produce pain or is it likely to produce pain? I'm saying it could produce pain. It could? Yes. Uh, and if it could produce pain, then, again, just looking at your premise, if it could produce pain, then it would be a use of force, wouldn't it? If the officer's intent was to inflict pain, that Not would be use of force? Not the officer's intent, sir. What you said is that it was unlikely to produce pain, and that's why it wasn't a use of force. You now just said that it could produce pain. And so, regardless of the officer's intent, if this act that we're looking at here in Exhibit 17 could produce pain, would you agree that what we're seeing here is a use of force? Shown in this picture, that could be a use of force. Okay. If you'd take that down, please. Um, and, and sir, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, positional asphyxia, if I'm to understand your testimony about positional asphyxia, this is something that you're familiar with, is that right? Yes. Uh, this is something that you've uh, taught in courses to uh, uh, budding officers, I'm assuming, the dangers of positional asphyxia? Yes. And in positional asphyxia, is it true that, that positional asphyxia is a result of some oxygen deprivation? Is that right? Yes. And that is as a result of uh, a, a chest cavity, the inability for the lungs to expand. Fair? Yes. And the in positional asphyxia, as understood in law enforcement, can be a result of being uh, having your chest, your body weight, on the ground, right, in the prone position. Your own body weight, the subject's own body weight. 
That could, yes. That could cause positional asphyxia, just the body weight itself. If the person is extremely obese. Sure. If you or I were to lie with our hands cuffed behind our back on the ground, I don't think either one of us would be prone to positional asphyxia. Well, I will take that as a compliment, just for the purposes of argument here. Um, but uh, but there can be instances, certainly, in which a person, by the nature of their own body weight, could experience positional asphyxia. True? It's possible. Okay. And uh, things that could you know, further exacerbate or contribute to that could be uh, the use of restraint, correct? The handcuffs behind the back. Yes. And additional pressure as well. So um, you being a, a, a non-obese fit person, right? If someone was pressing down on you, that would sort of take the place of excess body weight, and that could contribute to the positional asphyxia. True. It's possible. And, and if uh, the pressure, obviously, the greater the pressure being exerted, the more uh, of a potential danger of positional asphyxia. Fair? Yes. And uh, the dangers of uh, positional asphyxia due to being restrained in the prone position is, is a known risk. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and it's something you know about, true? Yes. It's something you teach in your courses, correct, in training? Yes. And this is something you've been in law enforcement, did you say since 1972? Uh, for 79 years, excuse me, 29 years. Okay, 29 years. Um, at what point uh, did you become aware of the dangers associated with positional asphyxia? Probably late 80s. So, looking over 30 years that you've been aware of the dangers of positional asphyxia, right? Yes. And would you agree that that's something that's commonly understood in law enforcement, that, that, that this is a known risk? Yes. So this is not new information? No. And there are ways to uh, mitigate against the risks of positional asphyxia that are known to law enforcement, is that right? Yes. And I think what you testified to is uh, the side recovery position. Can you describe the side recovery position? So when a suspect is handcuffed, do you just pull them to their side and have them tuck their knees up? It, kind of like a fetal position almost? Like a fetal position. Right. And so um, you're, you've also been a defensive tactics instructor, correct? Yes. And, uh, and you've been certified as such, right? Yes. Are you uh, aware of how one might put somebody in the side recovery position? It's fairly simple to do, just pull them to their side. Okay. Does it take a long time? No. So it's simple, it's fairly quick, and in your opinion, it alleviates or could alleviate against the, the dangers of positional asphyxia. True? Yes. I know that you uh, reviewed various uh, MPD policies in uh, connection with your review of this case. Is that right? Yes. And getting back to uh, the issue of whether what we saw in Exhibit 17 at that particular time was a use of force, are you aware of how uh, the Minneapolis Police Department defines force? Not specifically, no. I would have a general understanding of it. Generally, would you agree, or based on your review, would you accept that the Minneapolis Police Department generally defines force to include restraint? It can. Uh, particularly if it's restraint that could result in some sort of injury or pain. Yes. Fair? Okay. And so you would agree then, just as we are at this point in your testimony that what we saw in Exhibit 17 would at least fit within the Minneapolis Police Department policy 
of a use of force. Fair? Yes. And a reasonable police officer would adhere to the policies of their own department. True? Yes. In your uh, analysis of how, you know, under the Graham factors, how you're going to go about a force review, you indicated that one of the things that you look at is the severity of the crime. True? Yes. And uh, the severity of the crime is something that, would you agree uh, the label of the crime, whether it's a misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor in Minnesota or a felony, isn't as important as the underlying conduct involved in the crime? I agree. And so a felony level uh, bad check uh, may, from a use of force standpoint, be less serious than a misdemeanor domestic assault. Fair? So by the nature of the terminology of the crime, I agree. But obviously, a domestic violence case is a serious and a potentially violent environment. And, and really, maybe that was an inartful question, but that's what I'm asking. In this case, the misdemeanor, what's labeled as a misdemeanor assault, would, from a use of force perspective, be more serious than, say, writing a bad check, but at a felony level. Okay. Yes. And you're aware that in this case, the uh, initial call that the officers were responding to was a, a counterfeiting allegation or forgery allegation passing a fake $20 bill, right? Yes. And could you agree that uh, in terms of you know the range of criminal offenses, this would be at a fairly low level from a use of force perspective? Yes, but again, as I mentioned earlier... Well, what I was asking is if you could agree, and I'll give you a chance to explain if you want, but you, you would agree that in terms of the range of different criminal offenses that are available, a counterfeiting call over an alleged fake $20 bill is on the less serious side. Yes. And, and I think what you probably were about to say is that but that could change, right? And again, it's all about the contact and the resistance of the suspect. Right. Which is completely different than the seriousness of the underlying offense. That's why I stopped you. I didn't want to be rude, but let's just keep this in the, that analytical framework for now. Seriousness of the offense, um, not the response, because we'll get to that, the response of the subject. Okay. And, and would, it, would you say, uh, would you agree with me that you know, the, the response of the subject, the activities of the subject to the officer on the scene, that's probably the operative uh, important facts here, right? That's what you need to look at. Yes. So in terms of the seriousness of the, of the crime, that's not as important. Let's take a look at the imminence of the threat. You discussed imminence of the threat. Officers have to assess that. Is that right? Yes. And could you please, for the jury, explain in your words what you mean by threat? What is a threat? You look at a person and you can't see their hands. They have their hands in their pocket. That could be a threat that in their pocket is a gun. You look at a person and the way they position their body, angle their body back into maybe a confrontational stance, that could be a threat. All right, so right now I have my hands, both my hands in my pocket and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be confrontational. I don't know if I look confrontational, but uh, am I a threat? Um, if I was walking up to you on the street and it's going to be reasonable suspicion that you have committed some type of criminal activity, I would, from a position of cover, ideally, tell you to take your hands out of your pockets. Would you agree that there's a difference between a threat and a risk? Yes. And so really any person can present a, a risk, right? Yes. Uh, someone could have their hands in their pocket and unexpectedly uh, have a weapon. True? Yes. Uh, or not. Or not. That's a risk. But would you agree that a threat is when I would be doing something to show some sort of intention to cause you harm? Balling up my fists, approaching you in an aggressive manner. 
that would be a, a, a threat, correct? Some type of cues, yes. And would you agree that officers are authorized to use force to respond to a threat? Yes. Officers are not authorized to use force to respond to a mere risk, fair? Correct. So there are many different factors that could be a risk versus a threat. Someone uh, who's a large in stature, that could be a risk, true? Could. Uh, but that's not in and of itself a threat, is it? No. You can't use force on someone just because they're large, true? That's correct. The use of drugs or intoxicants, um, that could be a risk factor, true? Yes. And, and, and on that subject, you know, with respect to uh, what a reasonable officer understands about the use of drugs and, and alcohol, controlled substances, there, there's a whole range of drugs out there, right? Yes. And there's a whole range of uh, drug users out there, correct? Yes. And uh, there are some drugs that could cause someone to become aggressive, true? Yes. And there's some drugs that can cause uh, the user to become somewhat sedate, true? Yes. And uh, so just hearing that someone is, you know, quote, on something, that is not necessarily a threat to the officer, correct? Unless there's behavior that makes the officer believe that the person's drug influenced. Agreed. If there's behavior, behavior that they're drug influenced or behavior that they're going to be doing something threatening to the officer. I think there's the a officer. difference, right? Sorry, I missed something. I'm sorry. There's a difference between uh, someone, uh, someone manifesting behavior that they may be using drugs or manifesting a behavior that they're going to threaten you, right? Again, but the manifestation of the drug influence could pose a threat. Okay. But, I mean, one manifestation of drug influence is that somebody's passed out, right? Yes. That probably does not constitute a threat to you, does it? No. Um, that's more of a vulnerability of the person who's using the controlled substance, right? Yes. So if someone is, quote, on something in and of itself, that is not a justification to use force, true? True. And if the person who is on something is of large size, those two things combined, those two risks together combined, those don't justify the use of force, do they? No, there need to be a third component, that is the actions of the suspect. Right. The, the behavior of the subject, what they did. Fair? Yes. It also, just in terms of the, the decision of an officer to use force, uh, that is driven by the behavior of the subject, correct? Yes. The uh, decision to use force on a subject is not dependent upon what some third party over whom the subject has no control and is not directing is doing, correct? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Let's say that you're distracted by something Mr. Nelson is doing. Let's say maybe he's even threatening you. That's not a justification for you to use force against me, is it? No. Because I certainly have no control over Mr. Nelson, right? Correct. All right. And so if there are, for example, in the, in the instance of a, of a bystander, if a bystander is doing something that an officer finds threatening or irritating or distracting or annoying, those activities don't justify a use of force against someone who is not directing those activities. Fair? Yes. All right. It might explain the officer's state of mind in a particular moment, but it's not a justification for the use of force. True? I agree. Okay. You talked about uh, situational awareness, and situational awareness is something that is important for, I think your testimony was anyone, and we can agree with that, right? Yes. Um, but in particular, situational awareness is something important for an officer, a reasonable officer to have. 
correct? Yes. And that situational awareness he has to include really under under Graham all the facts and circumstances, the totality of facts and circumstances that are presented to the officer at the time. True. Yes. And and in looking particularly at the behavior of the person upon whom force is being applied, it's important that the officer is situationally aware of the condition of the subject, correct? Yes. Because if the subject does something uh, aggressive, they may need to adjust their uh, plan in the use of force, correct? Their application. Yes. But if the subject is manifesting compliance or a medical condition, illness, the officer needs to be situationally aware of that as well. Fair? Should. Do you agree, in having read the training materials and you're aware of MPD policy, and, and uh, uh, I'm assuming you've listened to some of the testimony in this case, as an expert, you're allowed to do that? Uh, I listened to two testimonies from the use force experts. All right. Do you agree with the proposition that in law enforcement, once somebody is in your custody, they're in your care? I agree. And, uh, and in fact, that's uh, MPD policy and training, in your custody, in your care, correct? Yes. And situational awareness, then, would you agree, sir, that includes being aware of the subject's medical condition? Yes. Particularly if they're exhibiting signs of distress? Yes. Loss of consciousness. Yes. Inability to breathe. Yes. Loss of pulse. Yes. All of these things uh, a reasonable officer should take into consideration when determining whether to escalate force, de escalate force, or remain the same, correct? Yes. Now, would you agree, sir, that the application of use of force must be reasonable at the start? and at the end, true? I agree. And at all points in between? Yes. And if there's ever a point at which the use of force becomes unreasonable, that that it must stop. Or de-escalate. Or de-escalate. Um, it must de-escalate to a point of being reasonable, correct? Yes. Because that's really the standard uh, is that of reasonability, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, in terms of proportionality, you've read the materials, you've studied the uh, MPD policies, you're familiar with the uh, MPD Defense Tactics and Control Guide the continuum, use force continuum. Yes. Okay. And you uh, would agree that that continuum, which we've all seen, is a tool that an officer can use to you know make some kind of a rough uh, approximation of what is proportional, a proportional response. Correct. Yes. You would agree, based on your review of Minneapolis Police Department policy, that the, the sanctity of life and protection of the public, those are the cornerstones of Minneapolis Police Department's use of force policy. True? Yes. In your review of the Minneapolis Police Department manual, the use of force manual, you received a copy of the manual, I'm assuming? Uh, use of force 5-300 that's correct 5-300 yes in that in your study of uh, Minneapolis use of force policy 5-300 series did you see the phrase or term one upsmanship anywhere in this policy no so you would agree that one upsmanship is not the cornerstone of Minneapolis Police Department's use of force policy. It's protection of the public and the sanctity of life. True? And I use the phrase one upmanship to describe how the standards of police training throughout the country are. You're using one upmanship to describe the concept of proportionality. True? Yes. And one upmanship is, uh, I guess if that's an accurate description of what you're trying to uh, express as far as uh, proportionality, wouldn't that suggest, I mean, what, what is the limit to the one-upsmanship that an officer can do? Uh, as I described earlier, that if a person tries to strike you or kick you, that the officer doesn't have to respond with their own punches or kicks. They can respond with a better tool, which would be an impact weapon or a taser or pepper spray. 
if the suspect were to grab hold of the officer's baton or taser, then the officer may find themselves in imminent threat and respond with potential deadly force. Right. And, and I think the examples you used were strike you, stab you, shoot you, um, were some examples that you were talking about in terms of one-upsmanship, but that's that wasn't the answer I was looking for. In terms of one-upsmanship, isn't what the officer is always limited uh, in their response by the uh, Graham versus Connor standards of reasonableness, right? True. Sure. So whatever step the officer takes to either escalate or de-escalate, it must be objectively reasonable, correct? I agree. And that's why someone who is not resisting, who is uh, being compliant, that's why that person uh, cannot uh, have any force at all exerted against them. Is that right? I don't agree with that. If a person is not resisting and is not non-compliant, so let me phrase it better, compliant, that doesn't, they're not, uh, officers not justified in using force if they're being complied with. So they'd be using control if the suspect's in their custody. Right. And control, in, under your definition, like if we're, if we're looking just at pure control, that is a restraint that's not likely to inflict pain, correct? Yes. That's control. But, but you've agreed that Exhibit 17, what we saw here in this case, was likely to produce pain. True? It could. And so if someone is not resisting and they're compliant, the use of something, uh, a control, as you put it, that could produce pain is just not justified, is it? No. And we talked about the use of force needing to be uh, appropriate from reasonable from the beginning to the end and at all points in between. Is that right? Yes. And the officer must reassess the situation, must reevaluate the situation, must be taking in information. Is that right? Yes. And that can include information from uh, the, the suspect, the person upon whom they're using control, correct? Yes. That can be information that uh, they're getting from other sources, for example, fellow officers. True? Yes. If a fellow officer makes some comment or assessment as to the condition of the subject, a reasonable officer takes that into account. Is that right? Should. And that information we use to factor in, to reassess the situation, to determine whether or not force should be escalated, de-escalated, or discontinued. Fair? Yes. You would agree, you know, we were talking about the, um, the, the threat assessment, you're talking about stabbing, striking, shooting. You agree that based upon your review of the evidence in this case, there was no stabbing attempt by Mr. Floyd, correct? Correct. He wasn't trying to shoot anyone, correct? Yes. All right. And uh, we should talk about the specific circumstances uh, here of what happened on May 25, 2020. Would you agree uh, as a general premise that Mr. Floyd was handcuffed, restrained in the prone position for approximately nine minutes and 29 seconds? Yes. And during uh, that nine minutes and 29 seconds, uh, did you note any significant difference in the manner in which Mr. Floyd was restrained? No. Did you note any differences in the manner in which uh, Mr. Floyd was acting during that entire restraint period from the first point to the 929? Did you notice any differences with him? Yes. Okay. For example, uh, when he first was placed prone on the ground, he was speaking, correct? And actively resisting, yes. And actively resisting when he was prone? Yes. How long did that uh, take place? I'm not sure. I'd say a couple minutes. A couple minutes that he was actively resisting? Yes, struggling against the officers. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about the point when Mr. Uh, 
when Mr. Floyd, when the restraint of Mr. Floyd first began. And I'd like to show you a clip uh, from Exhibit 127, which is a composite of the King body-worn camera and the Frazier video. Uh, and that's uh, going to be starting at 2019-09, which can we agree is the beginning, around the beginning of the restraint period? Based on your review? I, I was looking for a screen, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that question. All right, uh, the, the King body-worn camera. Okay. Uh, right around the time of 2019-09, would you agree that this is right around the beginning of the restraint period? I'll have to go with your approximation on the time. And, and when, we, when we pull up the clip, why don't you pull up the clip and publish it and hit pause right away. All right. So you can see the, um, the notation on the top of the screen of 2019-09. Yes. Would you agree that that's the uh, the beginning of the restraint period? Is towards the beginning of the restraint period. Okay. Do you agree? I'm not sure, but I'll take your word for it. All right. Well, why don't we just watch it? Uh, and this is going to go through 2019. On the ground. <laughs> And so right around uh, 2019 09, right, when, it's first, when we first saw the clip, Mr. Floyd was standing or kneeling by the squad car. True? Yes. And did you hear what Mr. Floyd said when he was kneeling at the squad car? Uh, thank you or something to those lines. Now, I, I want to back you up a little bit just in terms of situational awareness. And you're aware that uh, the defendant received. Um, uh, many hours of paid training by the Minneapolis Police Department, correct? Yes. Right around 889 hours, correct? Sounds about right. Are you familiar with crisis intervention training and what that is? Yes. You're aware that the defendant took a 40-hour course in crisis intervention training? Yes. And that generally is uh, education to make people aware of different Im impediments to compliance, such as uh, mental illness or uh, intoxication. Yes. Anxiety would fit in there, correct? Good. Perhaps claustrophobia. Good. Right. And when uh, Officer uh, Chauvin, the defendant, first approached the vehicle, and this was before uh, Mr. Floyd went in, right in the back, and when he first got on the scene, uh, through Officer Chauvin's body worn camera, you could hear Mr. Floyd saying that he had anxiety and claustrophobia, correct? Yes. Right. And then there was a struggle, and you observed the struggle uh, in, in the back of the car when the officers forced Mr. Floyd in the back of the car, right? Yes. And then when he came out, uh, he was kneeling right around the time we were looking. He was on his knees. He's handcuffed, right? Yes. Uh, and he says, thank you, right? Yes. And it was after that point that Mr. Floyd was then uh, pushed over by the officers onto the ground, correct? Yes. And at the time he was pushed onto the ground, uh, just taking note of his body position, was he, when he was initially pushed onto the ground, would that have qualified as a sort of a side recovery position? Uh, we'd have to back it up, and I'm not, I'm not sure how long he was in that Please position. Do. And so when he was, in, were you able to see that? I was. All right. So when, when Mr. Floyd was initially brought from his you know, handcuffed position on his knees to the ground, right, he was in effectively a side recovery position. Fair? Momentarily, yes. Okay. And then he was taken out of the side recovery position by the officers, and then after that point, placed in the prone position. True? Yes. And so right after uh, this clip runs, we see Mr. Floyd in uh, the prone position. Correct? Yes. Face down on the ground, handcuffed. True? Yes. 
And the defendant and uh, Officer King and Officer Lane then thereafter all took part in restraining Mr. Floyd in the prone position on the ground, based on your review, correct? Yes. And uh, you were able to see then uh, from Exhibit 17 that uh, the defendant had one knee at least on Mr. Floyd's body, on his neck, in the neck back area, correct? Yes. Okay, on top. And you could see that uh, he had his other knee also, I believe you said, near his arm, but it was on his back, correct? I really couldn't tell from that picture. I took that from the snapshots of the body board cameras. Um, and so when you say that, you're agreeing that the defendant was on Mr. Floyd's neck and back, at least at some portions of the restraint. Fair? I would say upper back in the proximity of the neck, and then his right knee was towards uh, more of his rib cage. On top of him, though, correct? Yes. Adding to the pressure, fair? Could. Okay. Uh, sir, I'd like to show you, uh, just for a little more clarification, Exhibit 240, which has been received into evidence, and this might provide a, a better view. Okay, and so you testified just a moment ago that you thought that the defendant's knee was, was where? Upper back and neck. Okay. And so would you agree I'm placing a circle? Would that be... Mr. Floyd's back, upper back? That would be his upper back. Okay. And I'll just place a, another circle. Uh, that's the defendant's knee. It is. His left knee. That's above the area that you've identified as Mr. Floyd's upper back, isn't it? Yes. Uh, his left knee is on Mr. Floyd's neck in this picture, in Exhibit 240, isn't it? In this picture, yes. Okay. Now I'd like to talk about his right knee. And you can see Mr. Floyd's arm, where I'm drawing, correct? Yes. And you can see the handcuffs, correct? Yes. Okay. And this is the defendant's right knee, correct? Yes. Would you agree that the defendant's right knee is on the defendant is on uh, Mr. Floyd's lower back? Uh, looks like it's on his shoulder blade area to me. Okay, so the shoulder blade area would be that. Would you clear that, Your Honor? I seem to have trouble here. I appreciate that. So the shoulder blade area, then, I guess that would be uh, Mr. Floyd's upper back. Yes. Okay. So you would agree, based on Exhibit 240, that the defendant's on his, his left knee is on Mr. Floyd's neck, his right knee is on Mr. Floyd's back, correct? Yes. And I believe uh, your testimony earlier, earlier was that you've watched the entirety of this body-worn camera videos, true? Yes. And, and you would agree with me that there's a wealth of body-worn camera video footage in this case. True? Yes. And milestone video and surveillance video and bystander video, correct? Yes. So you're able to view, uh, as an expert, you know, the conduct here from multiple angles, true? Yes. And, and so with that sort of, uh, uh, I guess, redundancy built into the record, does that alleviate some of the concerns or considerations I think you were testifying to on your direct examination regarding um, how cameras react to light? Yes. Okay. So this exhibit, 240, is actually an image taken, uh, you can see it's at 2019, 27, that's about 13 seconds after uh, the defendant placed Mr. Floyd in this prone position. You agree? Uh, he was one of the three that put him in the prone. Sure. After, and, and, uh, and so we'll say, after the defendant and the two other officers put Mr. Floyd in the, in the prone position restrained on the ground, correct? Yes. All right. And then uh, the first video that we play would demonstrate then that this restraint that we're talking about 
But you said it was a it was a it was a controlled restraint, or what was the term you used? Prone control. Prone control. That began around 2019-14. Fair. Okay. Okay. And uh, I believe you testified that from the beginning to the end, you did not see the defendant's relative position on Mr. Floyd's body meaningfully change. Did you? Um, can you rephrase the question? Did the defendant get up from the point in which the prone restraint began and the prone restraint ended? Did he get up? Did he get up? No. Okay. Did he let up off of him any, any pressure? It appears that his body position changed and he was putting more weight over his calves as the restraint continued. And are you able to identify, based on your own review, because I know you've looked at this, correct? Yes. And, and I'm assuming you've looked at it a lot in preparation for testimony today, correct? Yes. Are you able to point to any particular portion of the video record in which you say that the defendant shifted his weight more towards his calves to take pressure off? I would have to see the 14 body camera snapshots, and then we can focus on those. Now, sir, I'm going to show you another portion of the um, uh, body worn camera video, and that's going to be at uh, it's been received as uh, exhibit 127. It's a composite of uh, King's body worn camera and the Frazier video. And we're going to start at 20 23 11. Should be exhibit 127, it should be composite of King and the Frazier video. Anyway, should be there, right. starting at yeah, 2023. This starts at 202310. If you'd play this uh, portion, please. And then, uh, just having reviewed that video, I'd like to show you. Uh, what's uh, been marked as demonstrative exhibit 947, 947. All right, so in demonstrative exhibit 947, you see it's a still frame captured from um, uh, composite, I guess, or the exhibit 15, which has been received into evidence at uh, the time, it's non-military time, but it's 8:23:14. And this is uh, roughly corresponding with the clip I just showed you. Can you show, uh, do you see uh, the defendant's, the foot on his um, left left leg? Yes. Okay. And do you see how it's uh, slightly off the ground? Yes. Okay. Now, you would agree that, uh, you know, given the orientation of the defendant's foot at this particular moment in time, uh, there would be more pressure placed on Mr. Floyd's neck and back. True? It's possible. What's more than possible, isn't it? I mean, his so the reason why I say possible is that Mr. Floyd's movements could have, in that moment, taken Mr. Chauvin's foot off the ground. Let's take a look at that clip we just watched again, please. Yep. 
Are those the movements you're talking about that could have moved his foot up? Yes, and I saw the officer reach out for a little balance by supporting his left hand up against the back of the squad car. And, and the balance issue is important because you know when you place your yourself, uh, both knees on a, on a person, that's not a very good balance point, is it? Mm, it depends. Well, apparently it wasn't here if the defendant was trying to balance himself against the car, correct? Or he's just responding to Mr. Floyd's movements. But as you saw in the portion uh, that you looked at, uh, the defendant's body weight was not being supported by his foot because his foot was off the ground, correct? At that moment that the picture was taken, yes. And that would increase the pressure on Mr. Floyd. Whether like he's I said moving earlier, or not. it could be in response to his movement. Whether it's in response to his movement or not, the question is would it increase the pressure? Would it increase the pressure? I don't know. Um, we've discussed a little bit about uh, the defendant's initial abuse of force to restrain Mr. Floyd. Right? And I'd, I'd like to discuss now what happens next. As you've analyzed all of these videos, but it's important that we get the full scope of your, your opinion here. So we're going to go back to Exhibit 127 and begin at clip uh, 20, 19, 23. And if you can start playing now. Thank you. So during that segment, that was about nine seconds. The beginning of it was about nine seconds after Mr. Floyd was placed in the prone position. Would you agree? Yes. And during that period of time, uh, you heard Mr. Floyd say uh, multiple times, I can't breathe. True? Yes. Uh, did you count how many times? No. I counted six. Would you have any reason to dispute that? No. And uh, obviously the defendant would know, a reasonable officer would know, that this prone position could present a danger of positional asphyxia. True? It's potential. And, uh, and that it's important then, uh, in terms of situational awareness, to not only be aware of that training and prior knowledge, but to pay attention to what the subject is saying, correct? Yes. And the subject here is saying multiple times, I can't breathe, correct? That's correct. Now, I think your testimony earlier is that there can be times in which people can say they, they don't breathe and don't mean it, right? Yes. Uh, might be faking it, I guess, right? Good. But uh, context is really everything, isn't it? Can be. Because part of the reasonable police officer analysis assumes that you have a reasonable person applying the standards and using a little bit of their common sense. Fair? Yes. All right. And so uh, if I have, uh, uh, I'm standing here talking to you normally in a normal tone, in a normal voice, and I tell you, I can't breathe. You, I'm standing here, I'm talking to you. You might have uh, reason to doubt me, correct? Yes. But in a situation where we have here, where you're actually physically on top of someone, in a, in a position which, based on your training, and based on your experience, and based on your knowledge, could cause positional asphyxia, that's a different context, correct? Yes. And in that context, it, it would, a reasonable police officer would at least acknowledge and consider the possibility that what they're doing is causing a problem, wouldn't they? Where you would interpret what Mr. Floyd is doing while he's making the statements, and it appeared to me with that video that he was still struggling. Struggling or writhing? I don't know the difference. Well, would a reasonable police officer on the scene consider whether somebody is actively resisting or writhing on the ground because they can't breathe? 
I think it'd be reasonable for the officer to take what Mr. Floyd had been doing prior to that and still consider that he was struggling. And, and prior to that, uh, you would acknowledge that there was a, a physical struggle, correct? Yes. Physical struggles can be exhausting, correct? They can. That's uh, exhaustion is based on your training and your knowledge and your experience, another potential risk factor associated with positional asphyxia, true? Can be, yes. It can complicate things, true? Yes. As can intoxication, true? Alcohol or drug? Let's start with alcohol. I don't know. Okay. Um, drug intoxication could also be a risk factor with positional asphyxia. True? It can. And when we talk about some of the different factors and things that would known at the scene, a reasonable police officer in the defendant's position would have taken those factors into account as well. True? Yes. From his vantage point on top of Mr. Floyd. Fair? Yes. We take our technology break at this point, Judge. Yeah. All right. Take your twenty minute break. Come back at three twenty. So the judge calling a ten minute break in this cross examination of the defense expert witness on the use of force. His name is Barry Broad. He was a police officer in California for 27 years. He teaches uh, police officers, has been teaching police officers over the years, and now is a, a consult, basically a professional expert witness. Uh, and on cross examination, prosecutor Steve Slisher is trying to uh, challenge his basic conclusion that everything. Everything Derek Chauvin did, uh, a former Minneapolis police officer, at the scene uh, at 38th in Chicago there in South Minneapolis, where he had his knee on George Floyd's neck for 9 minutes and 29 seconds. It was all reasonable. It was all lawful. It was all totally consistent with uh, former officer Chauvin's training as a Minneapolis police officer. That is the position of this expert and uh, prosecutor Steve Slisher trying to uh, break that down rather painstakingly. I'd like to go to Kristen Gibbons-Fedden, who's with us. Uh, and, and Kristen, I'm, I'm just going to say it. I thought this was going to be a much more, uh, f maybe because I'm not a trial lawyer and uh, have seen too many uh, courtroom movies, it's going to be a lot f more fiery. Because it, did, it does seem to me that somebody who makes uh, the claim, for example, that even after George Floyd stopped breathing, even after he had no pulse, a knee on the neck was a reasonable use of force. But it looks like she's just going very, very painstakingly, uh, you know, like you'd cro cross-examine, I don't know, a, a, an expert witness in a corporate case, almost. Uh, I, I don't see him making a lot of ground. But what's your take on what we've been watching? You know, I think it's important to think about, you know, it's not about the gotcha moments um, in real life um, like it is on TV. It's about the concessions. And I really think the prosecutor did a phenomenal job getting him to concede to so many things. Um, for example, that positional asphyxia is a known danger. Um, that Chauvin's actions did not conform with Minneapolis Police Department policy, and that a reasonable officer would abide by his department's policies. He was also to talk about, he also got him to concede that it is a requirement that police officers be situationally aware of the circumstances of the scene as a whole. And it is required that police officers be aware of the suspect, in this case, Mr. Floyd, and the suspect's medical conditions, such as, and he got him to concede, distress, loss of consciousness, and loss of pulse. You know, and that's what the jury has been seeing for the last two weeks. He got him to concede to a lot of things, and I think what was really important about it is that, you know, there was questions regarding Chauvin putting the entirety of his weight um, and balancing, as the expert said, because there was a little bit of back and forth. But what he got the expert to concede is that Chauvin was balancing the entirety of his weight on Mr. Floyd's neck, which to me was heart-wrenching. I can imagine that's the same sentiment that the jury felt. And a key reminder that what Chauvin did was not a reasonable use of force, but rather felonious assault. And we're not even done the cross yet. Mm. 
Well, thank you for that, Kristen. As you're the lawyer, I'm, I'm the guy who watches the Hollywood movies, and I think concessions, he's trying to get the witness to admit these things so that the prosecution can then put it in closing arguments. Let me go to our reporter on the scene, Alex Perche. Uh, I did notice, Alex, that uh, Barry Broad was a very reluctant uh, participant in this cross-examination from time to time. He just wouldn't give anything up, it seemed, sometimes to the point of, of it, it, I'm not sure it made him look good with the jury. Well, at least starting out, right, Terry? I mean, there were, there were some basic things that we saw him going back and forth with the prosecution on uh, that it did, just seemed kind of elementary, and you could see the resistance. Uh, actually, I think we have a sound bite who <laughs> queued up. Uh, take a listen here. Okay, so I'll refer to it as a prone restraint. Uh, Mr. Floyd is face down, handcuffed behind the back, correct? Yes. And uh, at some point, the defendant is on top of him. Is that right? I think he had his knee on him. I'm not sure if I would describe that as being on top of him. Uh, if I may uh, publish to the witness Exhibit 17. All right. And so, uh, as, stated, as shown here in Exhibit 17, you're able to see the exhibit. Is that right? Yes. All right, and you see that the uh, defendant has his knee on top of Mr. Floyd. Is that correct? I see his knee in the vicinity of the upper back and neck area. Is it on the top or the bottom of Mr. Floyd? It's on his back, top being top of the head or... You tell me, is it on the top, the bottom, the side? Where is his knee? I see his knee on the upper spine and neck area. Is the upper spine then on the top? Okay, we can go. We can use top. Okay, you would agree with me then? Yes. Okay. And so the defendant is on top of Mr. Floyd. His knee is on top of his. And you can't see where his other knee is in this photograph, is that right? That's correct. Uh, but you have reviewed the body-worn camera footage, correct? I have. And you've looked at the other exhibits that have been submitted in this case, or no? Uh, most of them. Okay. And so you're aware that now what we're looking at here is the defendant's left knee on top of Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes. Are you aware at this point in time that the defendant's right knee is also on top of Mr. Floyd? I believe it was on his arm or to the side of his body. You believe it was on his arm? Yes. Okay. On, on top of him, though, right? Yes. Okay. And so, to answer my question, the defendant is on top of Mr. Floyd on Exhibit 17. Is that right? Again, when I say on top, I think he's laying his complete body on top of Mr. Floyd. What I see is, is the knee positions. Okay. Both knees on top of Mr. Floyd? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and also, are, are you aware that uh, the defendant weighed approximately 140 pounds at the time this took place? Were you aware of that by your review of the records? Yes. And so, I mean, look, it took about two and a half minutes just to get uh, Broad to admit that Chauvin was on top of George Floyd in that instance. But uh, as it was pointed out earlier, we saw the prosecution, the state, make their case and walk back a number of things we heard Broad testify um, uh, uh, on behalf of for the defense. Number one being uh, looking at the severity of the crime. The initial call here was for a counterfeit $20 bill. Also, the difference between a threat versus a risk. Uh, George Floyd may have been a risk, but was he exactly a threat? And also, uh, just because you're threatened by someone else, a Mr. X, does that also, uh, does that just, that doesn't justify the use of force against an individual? And so that's a direct reference to uh, the, the, the potential threat from the crowd around George Floyd versus uh, the use of force that was being administered uh, to George Floyd. And then also, uh, there was some, another point made about once a suspect or someone is in your custody, you're responsible for them. Their care is, uh, your, your, uh, their care is on you. And so that was also something that they got Mr. Broad uh, to, to, to admit to. So you see this gradual chipping away at his earlier testimony.
Thanks, Alex. That, that is true, that he was able to get these points conceded, as, as Kristen was pointing out. And I want to go back for a moment uh, to the original testimony of this expert witness, Barry Broad. He's the expert on the use of force for the defense. And to a particular point, one of the things that he testified to was that Derek Chauvin, uh, you know, was acting reasonably lawfully and within his training uh, the entire time his knee was on a George Floyd's neck. And so one of the things that the prosecutor said was, well, there were, there were discussions among those officers, all of whom were on George Floyd. Maybe we should roll them over. Maybe we should get off him, especially as he went lifeless, and roll him over to what's called the side recovery position, because you can breathe better. Here's how the expert witness for the defense said it was reasonable not to do that. Now, are there situations where a reasonable police officer would not put a person in the prone position into the recovery position? Yes. Can you describe what those may be? So in this situation, there was space limitations. Mr. Floyd was butted up against the tire of the patrol car. Um, there was traffic still driving down the street. Um, there were crowd issues that took the attention of the officers. Um, Mr. Floyd was still somewhat resisting, so I think those were relatively valid reasons to keep him in the prone. Now, in, term, in terms of um, your training, uh, again, as uh, that you have been trained and trained other officers uh, in the use of crowd control or crowd control issues, right? Yes. Um, how in law enforcement is a crowd defined? So a crowd is just like if you look at a football stadium. So it's a group of people gathered together for a common purpose. So a crowd, by definition, isn't unlawful. Um, and actually, the law enforcement session is just two or more people constitute a crowd. So because it's not unlawful, it doesn't mean that it doesn't become a consideration for the officers. Well, there were more than two people on that street corner as the officers crushed the life out of George Floyd there. Uh, th the question is, does that constitute a crowd that a reasonable officer would f feel so threatened by uh, that they would, in this expert's opinion, be justified in continuing to apply that force, that knee on the neck? Let me go to Kristen Gibbons Fedden here. There, there's that definition of the crowd, and every time I, I hear that word, I think of those people standing around. We've got a very wide wide view of that scene, not just from the, the famous, infamous uh, video that went on Facebook and went viral, uh, taken by Darnella Frazier. We got the body cams, and they're turning around, and there you can see various angles of what's happening there. And then there's that milestone camera uh, on the street light uh, uh, across the street, and there's the, uh, the cashier from uh, the gas station who came out and did some video. There's not, just not that many people there, and it wouldn't constitute a crowd in any other definition. And I'm wondering about what that does to the, to the defense's credibility, that they continue to try to make what is obviously a group of people concerned and getting angry, but not many of them. And there's four armed officers, five if you count the park uh, police fella. Uh, is, is that a, does he have to make that case in order to defend his client? You know, I think he's just grasping at straws. One thing to remember is that reasonable doubt, but you also have to balance it, as you mentioned, with undermining your own authenticity and credibility to the jury. And I think that he is blowing, Nelson is blowing his credibility with the jury. We met this crowd. Not only were you mentioned that we saw it from different vantage points, we met this crowd. We met the nine-year-old who saw Mr. Floyd being murdered. We met the MMA fighter, the off-duty um, firefighter. We met this crowd and not one of them was aggressive or hostile. All of them, if we remember, and this is video footage showing this, were angry, right? They were pleading with the officer, please get off of him. But none of them were aggressive. None of them aggressed towards the officer. And keep in mind, all of them followed what the one officer was telling them. Stay a certain uh, feet away from me and stay on the curb. Not one of them went against those orders. And in fact, the MMA fighter actually assisted the police by calming one of the other young fellows down. So when you're talking about that, that 
crowd, or as I like to call them, as the prosecution has labeled them, bystanders, I think that it definitely undermines the defense's credibility because, as I said, they met this crowd. And it did feel to some people as if the defense was trying to put the neighborhood on trial. Oh, you know that place. You know, when there are people out the street in that place, it's trouble. And that, that, that also may not, given the fact, as you point out, we've met these people in court and saw their behavior on the street. Kristen, thanks very much for that. I want to go back to Alex Perche with some news from inside the courtroom. What's, uh, what's happening, Alex? Well, so Terry, we know going back from this break, uh, Broad is going to be back on uh, on on the stand. We don't know because we're getting in those that that last stretch of, of court today, so we don't know if we'll actually see another witness uh, or who that could potentially be. But we do know that Broad's going to be back on the stand. I did get a pool note and I have a little bit of color of just who's inside the courtroom. Uh, there is another woman uh, who is in Chauvin's seat, and uh, this uh, this afternoon uh, there's a a close family friend of. Of the Floyd family, who who was in their seat, uh, so we, we've seen a, a rotation of, of 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 Floyd supporters throughout the last couple of days, uh, and so we've got a family friend in there this afternoon. All right. Well, we will see what happens uh, when court resumes, if if they're going to have another uh, witness here, and. You know, uh, Kristen, let me go back to you on, on the, what's happening in Minneapolis, one of the great American cities now in anguish over another young black man killed in a, in a police shooting, uh, Dante Wright, uh, after a traffic stop, police involved uh, shooting, and the uprising up uh, on the streets there, people taking to the streets to protest, to give voice to what they feel is the injustice of another young black man being killed at the hands of law enforcement. How do you think that does impact this trial? We know that the defense lawyer, Eric Nelson, has said, my, my guy can't get a fair trial now. He got to sequester the jury. And he may even move for mistrial. How, how do you think it impacts the trial of Derek Chauvin? You know, I think as onlookers myself, I'm seeing trauma on trauma. But the jury is instructed not to watch the news. But how realistic is that? I don't know that it's grounds necessarily for mistrial, and I'll be honest with you. I was quite surprised that Nelson didn't renew his objection that he made on Monday to sequester, uh, excuse me, renew his motion that he made on Monday to, to, to sequester the jury um, or at least question them. Because, you know, a lot of things have happened with the protests. I can't imagine the jurors are unaware of it, particularly when there was a curfew that was set. And it's my understanding from listening to reports, at least one of the jurors is from that town um, and would have been subject to that curfew. And so to be, to, I think that to not question that juror may be um, not the wisest uh, thing to do. But again, you know, if the, if the defense doesn't renew that motion, that could be an issue that is waived by him. Hmm. On appeal in case of a conviction. If you don't raise it at this stage, then you can't raise it on the appeal. Right, right. All right. Uh, Kristen, stand by. Thanks very much. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, the court had called a, a brief recess. We'll see if they're back in. Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. 
Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Welcome back. The trial of Derek Chauvin for the killing of George Floyd continues in Minneapolis. The uh, court is back in session with a continued cross-examination of the defense expert well, you would on the use of you force. You testified about um, uh, the bystanders uh, who had gathered by. Is that right? Yes. And I think you defined a, a crowd in the, in the law enforcement parlance as more than two people? Gathered for a common purpose. I always heard three is a crowd, but it's two people or two people or more. I guess that'd be three. Uh, so that would constitute a crowd. Not all crowds are, of course, uh, threatening. Is that right? Correct. Uh, or even distracting. Correct. Not all crowds. No. And in fact, uh, let's talk about the specific bystanders here. You would uh, agree that at the time that the restraint period began, uh, there really were no bystanders. Right? There are no bystanders there. True. Uh, I think there was one gentleman that was there pretty much the whole time. Are you talking about Charles McMillan? I'm not sure what his name was. 61-year-old. Well, let's take a look at Exhibit uh, 49 at uh, it's a Officer Tao's body-worn camera at 2019-23. You would publish that, please. You, uh, I don't believe Uh, and at that time, then you see there, the camera had panned out into the street, and there was the one gentleman that you'd referred to, correct? Yes. And uh, did he appear to be saying anything? Not that I heard, no. Doing anything? No. Threatening? Didn't appear to be, no. Major risk factor? No. Right. And, and during that period of time, you heard Mr. Floyd uh, repeating that he can't breathe, correct? Yes. And so uh, a reasonable officer in the defendant's position at that time shouldn't have been at least distracted by Mr. McMillan. Fair? Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Now, if we could go to uh, a little bit forward, take a look at Exhibit 127 starting at 2021-28. Uh, and we'll play that through 2021-59. All right, and so, sir, at this point, the clip that we just heard, uh, the restraint is continued, fair? Yes. Great. And, and this then, uh, as he's talking, you can hear Mr. Floyd at least expressing that he's in some kind of distress, fair? Yes. Indicating that he can't breathe? That's what he's saying. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, the defendant is on top of him, true? Yes. And so in the context here, that might be a reasonable police officer might tend to believe him, correct? I'm sorry, believe? Mr. Floyd. That he he's can't saying breathe. he can't breathe, and the defendant is uh, on top of him on the hard pavement. In that context, a reasonable police officer might tend to lend that some more credibility than, say, if he was shouting it from across the street at normal tones possible okay. and uh, at this point did you uh, see anyone uh, any bystanders in the crowd 
Uh, the clip really wasn't showing much. I did see two people look like Officer Tao engage with one person, tell them to get back on the sidewalk. Well, let's take a look uh, at around the same time, which is uh, Tao's body-worn camera, which is marked as Exhibit uh, 49 at 2021-18. we be about 10 seconds earlier than the clip I just showed you. If we could play that, please. Just get up. Uh, uh. What, do you, what do you want? I can't breathe. Please, the knee of my leg. I can't breathe shit. Uh. Well, get up, get in the cop. All right, and so uh, where we ended, we just heard that would have been the 61-year-old Charles McMillan saying something to the effect of get up and get in the car, right? Okay, I heard that. All right, and then you saw some other bystanders, correct? Yes. And those bystanders appeared to be um, a ways away from Officer Tao, correct? On the sidewalk, yes. On the sidewalk, and they were uh, a couple of uh, teenage girls, correct? I saw one woman. I thought I saw a man, and they're both recording. Recording? Uh, there was uh, someone in a hooded shirt with a phone, correct? Yes. All right. And then there was someone who was in a white T-shirt with a phone? Yes. Okay. And uh, did they appear to be saying anything? No. And so it would be fair to say that uh, people on the sidewalk at that point wouldn't have been doing anything that could have been distracting a reasonable police officer at the scene, correct? At that point, yes. Like to show you, it's been marked. It's Exhibit uh, 127 at 2022-22 through 2022-36. Further in the restraint. Uh huh. Uh huh. Everything hurt. Ah, there's water or something. Please, please. Ah All right. And so that clip started about 23 seconds after the last clip I just played you. You were able to hear that? Yes. All right. And you heard Mr. Floyd saying that he couldn't breathe, correct? Yes. You heard Mr. Floyd saying that his stomach hurt. Is that right? I wasn't listening for that. I heard him ask for water, I think. You heard him ask for water? Yes. Would you believe me if I told you that what Mr. Floyd said was my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, everything hurts? I heard everything hurts, yes. Okay. And, and that would be... Uh, you know, some sort of expression of pain, fair? You could. And uh, a reasonable police officer in the defendant's position would have heard that, correct? I believe so. From his position on top of Mr. Floyd. True? It's possible. And the bystanders who were there, uh, again, you couldn't hear any noise interference or anything like that, true? Not then, no. All right. And so would it be fair to say that there is nothing that the bystanders are doing at that moment in time that we just watched that would have been distracting or preventing the defendant from attending to Mr. Floyd? Not during that video clip, no. Okay. And I'm sorry, did you or did you not hear Mr. Floyd say that his neck hurts in that clip? I didn't hear that. Did you note that at all in your analysis of this case? At any time when you listen to the body-worn camera, when you listen to uh, the bystander video, when you reviewed the facts and evidence in this case, at any time do you recall noting Mr. Floyd saying, my neck hurts? I heard it. I didn't necessarily note it. 
because your, your testimony was premised on this not being a use of force because there was no pain involved, right? Yes. But you didn't note that no. fact? All right. In response to uh, uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, complaints for pain, uh, you heard a, a voice. Did you recognize that voice responding to Mr. Floyd? In this last video clip? Yes. I didn't, know. Did you hear an officer say, uh-huh? I heard somebody say that. And based upon your review, you've reviewed all of this, correct? Yes. You've reviewed uh, footage in which uh, the defendant could be seen and uh, can be heard speaking, correct? Yes. Right. Were you able to make out the person who said, uh-huh, as the voice of the defendant? So when I looked at this video clip, I thought we we're still looking at the, focusing on the bystanders, so I wasn't really listening to what the communications were. I mean in your own analysis prior to coming to court today, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but in, in your own analysis before coming to court today, had you identified that voice that said, uh-huh, in response to Mr. Floyd's cries for pain, is that belonging to the defendant? Yes, I had. Okay. And so you would acknowledge that Mr. Floyd was crying out in pain and the defendant was at least acknowledging that he could hear him at the time. If that's what the aha was in response to. Okay. Well, was the aha in the reasonable context in which this conversation, if you can call it that, took place in response and immediately after Mr. Floyd's individual cries for, for uh, pleas for pain or uh, claims of pain? It was the same time frame. Yeah. So my stomach hurts, uh-huh, my neck hurts, uh-huh, everything hurts, right? That's yes. what you heard. And the uh-huh was the defendant responding. Yes. All right, I'd like to take you then to Exhibit 49 starting, I'm sorry, at 2022-22, which is going to be overlapping the period we just saw. I'll just start it and I'd like you to pause it right away. 2022-22. All right, if you could hit play and I'll tell you when to pause. Stop. Uh -huh. Okay. And so now at this point in time, you see the uh, bystanders, correct? Yes. And you would acknowledge that they're not in the street, correct? Correct. They're on the sidewalk. Yes. Right. They're holding cell phones. Yes. Right. These are the two teenage girls I was talking about. Okay. This is the elderly gentleman I was talking about. Mr. McMillan. Okay. All right. Uh, they don't appear to be uh, doing anything threatening at that point, do they? No. They don't appear uh, to be making any noise at all at this point, do they? Uh, not that I could hear, no. And, and certainly would not have distracted the defendant. Uh, that I can't say. Well, they're not doing anything and they're not saying anything. So would a reasonable police officer in the defendant's position have been distracted by their non-action? I think he could have been aware of their presence and maybe start to plan for it. Okay, but you see in this, uh, at 2022-27, at least he's looking down at Mr. Floyd. He's talking to Mr. Floyd, at least acknowledging what Mr. Floyd is saying, right? Yes. And so while it's possible he could have potentially been aware of them, it doesn't appear he was from at least what we just saw here. True? Not from this snippet, no. Let's move ahead again then in exhibit 43 starting at 202338. If you could publish that, please. At that point, you could hear somebody in the background, correct? Yes. You heard Mr. Floyd, true? Yes. His voice appeared slower than before? 
Possibly. Thicker than before? And what? Thicker? Yes. Okay. You also heard conversation, normal tone conversation between Officer Lane and the defendant, correct? Yes. Officer Lane said, roll him on his side, right? Yes. And what was the defendant's response? Uh, something not yet. Okay. No, keep him here. Okay. Right? And so um, at this point, uh, Officer Lane is suggesting that they roll him on his side. Would that be consistent with the side recovery position? Yes. Okay. And uh, the defendant is rejecting the side recovery position at this point. True? Yes. He's hearing his information from his fellow officer, deciding a different course of action. Nothing the crowd's doing is preventing them from having that conversation. Is that right? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. And in, in your view of the clip that we just looked at, just focusing on the subject behavior, what is uh, Mr. Floyd doing? What was he doing in that clip? He's becoming more compliant. Well, is there any non-compliance you were able to see in that clip? In this clip, no. And so uh, non, he's not exhibiting non-compliance, and based on your testimony and your review and the plain video record in front of you, you see that the defendant has not changed his position, correct? Correct. He's still applying the same level of force that he did at the beginning of the restraint period. True? Uh, that I can't say. He's still kneeling on Mr. Floyd, correct? Yes. And and you're not contending this was some sort of an accidental position, right? He didn't fall down onto Mr. Floyd and he, he was purposefully kneeling on him. Yes. True? Okay. All right. Um, and so based on your view, Right, of the defendant being on top of Mr. Floyd up to this point and beyond this point, the defendant did not alter the level of force that he was using on Mr. Floyd, did he? No. Even though Mr. Floyd by this point had become, as you put, compliant. Fair? More compliant, yes. Well, what part of this is not compliant? So I see his arm position in the picture that's posted. Right. That, you know, a compliant person would have both their hands in the small of their back and just be resting comfortably versus like he's still moving around. Did you say resting comfortably? Or laying comfortably? Resting comfortably on the pavement. Yes. At this point in time when he's attempting to breathe by shoving his shoulder into the pavement. I was describing what the signs of a perfectly compliant person would be. So attempting to breathe while restrained is a being slightly non-compliant? No. No. You're aware, if, if we could take a look at uh, Tao's body-worn camera starting uh, Exhibit 49 at 2023-38. And, and, and at this point, you see this Tao's body worn camera. We see more people here, correct? Yes. Right. You still see the teenage girl with the uh, cell phone? Correct? Yes. Uh, she's joined by uh, what appears to be a juvenile female, correct? Yes. Wearing a love shirt? Yes. Right. Another teenager uh, filming, is that right? And you see that? Yes. And then there's an individual in a, a hooded sweatshirt uh, standing on the sidewalk, correct? Yes. All right, if you could play that. Uh, we're done. You, you search it. Okay, like, in a jiu-jitsu move, we're done. bro? You try, you try we're to done. just breathe it right here, bro. Okay. okay. You don't think that what it is, bro? You don't think nobody understands that shit right there, bro? I trained at the academy, bro. That's some oh, bullshit, no, bro. you did. Okay. Right. And That's you understand. Bullshit, bro. All right. That's bullshit, bro. Breathe. You fucking stop it. He's breathing right there, bro. Breathe. Okay, well, you heard Mr. Tao say he's talking, correct? Yes. Referring to Mr. Floyd, right? Yes. I guess he was talking, wasn't he? Yes. And he said, I can't breathe, right? Yes. And it was even more slow at this point, correct? Could have been. And this is well within the restraint period, true? Yes. And uh, the individuals uh, here, in terms of the, the volume you're hearing, you, you don't hear this person saying anything, do you? 
No. Or her? No. Or her? No. Or him? No. Or him? I'm not sure of that. The uh, gentleman no. in the blue shirt with the baseball cap. No, didn't hear him say anything. Didn't hear the guy behind the person in the hooded sweatshirt say anything in the plaid shirt there? I didn't hear him, no. Okay, and so the only person that you would have heard say anything is the person in the hooded sweatshirt, correct? Yes. And, and what was he saying? Something about get him off him, bro. You don't learn, you don't teach that in the academy. You don't learn in the academy. He said he was, you're cutting off his breathing, right? Okay. Fair to say he was expressing concern? Yes. In, in this uh, moment, uh, was this crowd a uh, threatening crowd? No. take you to exhibit 127 at 202418. Please publish that. In the car right now, bro. He's not resisting arrest or nothing. You enjoying it. Look at you. Your body language is crazy. You're fucking bum. During that time period, and uh, I don't know if you heard, did you hear another officer, did you hear the voice of Officer Lane say he's passing out? I didn't hear that, no. Did you hear Mr. Lane say that at any point in your analysis of these videos before you came to court today? About what Mr. Lane or Officer Lane said? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And so you heard him say uh, at least one occasion he's passing out, correct? Yes. And would you accept my representation that that would have occurred around this time during this clip? Yes. All right. And other people, uh, bystanders, are saying the same thing, correct? Uh, I heard mostly just what the one gentleman was saying about being a bum and not resisting arrest and things like that. Right, that the defendant was being a bum and that Mr. Floyd was not resisting arrest, correct? Yes. And you just saw the video. You saw Mr. Floyd, what he was doing at that time. At that time, would you agree, and I'll tell you the name of the person, is Donald Williams. Would you agree with Donald Williams that Mr. Floyd was not resisting arrest at that moment? Yes. Mr. Floyd doesn't appear to be conscious at the end of this clip, does he? I can't tell. And uh, you're certainly uh, not as close to him as the defendant was in that moment, correct? Correct. He's not talking, correct? Yes. He's not resisting. Doesn't appear to be, no. And from this point forward, the defendant remains on top of him, remains on top of him in the same position as when he started the restraint period. Isn't that true? I would say the same general position. I wouldn't say the same exact position. Yeah, same exact position, same general position. The position is such that he's on top of him, compressing his lungs, compressing his chest against the pavement, right? With his body weight. It's in a prone control position. In a restraint. He's restraining, correct? Yes. Can't move, right? Floyd can't move? Floyd can't move. No. He's not moving. He's not resisting. He's not talking. It's not possible, is it? To do what? Resist. I think it's definitely possible to resist. When you've passed out. He's not doing it here, is he? Not when he's passed out, no. When we talk about what's possible, let's talk about what's, what's happening in this case. He's not resisting, is he? And this snippet, no. Right. Uh, and from this point forward, right, from this point and to the point at which the EMTs arrive and tap on the defendant's shoulder and take Mr. Floyd and place him onto the gurney, from this point to that point, 
Mr. Floyd wasn't resisting, was he? No. The defendant maintained the same general position. Yes. Force must be reasonable at the start of the force, correct? Yes. Throughout the continuation of the force and at the end of the force, correct? Yes. And you reviewed these videos and you understand that by the time the defendant got off of Mr. Floyd, Mr. Floyd literally could not support his own head. Did you see that? Yes. You see the way he moved, the way his head moved when they moved onto the gurney? I did. And a reasonable police officer in the position of the defendant, and that position is the position we see here, on top of him, would know that, right? Would know that he's not responsive, that he's not resisting. I think he would know he's not resisting. Because the officer said that he wasn't breathing. Said that to the defendant, right? The officer did, or what the bystander? Mr. Lane. Mr. Lane said that. Can you rephrase, because I got lost. I'm sorry. Mr. Lane said that. Mr. Lane said that to the defendant in the prior clip we watched, that he's not breathing, right? Well, I heard that he's passed out. I didn't hear the not breathing part. Well, the passed out came from the bystander, right? I'm not sure. Did you hear, at some point in your review, Officer King say that he couldn't find a pulse? Yes. All of this would have been known to a reasonable officer in the defendant's position, correct? Yes. And the defendant's position is, and was, and remains, as we see here, at this moment, in this time, in this clip, on top of Mr. Floyd, on the street. Isn't that right? Yes. I have nothing further. Anything else? Eric Nelson will try to rehabilitate whatever damage he thinks was done on cross-examination to his expert witness, Barry Broad, on the use of force by a police officer, Steve Schlusser. Mr. Broad, you were asked a lot of questions. Pretty thoroughly. If we could take this down here. You were asked a lot of questions on cross-examination about the prone control position. Do you recall that? Yes. Can you describe what specifically you mean by the prone control position? What is the placement of the knee relative to the back, neck, shoulders, et cetera? Ideally, 45 degrees in between the neck and shoulder blade. So 45 degrees coming in from the side? Yes, angling down towards the lower body. And where would the shin be placed? Just below the knee, same thing around the trapezoid area. So there's a kind of a hard spot in between the base of the neck and the shoulder blades. Is that the area you're talking about? It's the same. Can you describe by touching your back the area that you're describing? So the knee would probably end up pretty much on the spine, and the shin would be along the trapezoid. Okay. And during the course of your testimony, you were shown several short clips of things happening from time to time. Agreed? Yes. What's the problem in terms of the analysis by looking at just specific short clips? Does it really show the sequence of events? It just shows little highlights of it. In terms of the analysis, the standard being the totality of the circumstances. Agreed? Yes. And so when we kind of pick and choose, does it take into consideration everything that happens or that a reasonable officer would be doing at any particular time? No. And what would be another phrase for that? Kind of picking and choosing. Like 20-20 hindsight? Objection, leading, and argumentative. It's the same in that bowl. I'll withdraw. Now, in terms of the when someone is in the prone control position, you testified that you don't consider that to be a use of force, correct? Correct. And that's why, again? It's a control hold. 
So the suspect is controlled, hopefully searched, and all you're doing is putting some minimal body weight to keep their body immobilized. Does it impact the structures of the neck? No. Can a suspect continue to lift up his head, move his head around? Yes. Do you observe Mr. Floyd doing that while he's in this position? Yes. Do you, did you observe him use his face to try to lift up his body? Yes. Did you observe um, throughout the course of this uh, event, did you observe Mr. Floyd's right arm in various body, body-worn cameras? Yes. Did you observe ve his veins during that? Yes. What did the veins signify to you? Mm, had strong pulse. He looks very muscular. Objection to foundation, Your Honor. Overall. In terms of when Mr. Chauvin first arrived on scene, what would have been the first thing Mr. Chauvin would have seen? The struggle that Mr. Floyd was giving to officers Lane and King. And does that come into consideration of the analysis of the continued use of either force or a prone control? Yes. How about um, one versus three? How does that factor into the analysis? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Certainly. Um, you've observed the struggle between officers and Mr. Floyd. How many officers were there? Two, and then Officer Chauvin was the third. Okay. And how many suspects were they attempting to apprehend at, at that time? Just Mr. Floyd. Did Mr. Floyd, um, did all three officers at any point attempt to get Mr. Floyd into the back of their car? All three did. Were they successful in your analysis? No. So does the analysis in terms of, again, the continued use of force or putting someone in a prone restraint uh, include what happened moments before? Yes. And so if one person can overpower three, is that a factor to consider in whether to use a prone restraint or control technique? Yes, because it takes some of the strength that the suspect may have away from them. Are you familiar and with the what we would call the swarm technique? Yes. Well, can you describe for the jury what the swarm technique is? It's where multiple officers will use their body weight to pin a suspect down to the ground. And the purpose is? Control. And at the, at the beginning of uh, the uh, prone position of Mr. Floyd, did you observe Mr. Floyd continue, at least initially, to actively resist? Actively and with the kicking motion, active aggression. So let me ask you, in terms of the, the concept of active aggression, that's taking a, a swing or using some a force against an officer, is that correct? Yes. Does active, re, does active resistance have to be violent in order for it to be active resistance? No. Are there levels of active resistance? Sure. So um, can you explain how the level of active resistance may change? So pulling away from an officer would be one example of active resistance. Um, just muscle rigidity, refusing to let an officer pull your hands away from your body would be another example. So there are, there are, like all things, sort of a spectrum of active resistance, active aggression, or passive resistance, right? There's a spectrum of it, right? Yes. And during the course of the restraint of Mr. Floyd, do you continue to see Mr. Floyd actively resist to some degree? Yes, he was struggling. And how would you describe that within the spectrum? of active resistance. He's a very strong individual, so a lot of that has to do with individual capability. So he was still struggling the efforts of the three officers to control him. A reasonable officer um, in, term, in terms of making a decision to put, keep someone in a prone restraint, uh, can take into consideration the actions that immediately occurred immediately before. Rephrase, sustained. 
would, is it possible for a reasonable police officer to, I'll, I'll rephrase, I'm sorry. Is the decision to use force or a restraint technique a spectrum similarly? Yes. And officers are trained to assess the risk. Yes. It's preliminary, overall. The, and the threat. Yes. Those were some questions you were asked about. They were. Why is it important to have a suspect in custody under control? For the safety of the officers and safety of the suspect. And if a suspect becomes more compliant and less actively resistant, does that eliminate the officer's uh, ability to maintain a restraint? No. Nope. You were asked several questions about Mr. Floyd uh, stating that he couldn't breathe while he was being restrained. Did you hear those same statements during the struggle inside of the squad car? Yes. Did you hear them more than once at that time? Yes. Did you hear him uh, state that he was claustrophobic? Yes. Would a reasonable officer um, consider the actions of that person in relation to the words? Yes. If a person is saying he can't breathe and continues to actively resist, albeit at a lower level, would an officer, reasonable officer, take that into consideration? Yes. You were asked a series of questions about a singular point in time when Mr. Chauvin's knee, or excuse me, his toe came off the ground. Did you interpret that to be a, a, an increase in the amount of force applied to Mr. Floyd? I couldn't tell. You described in your cross-examination that he had to sort of catch himself on the squad car? Yes. Why do you, would you interpret that as a lack of balance or an effort to apply a greater amount of force? I think reaction to Mr. Floyd's body movement made the officer lose his balance momentarily. Do you think that um, if you're on two knees, just there's nothing underneath you, two knees on the ground, right? Um, is weight permanently equally distributed between those two knees? Objection leading and the opposite. Overruled on both grounds. No. Do people sort of move around? Yes. Do their weights shift? Yes. Do you observe that happening in this case? Repeatedly. Do you observe Mr. Chauvin or Officer Chauvin relieving some pressure at times when Mr. Floyd moves? Yes. Is that consistent with a prone control restraint? Yes. shown um, some videos when the first uh, young woman first came and started filming at approximately 20, 21, and 29 seconds. Yes. Call that? Did you factor into your analysis the timing of when EMS was called and then subsequently increased? to their, their response rate. I'm not sure if I understand the question. The videos that you watched, uh, some of the videos you watched when Ms. Frazier began filming at 2021-29, if EMS were called at 2021-35, code three, does that factor into the analysis? 
Yes. Why? Uh, knowledge of the area and the fact that they anticipated the response time is going to be very rapid. Can you underestimate a member of a crowd or a group of people simply by virtue of their age? Certainly. Is it possible that a 17-year-old person can place as uh, an officer in an equal amount of danger? As Absolutely. You've seen uh, other videos from other officers and you became aware, or did you become aware of the traffic patterns and the number of people driving by? Yes. In terms of the position of the officers relative to traffic. Uh, Objection beyond the scope here, Honor. Overruled. How does that again factor into the analysis during this time frame? That would be an environmental hazard since they were almost in the traffic lane and there really wasn't any protective barriers around them. I show you show you one snippet um, at 2024-01 from Officer Lane's body camera. Uh, is already in evidence, I believe, as Exhibit 49. <laughs> Ending at 2024-26, did you observe uh, Mr. Floyd's leg in that moment? Yes. Would a reasonable officer interpret that to be a form of active resistance? Possibly. Did you observe... Uh, how did you observe Officer Lane push that leg down? Was it gently or forcefully? Uh, forcefully, he took both his hands. We could take this down, Your Honor, for a moment. as exhibit um, 1020, which is the point at which um, the ambulance and Mr. Chauvin stands up towards the end of this restraint. And I'm going to ask that this is already in evidence. I'm going to ask for you to make a determination as to where you think Officer Chauvin's uh, knee is. Looks to be on the left shoulder blade of Mr. Floyd. So it's fair to say that throughout, um, we'll just finish with this finish. that appear to be consistent with the prone restraint hold that you described? Yes. 
So if we can publish that to the jury, then just... Would you agree that on the left-hand side, it appears that Mr. Chauvin's knee is on the neck of Mr. Floyd? No. How about on the right? No. So from that perspective, Mr. Broad, does it appear to be uh, consistent with a reasonable officer's use of the prone restraint technique? Yes. Is that sort of the problem with snippets? They don't show the full picture. Would you agree that the well, you tell me, if a, if a group of people is compliant and passive at one moment, does that mean they're going to be at the next? No. Is a reasonable officer prepared, should a reasonable officer be prepared to uh, expect a change in a crowd? That'd be part of the situational awareness and planning process. If, a, if one perceived threat or risk emerges while you're dealing with another, how is a reasonable officer trained to, to determine which risk or threat he should be dealing with? Uh, the officer's trained to address what they perceive to be the highest risk. If a reasonable officer has reason to believe that a, a person is passed out, can a reasonable officer be trained that if that person comes to, they may be more violent? They could. Have, has that happened to you in your law enforcement career? It has. And is that something a reasonable officer would take into consideration in assessing uh, whether it be a use of force or a use of prone restraint? They should take it into account. Would that cause the, uh, a reasonable officer to be more or less concerned? Aware and more concerned. I have no further questions. Any recross? Thank you. So you're not still contending that the, the prone restraint here was one that would not be likely to cause pain, are you? It could cause pain. Could cause pain, did cause pain, correct? I don't know if it caused pain, I'm saying it could cause pain. Did you look at the autopsy photos, were those submitted to you? No. Okay, so you didn't see the bruises on this man's shoulders, you didn't see that? No. You didn't see the bruises on his face? No. You couldn't use your context clues to determine that somebody trying to lift their, their body up with their face against the pavement, that that would cause pain? It would cause pain, wouldn't it? Lifting the face up off the pavement? That's right. Not necessarily. No, using your face to lift your body up off the pavement. Objection. That would cause pain. Objection. Overrule the background. That could cause pain. The only struggling that you saw Mr. Floyd doing after he was restrained was struggling to breathe. Isn't that right? Well, that overruled on that ground. I don't know if he was struggling or was he struggling to catch a breath. I can't tell. In any event, uh, struggling to breathe is not active resistance, is it? To me, no. To the officer, it may be. 
that officers are trained in, in terms of the dangers of positional asphyxia. Officers are trained that there can be a, a physical response to having uh, oxygen deprived of you as a result of the pressure. Isn't that right? There can be. Overruled. You can answer. They're trained about that, yes. correct? And it's, it's much like the analogy that's used if somebody's holding your head underwater, there's a natural reaction to, to, to struggle, correct? Yes. And, and that's the danger, right, of the, of the cycle of positional asphyxia is that the officer might not recognize that what they're doing is causing the person to react. True? It's quite possible. And you don't contend that it was reasonable for the defendant to hold Mr. Floyd down on the pavement in this position to avoid him getting hit by a car, are you? No. No. I said no. All right. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Thank you. So you may step down. Thank you. Our next witnesses are not available till tomorrow, and so we're going to recess for the day. Uh, the lawyers and I have some issues to deal with right now and also at 8.45 tomorrow, but we still hope to start about 9.15 or 9.30 tomorrow. Hopefully we'll be done with our issues by then, so have a good night. Don't talk to anyone. Don't watch the news. Thank you. From ABC News Live, the death of George Floyd, Derek Chauvin on trial. Good evening, I'm Terry Moran. Today, day 12 of the trial of Derek Chauvin for the killing of George Floyd, the defense began its case. They called several witnesses, but the highlight today, an expert in the use of force by police officers, Barry Broad, who spent 27 years as a cop in California, told jurors that all of Derek Chauvin's actions, kneeling on the neck of George Floyd for more than nine minutes, were reasonable, lawful, and consistent with his training. But then, on cross-examination, Barry Broad said something that seemed to stun the courtroom, that George Floyd, who the world has seen crushed down on that street, was actually, quote, Resting comfortably. Based on your view right, of the defendant being on top of Mr. Floyd, up to this point and beyond this point, the defendant did not alter the level of force that he was using on Mr. Floyd, did he? No. Even though Mr. Floyd, by this point, had become, as you put, compliant. Fair? More compliant, yes. Well, what part of this is not compliant? So I see his arm position in the picture that's posted. Right. That, you know, a compliant person would have both their hands in the small of their back and just be resting comfortably versus like he's still moving around. Did you say resting comfortably? Or laying comfortably? Resting comfortably on the pavement. Yes. At this point in time when he's attempting to breathe by shoving his shoulder into the pavement. I was describing what the signs of a perfectly compliant person would be. So attempting to breathe while restrained is a being slightly non-compliant? No. No. You could almost see the prosecutor, Steve Schlischer, with, uh, with an edge, uh, an edge of contempt even in his voice for what this witness was testifying to. I want to bring in our team of legal experts, civil rights attorney and advocate Kristen Gibbons-Fedden and former prosecutor in New York, Bernardo Villanola, Villanola. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think that's spelled correctly. But anyway, Bernarda, welcome back. Let me go to you first. Uh, and perhaps you can tell me how to pronounce your name correctly. And also, what you made of this particular witness, a key witness for the defense, on the use of force. 
Barry, Barry Broad was an epic failure for the defense. I mean, he fell apart during the testimony, during the direct examination at times, and definitely during the cross-examination, especially during the recross examination. One thing that I will never forget is that Barry Broad said that George Floyd was resting comfortably, and then he tried to backtrack it and say, no, a compliant person would be resting comfortably if they were compliant on the ground. That's a, that's just, that's, that just flies on the face of reality. Like, are you serious? I found it to be distasteful. I found it to be disrespectful. But one thing, I'm not sure if people find this guy uh, familiar, because Barry Broad, remember, he was the use of force expert that was used in the trial in Chicago against former police officer Van Dyke that shot Laquan McDonald in the back and ended up shooting him 16 times and killing him. Well, he is a professional uh, expert witness, Bernarda Villalona. Thank you uh, for that. And let me go now to Kristen Givens Fedden on, on this witness and really the very difficult job he had to do. And we were talking earlier about the manner in which Prosecutor Steve Schlesher decided to uh, cross-examine him, very patiently gaining concessions, as you said. But then at the end there, and on recross in particular, we heard that edge come into his voice. Yeah, that edge was not only something that I think was felt by him, but was felt by me. Sounds like uh, by much, much of the people watching this, and most importantly, likely the jury. I think, you know, when you're a witness, you have to be careful about the language that you choose uh, to use when you're testifying. And that is of paramount importance when you are an expert. Resting comfortably? You know, his choice of words opened him up to ridicule by the state um, and undermined him as an authority in the eyes of the jury. A person, just think of it, a person laying on the pavement, trying to breathe, their hands cuffed behind their back, a grown man kneeling on their neck, crushing it, two other men on their, on their back and legs, resting comfortably, consider resistance, the jury will never accept that. And it sets the prosecution up for favorable testimony from that defense witness that they can use in closing. All right, in, in no question. But let's take a look for a moment at what Barry Broad came to this courtroom to do. Here's a portion of his direct examination, defense lawyer Eric Nelson getting out of this expert witness and putting before the jury the claim, which is the defense argument, that what Derek Chauvin did, that knee on the neck, was lawful, reasonable, and consistent with his training. So in terms of the initial uses of force, the officer's efforts uh, to get Mr. Floyd into the car, you felt that they were objectively reasonable? I did. Did the use of force then continue after uh, Mr. Floyd was restrained on the ground? I don't consider a prone control as a use of force. Um, let's, let's back up just a second. The removal or um, Mr. Floyd's getting out of the vehicle, however that was, um, did it, did it, does that constitute a use of force? Um, the manhandling or the three officers taking Mr. Floyd out of the car and placing him on the ground, yes, that's a use of force. Was it justified or objectively reasonable in this particular case, according to your opinion? Yes. So when they brought Mr. Floyd to the ground, are you saying you don't consider that to be a use of force? Uh, up to that point, it was still a use of force, yes. Okay. Once Mr. Floyd is on the ground, in your opinion, does there continue to be some level of resistance by Mr. Floyd? Yes. How would you describe that? Um, active resistance, he was still struggling, the effort, struggling against the efforts of the officers. And I saw on one of the body cam videos that Mr. Floyd appeared to kick at Officer Lane. So that's the heart of the defense case there, that, that George Floyd was resisting arrest and that the officers were justified in using force. But uh, Bernardo Villalona, it, one of the other things that this expert said on direct examination, and as you just told us, an expert uh, who has testified in other controversial police use of force cases, is that even after George Floyd was passive and even lifeless, the, the knee on the neck was still justified by Derek Chauvin. It, it seems like that's a hard thing for jurors to buy into. 
So this so-called expert lost credibility when he said that it was still justified for Officer Chauvin to have his knee still on the neck of George Floyd after he was no longer resisting, after George Floyd was no longer moving, after George Floyd was no longer speaking. That right there, that expert, Mr. Brady, lost, he lost credibility. And if you lose credibility, there's no way that a jury is going to take what you're saying for its truth. He lost credibility in sense of being a witness, and he lost credibility credibility in the sense of being a so-called expert. Everyone that is certified as an expert doesn't necessarily mean that they are an expert. Mm -hmm. It's still up to the jury to determine whether they believe this person and whether the information that they're given is something that they can rely on. And in this case, I find that this person put up by the defense is not credible at all, and his experience also is not enough. And in addition to that, that his preparation for this trial was very lacking. There was so many documents and also videos that he did not look at, and it was clear that he did not review. If he didn't review everything in this case, that is exactly what the prosecution used against him in catching him in the small, little, minute parts of this case that he did not review, but yet he based his decision on so-called everything that he saw. That's a great point, because it did come out that he had not reviewed aspects of Derek Chauvin's training, crucial issues in this case. Bernardo, thank you. And, and Chris and Gibbons Fedden, let me go to you on another issue that he tried uh, his best to build a defense for Derek Chauvin, and that is this sense of threat that the defense has suggested, that the bystanders, which uh, defense calls the crowd there at 38th and Chicago, that they constituted enough of a threat to Derek Chauvin that he was additionally justified in this use of force. Yeah, and I thought that the cross-examination of the prosecution really highlighted how incredible that argument is. And, you know, again, defense does not need to put on an argument, but the narrative that they put on is what they utilized to create that reasonable doubt. And it was completely undermined. Again, you know, as I mentioned, we have met the crowd that consists of that nine-year-old. Um, but even, you know, just throughout the cross-examination cross of this expert, prosecution was able to get out and show those pictures, show all of those individuals who really didn't really have that, that weren't that numerous, um, show them. One was wearing a love shirt, and he was able to identify and describe them as juveniles, as people under the age of 18. He was also able to show through beautiful demonstrative um, uh, demonstratives that the crowd was complying with the police. And this was through photo evidence to show that these people, these bystanders, who, again, they met, they heard plead for uh, Mr. Floyd's life, plead for this officer to stop, they saw that they were remaining on the curb, many, many um, feet away from the officers, many, many feet away, not distracting. And even um, on cross, uh, the prosecution was able to elicit the fact that at certain points, um, this expert, this quote-unquote expert, deemed this crowd, these bystanders, non-threatening. And I think that that was effective. And, and it is a hard case to defend, no question about it. Uh, these, these are the experts and the witnesses that the defense has brought forward. We'll see what the jury makes of them. Chris and Gibbons Fedden, Bernardo Villalona, thank you very much, as always. And when we come back, we'll have a live report from Minneapolis as that city braces for another night of protest after the shooting death of Dante Wright. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number Number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. 
Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We've been following the trial of Derek Chauvin for the killing of George Floyd and now the shooting of another black man, Dante Wright, at the hands of police officers shot dead during a traffic stop on Sunday in a suburb of Minneapolis, an incident that has re-traumatized that American city. Let's go back to ABC's Alex Perche outside the courtroom in Minneapolis. Alex, what's the latest in that city tonight? Well, it, we're bracing for another possible uh, night of, of protests and, and, and unrest. And, and Terry, you, you brought up the, the Dante Wright situation. Well, they held a press conference this afternoon just behind me here in the, 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 uh, uh, the park in front of the courthouse. Uh, the Wright family and the Floyd family, uh, attorney Benjamin Crump saying, that it was kind of this uh, a, a weird blessing for the Floyd family to to be here uh, and 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 be able to co uh, comfort that Wright family uh, as they're experiencing a loss almost almost a year uh, uh, apart from each other. But earlier we heard from Dante Wright's aunt. We've got a sound bite. I want to play this. Since she went ahead and she resigned again, that they hold her at the highest, at the highest, because she was the law. She was the law, right? Protect and serve. Put her in jail. Like they would do any one of us. They would put us under that jail cell. It wouldn't be no accident. It'd be murder. Uh, it's a really, really emotional, but that's Nisha Wright, Dante's aunt, responding uh, to the news that former officer now, Kim Potter, uh, tendering her resignation. She uh, resigned, issued her letter of resignation earlier this morning, uh, but saying that she, the, the family is seeking for more. And just another instance of how interconnected these stories are, the George Floyd in the, in the, uh, the case of Dante Wright, the attorney, Earl Gray, who was Potter's attorney, uh, also is the attorney for former officer Thomas Lane, who was charged in the death of George Floyd. He'll stand trial later this year. Now, I can tell you that heading into tonight, we, we reported yesterday that a lot of the sports teams here, uh, the Timberwolves, the Wild, uh, and the Twins had postponed their game. Well, the uh, Timberwolves will have their game against the Brooklyn Nets tonight, and they're going to be wearing special shirts during warm-ups that say liberty and justice for all. Uh, their shirts that they decided to, uh, to wear in the wake of the police shooting of Dante Wright. Also, uh, we know that there's not going to be a state-issued curfew uh, for the metro area, but uh, the governor did say that local municipalities would have the authority to, and so uh, the breaking news that we just got is uh, Mayor Frey here in Minneapolis is saying that there will be a curfew beginning at 10 p.m. tonight. All right, as Minneapolis 
that city continues to struggle and braces for the emotions that will come forward. Alex Proche in Minneapolis for us. Thanks very much. Well, you've been watching ABC News Live's complete gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the trial of Derek Chauvin. We'll have a complete wrap-up of today's events on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. That's tonight right here at 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern. I'm Terry Moran. Thanks for joining us. Have a good evening. This has been a special report from ABC News Live. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family.